welcome to the start of Nerf Connect 2022. Hello everyone who is here with us together. Hi everyone who is tuning in from all over the world. My name is Jivila and I'm gonna guide you through today's event. The past year and recent circumstances has shown us how important it is to connect, to build a strong bond, to unite and to collaborate. These are the aspects and fundamentals of life and only together we can make the groundbreaking innovation happen. So today we're here together to connect, to bond and strengthen the bond between the startup ecosystem players from founders to investors to media to the government, talents, everyone who is involved in this cycle. And there is no better place to do that than Startup Fair, the most prominent event in Startup Lithuania ecosystem and taking place for the 10th time. So guys, we are here not only to learn, to connect, but also to celebrate because that's a very important milestone in the whole ecosystem. This year, Startup Fair has a packed program with the conference that will host many great speakers on this stage power, powered by Accenture. We will have a groundbreaking pitch battles happening just behind the corner, moderated by Andrus Milanovicius, and also you guys who are watching us online has the separate link to watch those battles. And the pitch battle was powered by SME Finance. Also, we will have a lot of meetings happening between the startups, investors, and other ecosystem members at the deal room powered by Karma Ventures. And of, of course, how about the conference without an after party? Of course, we're gonna have one tonight. The after party together with Thunderbeam at Materialista. But I guess enough of talks and let's kick off with event and the welcome speeches by our amazing guests. I would like to invite with a round of applause, Roberta Rudakiana, the host of the event and head of Startup Lithuania. Hello, everyone. It's uh, so great to see you all here to be here back at Kablis on this stage and to have a uh, live event without any um, restrictions that we had previous years and, uh, and uh, online events. So uh, we, the whole team, we are very, very happy uh, to see you here to, to have this event. Um, I, uh, I've just checked the numbers. Uh, we have more than 2,700 tickets taken already at this moment and, and uh, the number is growing each minute and I really invite those who are watching us online, guys, just you have to come here to, to feel the vibe, to meet real people in real premises, in, in real venue and, and uh, to, to have real talks. Uh, so uh, um, about 1,000 uh, People from, from those 2,700 are uh, startups, startup founders, startup employees. Uh, more than 350 investors we are having here, which uh, makes me super happy. Uh, I think it's as the whole ecosystem shows uh, record years and, and uh, record, record deals and record exits. Uh, so we also have the record number of investors attending our event. Uh, so. Um, Today we'll have a lot of things happening here, but, but the main thing we decided that it's uh, connections. Uh, the main thing is to, to reconnect with each other, to meet new people, uh, to talk to one another. Uh, I, I really believe that knowledge sharing is essential for, for any successful ecosystem and for startups. So let's have a great event. Let's start the event and let's connect. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you so much for such inspiring, inspir inspiring words. And right now, I would like to invite to the stage Yava Valeshkaita, Vice Minister of the Economy and Innovation of the Republic of Lithuania. I would like to hear some round of applause.
honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great pleasure to address uh, the people of this rapidly growing startup community in the name of Ushina Armanaita, the Minister of Economy and Innovation. Unfortunately, Ushina cannot be here with us today uh, physically. I do believe that she is with us uh, in her mind, but she has a very, very important topic today. Uh, she's paving the way for the partnership bill, and I do believe that it is a very important question for not only startup community here in Lithuania. So, uh, talking about startup community, 2021 became a memorable year for the entire startup ecosystem in Lithuania. Last year, we recorded several fabulous achievements, and we believe it's only the beginning of exceptional growth. It is therefore essential to celebrate and talk about these wins. That's why we are here today. In 2021, Lithuanian startups surged to a combined value of 7.1 billion. It's 70 times up since 2016. That's your success, of course. Lithuanian startups raised a record 428 million euros in funding in 2021, more than two times up from the previous peak in 2018. The sales of startup goods and services totaled 2.4 billion euros, which is two times more than in 2020. In 2021, companies in the sector contributed 190 million euros to the Lithuanian budget, about 50% more than in previous years. And finally, we have 1,091 startups already, including two unicorns, Vinted and Nord Security. There's no doubt that Lithuania is rapidly becoming a startup hub in the Baltics and in the whole European <laughs> Union. Our startup ecosystem is getting increasingly visible everywhere, both on the European startup map and the worldwide. That means that we must catch up and do our part of the work to protect this rapid growth to ensure proper conditions for the entire startup ecosystem. We must work further to, re to raise more unicorns. Our goal is to triple sales and exports of startup goods and services and investments attracted by startups before 2030. This will be sought by improving the business environment, developing targeted support measures focused on startup needs, and of course, promoting new startups and their competitiveness. It's not a simple task. Startups still lack financial resources and awareness in international markets. We also face difficulties in attracting and retaining talents and addressing business regulatory challenges. Therefore, various financial support possibilities, acceleration and internationalization measures are proposed. In addition, the legal and regulatory framework for startups and investors is planned to be improved with reviewed tax and financial incentives and migration procedures. The newly established innovation agency, which we between ourselves call a public sector unicorn, due to its potential, uh, will significantly contribute to developing and strengthening the Lithuanian startup ecosystem. As the innovation is the driving force behind the growth of each company and, of course, the whole economy, let's thrive and raise unicorns with innovative solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yawa, for such a great overview of the results and ambitious future we have ahead of us. And right now, last but not least, Remigi Shimashis, the mayor of Vilnius. Please welcome on stage. I hope we will also have some uh, nice chats from behind the scenes during my speech. That's sometimes even more interesting, I know. Uh, but uh, anyway, good morning, everyone. For me, it's a pleasure, of course, to say some words to you. I must say that yesterday I had a chance to talk to a smaller group of investors uh, who are also here for this fair, and I've already uh, sold Vilnius to them, so uh, they know all why we are the best in so many areas. So now I will address mainly to startups, to talented people who are just looking for opportunities, who will be pitching their projects and so on, and have two messages, or maybe more messages, but to two, two different groups of people. First of all, to those of you who are from Vilnius. So you are privileged ones. Don't forget when you are pitching for your projects uh, to, to mention Vilnius as well, because this is a competitive advantage. Uh, we are so good in so many areas uh, that, of course, uh, we are the combination of a beautiful, so efficient startup community and particular people who are 
who are running their businesses either on the, on the early stage or on the more mature stage, we, together with the city, we are a strong team. And having this strong team makes uh, better possibilities for all of us, for the citizens of Vilnius, for you as a uh, uh, We are, why, why, why I'm so brave? Saying that we are the best. Looking like I'm kind of Estonian, who are always the best in some way, but no, <laughs> we are the best in so many areas. We are, first of all, the, according to the latest data, the city of the most happy citizens um, among all, all capital, capital cities in European Union. 98% of our citizens are happy living in Vilnius. We are almost as, as uh, I mean, our Scandinavian cities are almost as good as us, being on the second place in Copenhagen and Stockholm, but we are in the first place. We are sharing economy leaders worldwide. We are open data leaders worldwide. Uh, we are leaders in uh, FDI attraction, just financial times where we gave up uh, the Oscars to, to the cities. We got 10 nominations with the biggest number among all the cities in, in Europe. Uh, for example, uh, 10 nominations for us, and the number two is Hamburg with five or six nominations, and uh, our neighbors got a little bit less, unfortunately. Uh, we are the, one of the youngest cities uh, uh, in the region. Uh, we are the, in the Baltic, uh, we are the city with the most educated and the biggest uh, working force, especially for young uh, people. We are leaders in so many areas that I will not mention all of this. So again, for those who are from Vilnius, we are a good team together. We embrace and support each other and make each other stronger. So don't forget to mention that you are from the best city <laughs> when pitching. To those of you who are still not from Vilnius, <laughs> of course, when you meet these challenges in other cities that sometimes cities are too slow, too closed, so you please know that we are the place which tends to be and, and, and seems to be the fastest and the most open. In most cases, we are successful. Sometimes, of course, it happens, but uh, as with all startups, it, it happens. But uh, that's our goal, to be the most open and the fastest in accepting new ideas. If some ideas are to fail, so they're failing also fast in, in here in order to, to go with new ones and to scale up from Vilnius to other places. So again, for those of you who are not from Vilnius, Vilnius is open for you. Please find it as a playground, as a sandbox for testing new ideas. Uh, again, being a capital of uh, European, uh, capital city of European country, you know that while testing something which works in this city, of course you may scale out it to other cities as well. So Vilnius is your playground, both uh, to those who are from Vilnius and those who are not. Please feel free to take all the opportunities of this playground. And of course, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Remigius. I, I mean evening. Conference is, is now, but evening, what I intend you to, to also to spend a good time. This, is, this was not a mistake, by the way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Remigius. A round of applause for our guest speakers for opening this amazing event. And I guess it's time, guys, to dive straight into the content. And lately, we've been hearing a lot. Unicorns, decacorns, hectacorns. The startup landscape is booming and many startups are aiming high and want to become that next unicorn. But how do you get there? What does it take to become a relevant play player in the startup ecosystem and be called the unicorn? We will start our day with the founder's talk, Journey to the Unicorn, and founders of the Lithuanian Thirst Tech Unicorn Vinted and potential unicorns, Omnisend and Interactio, We'll talk about their journey to successful startup, decisions they had to make, and also the price they had to pay. It's not only about fundraising and getting the money. There is a lot of hard work behind the scenes that sometimes it's not being told. So without any more talks, let's invite Milda Mutkuta, co-founder of Vinted. Mantas Mikutskas, co-founder and COO at Vinted. Ritas Lourdes, co-founder and CEO of Omnisense. Henrikas Urbanas, co-founder and CEO at Interactio. And 
The discussion will be moderated by one and only Roberto Rodakiena, head of startup Lithuania. So, hello guys. Uh, it's becoming a tradition that we are starting our startup here with a talk. I don't call it discussion. We are here just to talk, to share the knowledge and experience. So we are starting uh, our event with a talk of the most successful uh, Lithuanian startup founders and the founders of the unicorn. Um, so as I already mentioned, and as Jivile mentioned, we are here just to talk about your experience, your journey, your takeouts and lessons learned, what could be useful for, for those who are just at the beginning of the road, who just have the ideas or already started to, to do something, to, to uh, create innovative businesses. So let's start from the beginning. I think most of us already know and heard how, how the idea about Vinted uh, came into Milda's head. Uh, so let's talk about uh, Interactio and Omnisense. Uh, how you came up with the idea and how you started the business. Very good question. Um, well, initially we started actually with different idea uh, that gave fundamentals for, for technology that uh, we're using today. Um, but it came from actual need coming. Uh, initial idea was around microphones and it came from events like, uh, like this where you need to pass the microphone. Uh, but then our experience with interpretation also kicked in and we like, oh, we can use this uh, technology for interpretation and uh, we kind of switched gears and, and moved to that. So um, it was from a lot of looking around and, and uh, logging different ideas uh, to, to, to get uh, to where we are right today. Uh, I was actually a very early investor <laughs> to that. Uh, we started with this mic idea. Yes. But, it's, <laughs> yeah, but that's actually amazing living example of uh, that at the early stage you're not really betting on the exact business model that uh, founders are pitching to you. And this is very common mistake to over uh, analyze that idea at a super early stage rather than spend so much time with the founders, with the actual team who's gonna build it and consider this as a hiring exercise. Would you hire those people to your team as a really exceptional executors uh, uh, because the idea we changed, I don't know, like three times uh, at Probably, least. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and every time it looked like at some point almost hopeless. So the, the only hope was that the founders were not hopeless <laughs> because they were like, yeah, okay, so this doesn't work, but you know, <laughs> this and this might work and we should, you know, try this and that and this energy never, uh, was never over actually. So I was just, I mean, uh, Hendrikas was a bit, uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, not, not really uh, explaining the whole thing behind <laughs> and uh, how they evolved. So. You know, I'll share a secret what I overheard <laughs> yesterday in the investors party, <coughs> that even the height of Hendrikas uh, makes impression yeah. on the investors and makes them listen to you. <laughs> so guys, when you go to investors, just, you know, pick the right person. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, great, thanks, thanks. Uh, Ritas, what's your story? Is it uh, the same idea that you started and came the, the whole journey? Uh, I mean, where the journey started? <laughs> probably that's, that's the main question. So I would say probably the journey started, started when I was at school. Uh, I mean, not omniscient journey, but overall entrepreneurship. And uh, this is not my first business. I had like a few, that's called traditional business. I had two failed startup attempts before. And I think that's where the journey started. So, and I completely agree with Amanda. So the idea itself is overvaluated and we talk too much about uh, idea. It's all about execution. We, Omniscient is in a very crowded market. We entered this market when it was already extremely crowded. There were leaders in the market and uh, at the very initial stage, we tried to raise, but like investors said, come on, <coughs> look at the market. I mean, wh what can you offer? It's so crowded, it's full. It's, it's very, very, there is no problem there. It's all solved. Yeah, but uh, to your like direct question about how this specific idea, so that was kind of like calculated. 
uh, Omnisend is a spin-off from digital marketing agency. So Omnisend is marketing automation platform. So we used to serve, we used to sell ours to our customers, including some online stores, to which we did email marketing, uh, marketing campaigns, overall digital marketing, and we saw that, okay, we have a very specific opportunity because we just have more data and the entire customer journey is, uh, is, is trackable online from the very first touch point to the, to the transaction and post transaction. And that was somehow calculated. And, uh, and uh, another assumption was that e-commerce will grow. At, uh, we started eight years ago, so uh, that e-commerce is still in very premature phase and it will be growing. So if we manage to at least uh, get a fraction in this market, the market will be growing and it could help us grow. Uh, yeah, so that's how we specialized to, to, to e-commerce and serving uh, e-commerce needs. But um, yeah, so there was no kind of bad fundamental shifts, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, there were some minor shifts from email and like micro businesses to mar full stack marketing automation, SMS, push notifications. So it's kind of more like evolution in our case. Great. Yeah, I thought just to add like what Marco uh, said, like it goes even to this kind of absurdity when we came to Manta saying, now Mantas will go to United States and sell interpretation solution to churches there. <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> and we did, and we did it successfully. <laughs> and I think, it, uh, I've heard it was uh, really great success. <laughs> yes, it was. It was uh, like building block to where we are today, so. And I've heard another thing that during the COVID, uh, again, uh, situation with the events changed, uh, translation services for the events were not so on a high demand and you had to pivot again to shift to another direction. Could you also share uh, with the audience how to react so quickly in such a difficult situation? Yeah, uh, I think it was a good reminder that uh, whenever you have a good opportunity, you have to kind of jump in full on with all your clothes in and so on. So uh, when the pandemic was starting, we were primarily working with live events like this, uh, providing interpretation services uh, via mobile app. And uh, it was scary because a lot of uh, event organizers were not sure like if they will do the event. And so a lot of cancellations were coming in. Um, people start using like force majeure uh, clause in, in the contract like to give uh, money back. And uh, you know we already, projected the revenue and, and clients have a way to kind of get that money back. Um, so it was tough uh, time, but at that time as well, uh, we were very active in active conversation with like European Parliament, European Commission and many other big organizations. And for them, so it, I'm quoting uh, a contact from European Parliament. He recently said, interactive save democracy in, in, in Europe. Uh, it's not your solution. You know. <laughs> I think uh, Russia tries to intercept. So, uh, so basically, uh, he said he said that because um, as we were discussing and COVID was just outbreaking, um, they needed a, like alternative solution how they will run the sessions in a hybrid way. So some interpreters, people on site, some interpreters are remote, participants uh, remote, and how to connect very legacy infrastructure like European Parliament to online world with, you know, 24 languages. Um, and we already had like parts of, of that solution. Um, but when he, uh, when the contact called me and said, like, Henrikas, can you help to, to organize like 100 rooms in two weeks? I said, sure, of course. Uh, but in the meantime, we needed to, to build out like big part of the product that we didn't have, which was like on, online, online. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, so, um, so we had to build that uh, out, and um, basically we locked ourselves in. I slept in the office together with uh, most of the team. Um, did around 150 steps a day, so that's a lot. Uh, um, drank a lot of vitamins and, and food supplements to kind of survive. And uh, in the mean, in in the breaks, I was crying a little bit just to reduce the pressure. Uh, because uh, it's not like you're working with simple, uh, simple clients, like, you know, Coca-Cola or something. It's like simple. someone calling <laughs> and saying, uh, Angela Merkel cannot connect. And you're like, uh, hold on for a minute. And he's like, can, can you speak with her? I'm like, no, 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 you speak with her. I will, I will work on, on the issue. So 
<laughs> it was a lot of pressure, but um, like little sleep for uh, probably six months. Uh, but uh, we used that opportunity, I think, to the fullest. And now we're working with all the major uh, organizations in the world, from United Nations to European Commission, different courts, and so on. And uh, we are the main uh, supplier of, of the service. Super. <laughs> Thanks. I think that's really an impressive success story, even though you probably scared half of those who are thinking about building a startup. Yeah, if you, you're scared of hard work, don't do it. Right? Like it's, uh, it's, it's yeah. really hard. Um, uh, I think especially when you have the opportunity to grow, like you just have to really jump fully in and the whole team has to jump with you. Uh, so it's really hard, right? Like it's, uh, I'm glad that the uh, family supported and said, go to the office, sleep there, like we don't want to see you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that support as well helped, right? Like I don't, didn't need to focus on anything in, in, at home. I was just really doing what uh, I needed to do. So it's really hard. Yes. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, this year we are having women founder on stage as usually there are only men. And uh, uh, what our surveys showed uh, that 38% Lithuanian startups have at least one woman in their team. And it's uh, two times better a result than in uh, European average. So, Milda, <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. <coughs> Uh, Milda, I think you were the first woman in tech world in Lithuania. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she's nice. the founder of the first unicorn. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, the and the founder one. of the first unicorn. Uh, could you, and I've heard you talk a lot also about this work and life balance, how to balance uh, family life and raising children and uh, how you as a person, as a founder, a manager had to, to grow together with your company during this long journey, could you share your insights? Can you tell the truth? Oh, yes, uh, <laughs> I want to say that you won't like my answer. <laughs> um, yeah, so to be very honest, uh, so I left five years ago because I decided to start my family project. There is no... So, <laughs> as you see, but it's I think that's... also that very important for Lithuania, the family project. Yeah, so, um, so I think that... Um, I always say it depends because um, I think that if you think about like um, one, two kids and still it's possible to, to have the same like, you no, know, to have job, like to have, um, to have business at the same time raise kids, though it's difficult. And I know some women uh, that do that. You know, I, I know one of my friends, so her nanny brings uh, the baby, she breastfeeds uh, the baby each three hours, and then uh, the nanny goes back home, and while she is uh, like a, a general manager and doing all the business. So I think that, and she raised like this three kids, so it's in, in a row. So I think it's, you know, it's, um, it depends on your um, effort, how much you want to try. But at the same time, um, like personally for me, but it's my personal story, I guess, because um, I like to live in projects. So for me, for, for the first 10 years, Vinted was a project. And Vinted is a very demanding child. Well, I, I call it still number one child. So, and you know, if, uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to, uh, if you have time, like, you know, uh, to give 500% of yourself, Vinted will take it. And it's like, it's you who needs who need to decide when I want to stop or how much I want time I want to give. But I know about Mantas, but still, like, if you, at six, if you go from the office, so I think that Mantas can share the same. You still, you don't have your computer. You might have not your phone with you, but in your head, you always have your dilemmas, challenges, and everything. And I think that it's very common for all of us to wake up at 10, 11, or sometimes 2 a.m. and think, oh my God, I need to solve this, and I don't know the solution. And, and there are some, so much unknown that it's still like, you know, like, um, like a background coming all the time with you. So it's like not everyone can, can survive. So, so what I want to say that um, you can work, and you can see this is my family time, this is my work time, but with such ambitious um, businesses, it's very hard to have this at six, I finish my job. 
and and uh, the same like two weeks of doing everything like you need your like no 1000 percent of your time in your business and sorry guys no family <laughs> so i think that this is the price that we pay and yeah so that's why i've chosen the past 10 years at Vinted, it was my first project, my first kid, and then I left for other plan, like five kids in a row. So now I have four. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I like to live like no business project, now family project. In two years, I'm planning to finish everything, and then I can uh, look for another project. <laughs> so, so and six strict scouts. planning. <laughs> and six, six five, now five, 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 one died. Okay. <laughs> Super. <laughs> one left. One left. Could you all share your experiences and maybe some uh, tips for startup founders? What to expect in this journey as uh, you all started from the very beginning uh, and grew to 100 people, companies, 900 people in Lithuania, over 1,000. Yeah. So the numbers in Unicorn, Lotel, nice. he checked That's yesterday, mm -hmm. not updated yet. <laughs> And I know also that Omnisend is actively hiring uh, in USA, uh, Vinted, Berlin, wherever, all over the world. So what were the biggest challenges in this growth as for a startup, as for a person uh, and uh, failure stories? If you could share some, it's always very interesting for the audience. So probably the, this, the biggest is like every day uh, you do something different. Uh, which you have never ever done, at least from my perspective, never ever done in your life. So it's uh, constant evolution at a very fast pace, and then you have just to adopt, adopt, adopt. So, and, I mean, founders, we are in, in managerial roles, but you have to be different manager. So six months ago, you were still managing the company, which is more in the family mood. Now maybe you're managing the company which is approaching to the level of corporation with all the structural things, with relationship with people, with uh, processes, which where there are no processes, now you have to implement and you have never ever done such things. Therefore, you have to learn very fast. You have to find what, from whom to learn. Uh, peers, uh, coaches, books, uh, training, specialized trainings, etc. mentors. So those people who can help you, uh, co-founders, within the company, executive level, it's very important as well. But I think it's kind of from the very, very early stage to the quite late stage, it's all about what Henry Castor, it's all about grinders, it's all about resilience, you have good times, you have bad times, and the it, startup is always a roller coaster. Each business is a roller coaster, but startup is just multiplied by hundreds of times. So you can start the day with a very good mood, and then apparently it's the shittiest day in your life, That's at noon and uh, 10 p.m., you still find, whoa, it's still, it's great again. And vice versa, yeah, you can, you can start the day uh, being somehow down and something changes and you can make impact on a lot of things, but a lot of things do not depend on you. And there is what, just what, ha what is happening in the market and you have just to constantly adopt, adopt, adopt the situation. So, I mean, probably what, what Henry Castoli, I believe that was a reality. He was not extrapolating somehow, and that was just, you know, really. Sometimes you have to live in the office for, for weeks, for months, etc. cetera, or, or you can fail. I mean, that's, that's always an option. You can give up, but, uh, but usually, uh, I mean, look, so what you see here, like success stories, you s usually people tend to think about the success part, but behind that were, were so many failures or so many close to fail situations, uh, but they are not that, that interesting as, as your success. Yeah, if, not so fashionable I'm to talk about that. Sorry? Not so fashionable to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are trying to kind of not to scare you maybe too much, <laughs> but if I may advise some things uh, from my personal experience. Uh, so I, I think there are a couple of uh, really important building blocks. So one is, uh, <coughs> team and uh, don't do this alone. Mm. It's going to be incredibly difficult, probably too difficult if you do this alone. And the other mistake I, you know, quite often see is that if there is a founding team, it's quite ho hom homogeneous, which is kind of understandable because you like maybe to work with people who are like you, but that's actually not really complementary to you. You have to learn how to work with people who are complementary to you. So 
you know your weak spots and you have co-founder who has strong spots on your weak spots actually and you each other you understand those things and then you work as a team so two or three people as a as a co-founders is a really important uh, setup to 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 work with and it's funny but i remember we were in the shittiest situations possible and we were still like i don't know having lunch and like it it somehow feels better not to be alone in that completely <laughs> shitty situation, right? I also right? remember like one is down, but other like two or three, okay, yeah, exactly. you can do this. Come and on, and everyone bad. is helping each other because sometimes, yeah. so, let's say I myself, I'm having bad days, then Mantas comes like, you can do this, like, no, so strive from the, like, no, step by step. Don't be greedy on this that, okay, I'm going to do this alone, I'm going to get all the shares and the fame and everything. Maybe you will succeed, most likely you actually won't. So you have to, f and also, if I look from investor perspective, the same rule mm -hmm. applies. If I yeah. see three, two or three co-founders, I realize that these people are already, and I'm working great as a team, already good team players, right? If I see one person who is like overwhelming the rest, there is already a big red flag that this guy might overwhelm the whole team as well and will try to carry too much responsibility. And, you know, at some point we'll just break. This company won't be really scalable. Uh, so, so that's really important part, which you know, often is kind of underestimated. So, you know, share that load uh, with, with others and it's easier to do, uh, you know, with team, not alone. So one thing, another thing is you have to be really realistic and I think uh, <clears throat> at least first five years you have to really make a decision, okay, I'm going to really dedicate myself into this, like a full complete dedication, no other distractions. You have to make this compromise with yourself, with I don't know, your family, with your friends and basically just be super clear about this, okay, this is where I'm going to focus on. but maybe give some time limit, right? And then have a goal, so, okay, by, I don't know, year five, I wanna have like team, uh, you know, strong team, which can carry most of the things which I'm carrying today and like gradually work towards that. But don't have illusion that it's gonna be easy first couple of years. It's gonna be really, really difficult. But if you make this decision consciously, you're prepared, you, you know, inform kind of, others and others are then knows this and they are supportive then it's easier and you also know that it's not gonna long uh, forever right so you, you you give some time frame and then and, 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 and then you work out so so this is the the way to deal with that uh, uh, yeah because it's but I also yeah. would like maybe to challenge because uh -huh. I also did the same and uh, you know in 10 years I read zero books and like for me the, the case was okay am I only winded like no yeah. Milda is equal to winter that's it I have no other life so at the end I started to think about that do I want to, li to live like this so I think that and I also felt that my brain um, well it's a you know startup is rewarding journey but very exhausting and um, how long your body can can continue like this. So that's my point. Ten years is actually too much. <laughs> you said five. Yeah. Yeah, five. I said five. <laughs> yes. Like don't do ten. <laughs> ten is really bad. And and as well, in the third thing I wanna I wanted to say, because I mean it took us ten years, uh, maybe you know slightly less to achieve some, you know reasonable success and then and then quite good success, uh, but. Uh, this happened because we were the first generation of founders with zero knowledge, honestly, zero knowledge, how to do those things, right? Like um, around us, there was no one who can really advise and help. So we did incredible number of mistakes and this actually resulted of us being in a struggle for a longer period of time. But now it, time is different. And uh, what, what surprised me still that how little I get inquires from other co-founders to get some practical advice on, on practical stuff. And to me, it's like, why you are not using this resource? This is the most 
valuable thing you can actually try to do to you know reduce your pain and reduce the number of mistakes and you know shorten that this this span of this painful period and go into some breakout where you have some working model and some success so don't forget this and especially from other founders uh, um, yeah if I may kind of like do what you said now and your first point about having co-founders. So I think having peers. We have the we backstage. Have the Hello, one wants also to say something. <laughs> we have one more time. It's my lesson from all the conferences <laughs> that I've taken. It can Shut be up. super tech company, but technology <laughs> always fails. <laughs> Somehow. Yeah, talk about community and now co-founders and combining those two aspects which you just mentioned, I would say like uh, like asking advice at the same time be vulnerable and uh, don't be shy to ask for advice or maybe to handhold to support emotionally which is important as well in the community and there are two types I would say in the community there are peers who are going the same who are at the same stage as you are and usually when meet so how are you doing oh nice everything is so fine everything is just great it's so shiny yeah we do PR because we need to do PR because we do like employment brand but at the same time we are going through struggles all of us do yeah so talk to your peers ask for for help for advices uh, how did we go through those situations etc talk to those who are more uh, more more experienced but sometimes those who are more experienced take those advice but sometimes they are not applicable to your situation because <coughs> Mantas or Milda went through this 10 years ago and you are going through this right now the context has changed so be vulnerable be open to yourself to co-founders and to the community so look how many of great people are here how many of great people are watching probably online if it's being broadcasted so Lithuanian startup community is really vibrant those days and we can find a lot of support among each other and it's and open yeah exactly and that's what we do among like uh, yeah so I, I often ask or maybe not often maybe should I do it more often Why yeah we build Unicorns Association, yeah. Actually. yeah exactly it's one, one of the reasons yeah, yeah thanks Mantas for this initiative but it's one of the really talk Tom, talk really about connect yeah. everyone among each other you know and share share experience and it's all about good and bad things maybe just one remark to all this so just my two cents uh, is that uh, Next, uh, it's your responsibility right like if you uh, pushing your startup to I, I and Sorry. you want to chat with someone in the backstage <laughs> it's uh, it's your opportunity Zidilla, we are hearing yeah. you you can have some water guys yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we can hear everything there <laughs> so uh, 17 more minutes for us and then we will let you in uh, so as you as you push you pushing through like it's your responsibility to uh, look for 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 the peers for the support groups and so on so um, no one like there are now more open this, the community is more open but at the same time is you still have to go to that meeting you still have to approach someone and uh, don't wait uh, until like there will be an opportunity perfect opportunity to mm -hmm. speak right uh, with someone and I remember I think I met with Mantas uh, I don't know how I got to Vinted office, but uh, I was just hanging in the coffee uh, place there and I saw Mantas. I'm like, okay, we need to chat. And he's like, who are you? Like, are you working here? I'm like, no, let's keep all this. Let's uh, talk about Interactive. He hijacked uh, me, you know. Uh, that's the way you should do. Uh, but at the same time, it was very good because, uh, <coughs> like, uh, to Mantas' comment on being realistic, I think it's so crucial. Because when we started the company, I, I, I recently found like uh, an email I sent to Simona, the, our co-founder. It was like very beginning. I'm like, this is our plan. We'll do this, this, then this, raise the uh, uh, end of the year and so on. It was like first year, like we barely did anything of that. Uh, but if we would have kind of thought that, you know, if, if that doesn't happen, that's it. Like it would be very demotivating. And then I remember, okay, if we'll raise like enough uh, funds, we'll like go through this, it will be much easier. And it never was, but, like you, you get more uh, capital, you like need to push through. Uh, and it was very helpful that uh, Mantas was uh, on, on the board uh, at Interactive because I remember Vinted was also struggling at some point. And, uh, and I'm like, Manti, you have like mi tens of millions of euros. like. It's, it cannot be true and he's like no like you know we still struggle we have to go through this and it was a good reality call for me that okay if we want to make 
mark in this world, right? If we want to push our technology through, uh, deliver on our vision, it will be constant uh, kind of battle because you, you have to make that uh, market shift. Uh, and it's on you, right? Like no one will, will come and uh, like uh, support you. So you have to surround yourself with the, with the right people, founders, the team, because uh, if you need to work hard uh, late at night, they also have to be committed, right? So it's people uh, really at the, 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 the core. But one thing that I would add on, on top is, is uh, vision, right? Believe in what you want to achieve. Because like for me, at any hard moment, I can look back, talk with the customer, and it's so recharging. Because regardless of how hard it is, uh, you know that you're making a difference at least for that one person at that moment. And then you have 10, 100, 500, uh, and it's really motivating that you're moving to the right direction, and it's only some shifts that you need to do. So, uh, so that's why like vision um, is very important, I think. So, Still, so I think some people may be sitting there and asking why I should do this at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and actually, I want to add a couple. Then don't do it if you ask of things, uh, because this is really important, and I want uh, in Lithuania to have in, in the world as well as many entrepreneurs as possible. Uh, so, to, so one, there was a really dark moment at Vinted when I thought it's actually really, we're done, right? Mm -hmm. And we're done big, big way because we were the first who raised significant amount of capital. So I thought if we're done, then it's a complete write-off of the Lithuanian ecosystem able to build any significant like uh, tech business, right? So I thought, um, okay, like it's, it's gonna be national disaster in a way. <laughs> like everyone will say, yeah, and when I see it, it's impossible to build those pieces. But even during that dark moment, I was reflecting and, uh, and actually I had very positive reflection in a way that I, I realized, but oh man, I learned so much. Like nobody would be able to give me so many learnings during such a short period of time. And also I realized I never had a boring day. Like sometimes the most killing thing is just pure, you know, sense of that you're just bored and everything is same and the same and nothing exciting is happening. So it's completely opposite of that. So yes, it will be lots of hard work, lots of struggle, but completely opposite from boring. And the learning process and the, the speed of learning is going to be something you never experience anywhere else. So that's, that's why it's worth doing it. And also Even if you fail, <laughs> you don't actually. <laughs> per, on personal level, you don't. And I also would add that uh, there are so many co-founders born from Vinted team. So it's like, you know, as a founder, you learn a lot. But for, like, for um, Lithuania, for, the, for your country, you also create many, many founders and senior level. Um, because uh, it was uh, five, six years ago, then it was very difficult for us. And, and then we also, I remember our chat, like, no, you know what? If we fail, if we fail, if we fail. So there are still about two, 300 people who are gonna spread in uh, this market who will create m m big value for other businesses as well. So, yeah. so you know, it's also, Failures, it's not always, not always the failure like as you see it. And Bill Gates once said, just to wrap up with me, uh, people uh, overestimate what we can achieve in one year. And, but they underestimate what we can achieve in 10 years. And it's so true. Absolutely. So it's a great shift uh, in our talk as we have only five minutes left. Uh, it's I see 11. It's lying. It's not <laughs> Face. Technology. Uh, I know that at 11 we start another uh, session. Uh, so I wanted to shift to that way. So uh, I know that uh, Vinted had opportunity, the founders had opportunity to, to sell the company, to exit. Many times. But still, you are still... Some, something drives you on and, and you just uh, mentioned. So that was my question. After so many years uh, of this uh, difficult journey, what still drives you and okay. where you see uh, the end or uh, what you really want to achieve? I, I will give you two answers. One is sort of funny, but it's actually true, honest true. So w there were, you know, two buckets of the moments we were offered to sell. One was 
uh, for sale when the company was really struggling. So we were refusing because we thought it's really unfair price, how low it is after all this, you know, uh, energy we spent to sell for that little. So we obviously refused. And then when things now are doing well, uh, it's uh, again like, okay, the, the amount is obviously really significant, but then you think, okay, there is a, another 10x opportunity because you see so many things you can build on top and, and, and expand. So again, you feel like, okay, it's unfair actually. We went through all of this to achieve what we have and now selling it uh, without really trying to build something super big in this re which would be so significant in this region. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you're wasting your lifetime opportunity and it's like, it's not monetary then uh, kind of motivation. It's like, oh man, this is, you know, sort of making history. If you achieve this, then it's going to be great example, great knowledge. So we shall try, right? And the worst case, yes, you will maybe lose some, but uh, you would, I mean, think about Instagram guys who sold it for 1 billion, right? Back then it looked like, oh my God, but now I, I'm not sure they're not, or YouTube, for example, I'm not sure they're not really regretting uh, that decision now, right? So, 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 so that's, that's, that's one part of the answer. And uh, yeah, and another is like, um, it's actually like monetary motivation is long gone. And what drives you is that how interesting this process is of building something uh, that has real impact on the world, right? And, and in our case, we are actually uh, spending a lot of time to design, uh, you know, the product and the business who brings way more sustainability to our planet. And this is super important. So you feel like, okay, I'm on the mission. This is going to be something I'm really proud of, right? <coughs> so, and, and what I constantly found is that the, usually the greatest startups, greatest companies are truly mission driven. It doesn't have to be, you know, sustainability or something uh, super global, but still they have some super internal drive that they really want to achieve this uh, and, and then they go against all odds because it's a core, core motivation for them to, to get there. Thanks. So yep. what's <coughs> your driving, you know, thing? What you really want to achieve with Interactive? So at Interactive, we want to enable everyone to speak in their preferred language and, uh, and so far um, we see a lot of like good examples like we, we have people that openly said that uh, they were planning to planning a suicide just because of the language barrier uh, of where they had to move because of the war in their country and so on and because Interactive was right there in place uh, to deliver interpretation to those people they joined the community uh, we have saved marriages from from the same perspective and at the same time we have the European Parliament saying we saved democracy right so uh, we truly believe that the language is critical to, to share the knowledge, to, to have proper uh, conversation and make right decisions. And so uh, every day we are inspired of, of different stories that we hear from the clients. And just like a few weeks ago, we had this uh, uh, after drinks at the, in the Barcelona with, and we had like European Parliament, Commission, NATO, uh, ministries from France and so on, like, and all of them like sharing their stories about Interactio. And some of the people were entering the room and people were applauding because they made uh, massive success uh, in their meetings. And not only that the event was successful, but the um, resolutions or, or, or outcomes of that event. So like United Nations now, for me, like uh, global warming is very important. And uh, now we're supporting biggest agencies in United Nations that discuss about global warming. And because of interactive technology, different small islands, small countries that never uh, had the chance to participate in those discussions have a voice now and they can speak in, in the language they are the best to represent their country. So, and now uh, they see much bigger participation, um, much quicker decision making just because of, of uh, better language communication. So, um, giving the voice for everyone is, uh, is, uh, is what drives us every single day. And now we have like 
President Zelensky also uh, like you know addressing different organizations in Ukrainian language where he's so strong and you know passionate uh, and he can do it and others can understand in the way they understand the best so that's that's what drives us every day super Dmitry. amazing wow <laughs> amazing really yes. I would say two things from the very beginning. One was uh, really to build truly global business from Lithuania, which is a province. We are a global province, we have to admit that. But, uh, but it's even more fascinating to achieve something because it's not given for you that you've been born and raised in Silicon Valley, you know everyone, you attended you know, that, like Absolutely. Ivy League schools, etc., etc. So that was really and still is one of the first drivers. And the second driver is really to build it without uh, external investment. That's where we started and that just became somehow uh, really, uh, m we tried, I wouldn't say that it was from the beginning, but then investors refused to invest at the early stage and then, okay, we're gonna prove you. And uh, yeah, so feeling really, really super proud hiring Americans and not taking American money to do something to hire Lithuanians, but spending the money which all the value was created here in the global province in Lithuania, and now we spend to hire someone who are great specialists there. So that's uh, really uh, what makes us as a, a founders really, really proud. A part of just the belief in, in global digitalization of, of, of retail, etc. But uh, yeah, this is kind of a very personal motivation which drives us. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot for you all. It's always really interesting to talk to you and, and uh, the time is not enough. Uh, but we have to, to give the stage for the speakers. Uh, so to sum up, you all heard, uh, the, the journey will be difficult, challenging, but very, very interesting. And, uh, and uh, you will feel doing something really good for the world, for the society, changing things. And just do it. And as you've heard, you can always ask uh, those guys for, for some things, how to do things, to, to get inspiration. And we have the Unicorns Association, which is he here just to, to share the knowledge and to strengthen our uh, ecosystem. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for such an insightful talk and sharing the journey towards the unicorn. My key takeaways, be mission driven, surround yourself with the right people and every day do something different, but be realistic and dedicated while doing that. And the most important, be re resilient because resiliency is the key. The things break fast and you have to be ready. You can start the day with a smile, but it can end up with some kind of challenges along the way. Now we're gonna continue our program with the growth stories from regional project to global super app. We will hear two extremely exciting and unconventional stories about a male CEO running an outstanding startup in the period and cycle tracking space and an ex photo journalist founding a data company in the automotive industry. Dimitri and Rokos will share how did we start in the region and how did they grow and reached an exponential growth? What kind of challenges and learnings they gained so far? So please welcome to that stage, Dimitri Gurski, CEO at Flaw Health. Applause. <laughs> Rakas Madonis, co-founder and CEO at Car Vertical. And the discussion will be moderated by Gabriela Potelunite, Senior Associate at Change Ventures. Are not on, yeah. Well, sorry, guys, mics are not on. Yeah, I don't think so. Mine uh, as well. Uh, mine as well. <laughs> and mic? Your as well, man. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Why is it? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Got it, got it, got it. Test, test. Is it okay? No. Oh, Can you guys hear well? Yeah, is it good? Okay, nice, nice. Technical difficulties for a bit. 
Yes, fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. So, um, aside from technical difficulties, I guess we can start. So, first of all, good morning to the speakers. Thank you so much for joining this discussion. Um, and I'm sure this will be great. I'm actually super excited. And I guess we can start off with some introductions. So, I, bo I believe that both of you actually have really exciting and unconventional stories to tell and actually how you got to the place where you are at the moment. So I mean, Dimitri, take, take you, um, you're a CEO of the, one of the most successful menstrual cycle tracking applications. And I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I read that one in 10 women actually around the world, age 15 to 49, actually use Flow to track their menstrual cycles, which is really impressive. And then Drakas, for instance, you were an ex-photojournalist and now you created this awesome data company in the automotive industry. So yeah, just take it from here, Rakas, you can start, I think, just give a few minutes, a little summary of your life and how you get to the point where you are. So yeah, in the uh, previous life of mine, I was a photojournalist and it, it, it was still the uh, previous credit crunch. So I, in 2009, I, I understood that money is in tech and, and it's something that I need to get uh, more, no more knowledge in that. So uh, I took the field, uh, which wasn't covered in tech, I took a tech marketing. And Thank it you. was you 12, 12 yes. years in Correct. tech. So uh, please uh, share us your business model. <laughs> business model. <laughs> okay, I will do that. So, so yeah, and I ended as an entrepreneur. <laughs> Super great. Dimitri? Mm, yeah. Um, I would want to start from redefinition of the product because you described it in a very narrow way. And uh, Peru Tracker is a just uh, uh, like center, it's a core product of Flow, and Flow is like a super app for female health. It's much uh, bigger product than just Peru Tracker. How do you and, uh, incentivize the creators? Uh, what is that? That's, uh, that's okay. Somebody is pretty nasty here. Uh, and uh, I'm talking about uh, our achievements. Uh, Flow is the most popular health and fitness app in the world. Uh, we have uh, 50 million monthly active users uh, and in the United States, for example, 15% of uh, all women nice. younger than 40 are active users uh, and the same in Lithuania, for example, even more probably. And uh, uh, we have revenue at the level 120, 130 million at this moment. Uh, uh, um, like all people in startup world like to talk about fundraising and money and our last round was one year ago and we raised uh, capital by valuation 800 million and maybe I may assume that probably we are currently unicorn I don't know because of market correction but uh, maybe uh, because the revenue was doubled uh, since uh, that and uh, also I have experience with other products uh, because I'm partner in uh, Palt and uh, totally we started uh, and financed uh, maybe 15 companies and we exited six times up to this moment including exits to Google, Facebook, Farfetch uh, and uh, like it's, uh, it's my background and our achievements. Great, thank you. Um, so I think as the, the topic of this uh, conversation is just sort of how to scale local companies and succeed globally. So Rakas, if you could start um, we know, we know that for most startups, actually the biggest challenge is to scale successfully globally. So if you could also share for, I think it's gonna be super useful for earlier stage founders to sort of understand what are the strategies that work best for you when choosing which new markets to enter and how did you make these decisions? And also, if you could also cover which markets are you operating in at the moment? Yeah, so at, at the moment we're operating 27 markets. Uh, it's basically all European Union, United States, Australia, uh, what is left from CIS region, because of course on the first uh, day of the war we totally closed Russia, Belarus. Uh, and we see here also six more markets of comes. So, but in a data company, you know, uh, as a, I came from the marketing field, so I would, I would really uh, like, that, like that in this company, the marketing would say where to go next, but in reality, in data company, data team says where you can go next. So in, in our perspective, uh, for example, let's, if you want to start some Romania, okay, let's start Romania market. What, 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 what you can do? What is our data coverage? We can, you know, uh, put 
three different segments on the data, the global data, the regional data, and the local data. So when we, we are checking the Romania, can we make and put proper sellable product only with global data that covers Romania? No. Can we uh, get a fast access of the regional data? Yes. Okay. So already two ticks. Uh, then we need to check the countries which are making the export to your target country and when all those data ticks are covered, then we can enter the market. So basically data is the king when you on, on a decision to where to go next. Thank you. Dimitri? Uh, um, we started globally from the very beginning and mm -hmm. uh, my personal philosophy is that uh, it's uh, really difficult to start locally and then become a global company. You should start globally from the very beginning or at least uh, choose a big uh, market. And uh, we still mostly focused on uh, uh, English-speaking uh, countries like uh, United States, uh, United Kingdom, and uh, in the English-speaking world, we in maybe 70% of our revenue. Uh, and we just started to make proper localization for uh, the rest of regions. And I don't think that it was a uh, wrong strategy because uh, uh, focus uh, is always very significant. And uh, among uh, like, uh, main reasons why startups fail, I would say like lack of focus. And uh, this like a grid to make too many things simultaneously and to target too many markets simultaneously. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. So maybe now we can also transition sort of, Bok, we can take from here. Since you guys scaled, you know, all over the world, it's like what are the main mistakes maybe that you made while scaling or trying to scale? What are the main issues that you ran into? So, you know, the main mistake that, uh, that, that was mentioned just now um, and there's a question about multi-product and then you need to go as a company to multi-product. So, it was 2018, you know, we just came to the and uh, start tackling this auto data vertical and it wasn't really all vertical without any tech innovations and etc. And all the tech team is looking at that and all the marketing is looking at that oh fuck, we need to make every possible product to that vertical. And of course we have initial funding. On that moment, that funding seems like endless. And you know, after a few months of development, you're going into realization that you will just burn out in a, like next 18 months if you won't get focused on one. Try to build as fast as you can a sellable MVP product and try to scale it as possible, uh, as fast as possible. And only now, in 2022, when our revenue is more than 20 mil and we have a team of almost 100 people, only now we are starting going into multi-product and only now we are starting thinking how to put all those products into one ecosystem. Okay. Um, and what kind of like multi-product, what is the dimensions that you're thinking about? Oh, in now vertical is, you know, you can go from the building the classified, which is based on the, on the car data. You can, uh, you can reinvent a pricing valuation tools. You can even go into modern CRMs for the workshops and et cetera, et cetera. That's, you know, it's in our vertical, it's always about re inventing what is already invented. And that, that's the main, main reason why I started this business, because I was looking from 2013, a product, all product, it can be, it could be a you know, free product or a cash cow type of product, but from the old internet era. Uh, and I tackled that product, uh, it's like win number checkup, it's, it's, it's life, you know, from the, from the, I don't know, from the, from the early days of the internet, basically from the first days on the internet. Mm -hmm. So I took this product, took the team, and we started to reinvent it. So, and what we're doing after that, and with what, what, what are our next products, is basically also reinventing what is already built mm -hmm. like 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Okay, very clear. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri, if you can take over. Um. It's really difficult to speak uh, about mistakes because it's impossible to have uh, a b tests uh, and uh, like just see outcome, like what would be in case of different scenario. Uh, but uh, what I would uh, do differently, um, I think uh, I would start monetization uh, earlier than uh, we started it. It uh, always uh, 
problem to find a proper moment in case of freemium uh, product uh, when mm, uh, we establish uh, premium features in such product because you need to establish product market feeds and understand uh, what features should be compared and uh, um, we started flow in 2015 and uh, then launched monetization uh, in 2018, and I think uh, we should uh, have done that before. Why? Because uh, by that we would have been able to unlock flywheel of uh, growth. Because when uh, we started monetization, we got resources because of revenue and uh, like, uh, valuation, high valuation, like bigger cash uh, from investors. Uh, to hire more people and uh, to iterate more and more and more and it was like a flywheel of uh, value creation and without uh, those resources development was pretty uh, slow and maybe I would change uh, that but uh, it's always difficult to choose the proper moment because um, people much more often uh, make another mistake they start monetize product too early uh, without uh, proper product market fit and, uh, uh, and in this case uh, problem is becoming even worse because you just can't iterate enough fast uh, with the paid product because of cost of traffic and many other uh, reasons. Uh, and also I think uh, we <laughs> with uh, uh, Origins we had a very classical mistake. Uh, like once I read book, uh, High Growth Handbook of Elliot Gill, probably the best book for uh, CEOs of middle-sized companies uh, I know. And uh, at, at the end of this book was a page like five things never to do, never, without any questions. And one thing was never try to make business in China. Never try to uh, like, uh, put, your prod and pu put and grow your product in China. And of course we did the opposite and we lost like some money and some efforts and uh, some resources on that. But I'm currently even happy that uh, we failed that because uh, companies uh, which got success in China this year were just eliminated from App Store by government games and etc. because of regulations and I'm even pretty, pretty glad that we failed earlier in China. Cool. Um, I think I wanted to come back a tiny bit. I think Rocco, you also touched upon this in a sense like, um, you know, we hear that you need to innovate and go multi-product at some point for sure as a company in your life. When is it the right time, would you say, to start going multi-product? Should we do it, should founders do it from the beginning? Should they do focus, 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 and only then start to do multi-product? What, what is your view on that? In our case, when our budget sheets allows us to do that, we started to doing that. Because we're not into raising game, we are, we are scaling this product only as a bootstrap model. We're, we, we went to cash flow positive in the 14, 14 or 15 months from the very start of selling that and we you know when our budget sheets allowed it and we decided to do that. Cool, clear. So I think that's another interesting topic to touch upon is um, since you guys you raised external capital from venture capital funds and you've been bootstrapping so wh how did it and now when you look back would you wish you have raised from VCs or how did it set up you for a different journey since you've been bootstrapping? Uh, we in general raised but we raised we made a crowdfunding you know your model uh, when the ICO fever was in 2017 2018 mm -hmm. so we general in general we used ICO uh, funding to kick start our product and what you know if you can consider it as a free money in general because we didn't give away a, a much of your company in the really early stage and why not venture capital uh, because I was working in the VC firm uh, firm and I, I I'm skeptical into raising money into really early. Cool. And, and Dimitri, what is your view? How, why did you decide then to raise from VCs early on? Mm, of course, uh, it's always like bless and uh, curse. Because bless, uh, like in, in most of cases, you just can't uh, build something available without external capital. Because like to sell something, you need to build something. And, uh, and in, in many industries, like to build something, you need to have very substantial capital. You just it's the same as uh, like you can't, uh, for example, open plant without plant. And the same here, you need to build something to start to sell. And in many industries, you just can't bootstrap because you need to have something to sell. Uh, uh, mm, but uh, uh, and of course uh, external capital uh, increase uh, speed of growth and it increase and attractiveness of the company because you may provide uh, 
options uh, and uh, by that attract uh, like uh, stronger people to your company because of uh, such uh, compensation but that's also like a kind of uh, curse as well because for example if you're raising uh, external capital you have to grow fast you must grow fast and uh, and in this case, it's not so very all, um, always uh, good for founder of the company to grow fast and uh, have this like blitz scaling model because by that, like uh, venture capital needs to have a unicorn and it's for fund it's enough to have one unicorn for fund uh, like to pay back and they need uh, like um, blitz scaling hyper, hyper growth from uh, companies. But when you're making hyper growth, you're just increase chances that you would just die in the middle and uh, you reduce chances for good outcome for yourself and because of that this model of venture capital is very biased towards investor rather than uh, uh, founder and also like additionally different uh, like pleasing things like uh, for example liquidation preferences of different types and uh, um, pressure and uh, it's a curse of uh, this model but it's like a, yeah it's necessary to find balance between blessing cures. But what I'm mm, against is to raise uh, excessive capital, excessive, because when you have uh, too much money, you just start to make uh, too many things simultaneously and uh, almost, almost nobody can manage to do effectively many things uh, simultaneously. And you just ineffectively burn all this money and uh, end in a situation when you need to raise again and your company is uh, like diluted, like you need to have uh, capital to survive and it's in a very bad position to be. That's a really good point, but because basically everyone is stepping on that, you know, on that problem and on that issue. Completely, and I think there's going to be also like a bigger shift now, as, as you also, Dimitri, well, very well mentioned, in the sense for a VC model to work, like they have to have high growth companies and profitability is not really a goal. You need to grow, grow, grow. And I, I feel like now with markets crashing, we kind of see that a lot of funds are also shifting. Oh, companies need to actually be profitable. And you're, you're starting to pay more attention to like how much cash are you actually burning and for what price are you actually growing? Because I think a lot of companies are used to saying like, if you raise excessive amount of capital, very early on, usually you probably don't even have a lot of core questions answered, such as like product market fit, what am I actually selling, do I have customers, and then you just grow, and that just doesn't really end up that well. Do you see what is, in a sense, like now being in the Lithuanian ecosystem for a while, what would you say are the main, um, maybe issues that the ecosystem is still facing, and what could be really improved with regards to founding companies or fundraising? I, I cannot, you know, tell from the fundraising perspective, but I, it's, from what I see, it's easy to raise money. It was easy to raise money, you know, six months ago. Now it's quite harder. Uh, but for me, it's, it's perfect ecosystem because when we started this business already, okay, I was in tech like already nine years, and we managed to put the initial team in like two weeks, and it was t ten persons in two weeks. It's insane because in like in London, you cannot do that so fast. So. Yeah. Then I really like about this industry because it's based only on reputation and, and it's, yeah, when reputation works, works, everything else works as well. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. So we have actually one question, Dimitri, for you from the audience. So the question goes, Dimitri, two men and an ad for women. How did that happen? Uh, I think this uh, question uh, has very wrong assumption that to build a uh, product, uh, you need to build product for yourself and it's uh, wrong because uh, and it's even uh, pretty harmful to build product for yourself uh, because uh, you would build like a product for people like you it means it would be very niche uh, product uh, to build a good product uh, when you're coming to your office or to your computer you just forget need to forget everything what you about what you know about your own experience and uh, listen uh, your customers analyze your data and make objective decisions and is the way how to build proper products and companies personal experience is not significant and i would say in most of cases even harmful and i saw many cases when people were so arrogant and they believe that uh, I know everything about this topic because it's my hobby or it's my profession and they failed because they were not listening to market users and uh, it's better to be humble and uh, just uh, listen users, analyze data, analyze uh, market and be very objective. That's, and that's because of that yeah. uh, gender, your mm, 
doesn't matter by my opinion and uh, and the same like uh, you may start a company in uh, any industry if you're enough curious and uh, if you're ready to learn and if you're enough humble to listen yeah, that's, that's quite an interesting point because I was also just reading that some of the most successful angels are also saying that they're shying away intensely from like people that come from the industry and found companies because as you said like you're sometimes maybe a bit too biased and you can't see really from like external view what is really wrong with the industry and how can change it better. What is your view on that, Rocky? That would be interesting to hear since like do you think you should be an insider in the industry to create the best companies or do you think the opposite? In our perspective, yes, uh, because we, we in general uh, we, we have four co-founders and uh, when three of us uh, started this business uh, to know knew how to scale a B2C product and one was CTO and when we started building this product we understood that in this data business we in general need to have a good data lobbyist mm -hmm. and who really understands how to get data because you know uh, on the very top is like data that can get basically everyone in this in, in this audience but the biggest part of the data lays you know, somewhere where, you, mm -hmm. where that someone doesn't even know that he owns that data and that data could be sellable. So yeah, in, in our perspective, we needed to tackle one fourth, uh, the, the, fourth the, the last co-founder from our competitors. Okay, cool. So coming now, it's an, you know, such also an interesting topic. I mean, to, for, for the company to succeed, we always say it's the team, team and the founders, right? So who's like, what kind of like key hires or the, the team composition that sets up founders for, or startups for success, would you say, for to grow globally? So I think our model is totally, totally works uh, because uh, two marketers, one marketer knows how to run the organization, uh, one tech and one data acquisition guy in general, and he is also responsible for the, for, for the product side. Okay, and Dimitri, in your case? I think it's my, um, it's impossible to be ideal professional, but it's uh, possible to build uh, ideal teams by augmentation of people. It means that when you're building team, you should understand uh, uh, like um, skills and uh, traits of people and uh, augment them uh, to like each other to build like a, a very well balanced uh, team. And it's the most uh, significant by my opinion. Uh, and of course, at the early stage, is necessary to have uh, people who just can work together in difficult times. Because when you have difficult times, then people start to argue. And uh, you need to be with people who can go through difficult times with uh, you and not to be too toxic at such moments. That's very good. So we have another question. So it's a bit broad, but what kind of people actually you look for when hiring for senior roles? So um, we know that's the question also about ecosystem. Okay, we have a leaders, you know, who are basically taking 80% of of the market of the of, of the of the you know the, the specialists. And then we are we, for example, a company uh, which grows okay twice, uh, twice, uh, twice as previous year every year, but. Our, and we, we are not making the fundraising. That means we are not taking, you know, plenty of specialists. We, we have our, you know, I would say already a mantra, uh, which we are calling hire slow. And our logic was uh, just to hire seniors. And if you cannot hire the senior position, hire mid. Mm -hmm. So that totally works for us, you know. Then you have plenty of uh, older specialists. I also, you know, the, the, I'm calling our company as a serious, serious person company, you know, when no one is interested already in parking, yeah. we have families and we know where we're heading with their, their lives. Yeah, that's, that, that's fair. And then when you hire mid-level <laughs> people, they can grow them into senior. And then Dimitri, maybe it would be also interesting to hear your perspective. <laughs> I'll give uh, slightly another advice. Uh, uh, we have quite big company already, like 450 people, so, so something like that, uh, with many uh, layers. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, based on my observation and my experience and the data from uh, 
bigger companies like uh, Fortune 500, it's close to impossible to be absolutely right in hiring. Even in companies like uh, Google, in case of hiring of top managers, a level of mistakes at the level of 50%. It means that uh, during one year, uh, half of people are being fired or leaving the company or uh, they just uh, like miss expectation. And the uh, conclusion from that is that you just need to be very careful with hiring, but because uh, potential level of mistake at the level of 50% if you are really good with hiring and much more if you're not so good, you just need to fix this mistake fast. And it means that after probation period, if you see that something don't work, fire, 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 and it's the single way how to do that properly. How do you view that? <laughs> we have basically zero rotation in company. We have really? in, in five years only four people left and three of them left to make their own startup or something. So, so I, I cannot yeah. uh, say nothing about firing people. <laughs> Usually, uh, uh, absence of um, when people when you have the same people for a very long time, it usually means that uh, uh, standard is not high enough. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, my, my, my standards are quite good, you know. <laughs> because nobody can hire uh, like 100% uh, correctly. Even in Google, the best people in... Uh, uh, I may advise you to read book work rules of uh, previous... Uh, like. Uh, HR, main HR of uh, Google, and even at Google, the best managers uh, have level of uh, right choice uh, in hiring, like as a level of 70%. Uh, it means, and they objectively measure that, and uh, I would say that uh, like a normal manager, if it's like 50%, it's good. <laughs> or maybe you have some mistrust issues. Huh? Maybe you have some mistrust issues. No, <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> it's not about that. It's a uh, uh, problem that, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, people are really bad in assessing of other people, really bad. And you can't uh, make a uh, right decision in hiring just based on job interview, based on uh, uh, like task work, because the effect is that you just can't make proper assessment, it's self-delusion. Uh, and then like some people may be affected in one organization and they will not be affected in another organization. And because of that, it's just impossible, it's impossible. Uh, it's like the single way is uh, just like uh, to start to work and if you see in three months for normal, like for just like people and for six months for top managers it, it doesn't work, you should like give like a golden parachute and say like it seems that it doesn't work and uh, thank you for the attempt and uh, let's. Yeah, I guess we could have a very long discussion here, <laughs> like the, the intricacies of each how to run or hire or fire people in each company. But um, okay, we have another question from the audience, which is, uh, again, a tiny bit broad, but then how much capital do you need to go global? Is there even such a number? How much is sufficient, I suppose? Uh, I can say only from from this, uh, from our verticals runway. So in general, it costed for us to build, it, from 2018 to eight, like 14 months from 2018, uh, we spent, 4.5 million to yeah. to build a sellable MVP, and from that from that moment we have some, of course, uh, budget left, and we started scaling it. Okay, fair. Dimitri, uh, because uh, mm, I may share with you like number uh, that up to this moment we raised uh, maybe 70 million in uh, primary capital and. Uh, close to 100 million in secondaries it means that we totally investors uh, like put bet in like 150 million with something to our companies quite substantial bet but currently our budget uh, doesn't assume next fundraising and mostly because uh, uh, we think that current uh, market is uh, very difficult and uh, it will be uh, pretty difficult to raise next uh, 12, 24 months and we decided just to be prepared uh, to live without any additional uh, fundraising and because of uh, substantial revenue we, we can't do that. We like limited like our hiring plans and scaling plans. Uh, uh, we used more conservative metrics of pay to acquisition but we are not planning to raise. And it's my advice for startups next uh, 12, 24 months will be really difficult, especially if you're at later stages and you should be prepared for that. Yeah, let's embrace ourselves. So thank you both so much mm -hmm. for joining sure. for this discussion and we have to end and thank you so much for all listening. Thank you.
Thank you for such an open and great discussion and conversation you had. So we build products not to ourselves. We build products to our audiences. So make sure that you keep that in mind. And right now, we're going into the finance world and investment because there are some changing and repricing happening right now. High growth tech stocks are repriced below long-term average multiples. Some even traded below pre-IPO. What's happening? Following such change in sentiment and funding environment, there already have been the first waves of layoffs, layoffs done by the tech companies. Just recently, Klarna announced laying off 10% of their employees. The same happened with Gorilla. And at the same time, there is a record high number of dry powder in VC funds. Are they available for the deployment or are they frozen? So we're diving into our next session called Tech Sector Repricing Globally and its Impact on Early Stage. So please welcome on stage Christian Lanema, founding partner at Karma Ventures. Christian, are you here? I cannot see, we have some applause for you. Yes, here he is. Hello, Christian. Then we're inviting Julian von Eckersberg, Managing Director Europe at Burda Principal Investment. Hello, Yannick Oswald, partner at Mangrove Capital Partners. I can see Yannick is coming here. Yes, hello Yannick and our moderator Arvidas Bloja, partner at Practica Capital. Have a great discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hello and pleasure to be here. Um, pleasure to have such a crowd. Uh, today, as, as presented, we're going to try to help you to navigate what's happening in the private markets, late stage, early stage invest, investments from our own experience. So we won't try to be like, present you single truth, but rather what we've seen as investors and what it means for you as founders for the next at least six to 12 months, right? So pleasure to have you gentlemen on board. Um, maybe firstly, let's do a short intro about yourself, the fund and how to reach you because I think this is important. Maybe Christian, we'll start with you. Hey, I'm Christian, I'm a partner at Karma Ventures, been in venture investment since 2008 and our fund invests in late seed and series A stage deep tech software startups in Europe. So. Hi everyone, I'm Julian, uh, MD Europe at Board of Principal Investments. We do growth uh, investments, so as of series B, so to say, when a company is really ready to, you know, to go global, to scale, um, we're quite connected to, the, to, to this area since our investment in Vinted, which we uh, did in 2015, the Series B, uh, and are now uh, invested in two companies uh, here, Nord and Vinted. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm here to search for the third unicorn, so uh, get, get in touch with me. Super. Yannick, um, partner at Mangrove. We are pan European and Israeli early stage venture firm. So we invest really from half a million up to five um, first check in. Um, we love the region. We didn't do that many investments yet. I think we did our first one was Skype. Um, in Lithuania, we did HumanSat and uh, Flow. Um, very lucky and very happy to be involved with all of the three companies. And um, yeah, hopefully we find more. Perfect. And uh, all of them, all of the funds have invested in Lithuania. So they are not only looking for, they're all already here, right? So let's, uh, let's send them more pipeline. And I'm Arvidas from Practica. We are early stage VC based in Vilnius, Lithuania, investing in Baltic. Been active since 2012, and probably yeah, you you know me if you're Lithuanian. So uh, coming back to the discussion points, um, I'd say like presented, we have a clearly risk-off environment in the market, where many companies are repriced below IPO or even pre-IPO private rounds. Right. So it definitely affects later stage funding environment and in turn early stage funding environment and in turn every startup that wants to raise money in these, in these circumstances. Just this week we had Klarna firing employees, Gorillas firing employees and I think there will be a lot more such news coming our way. But at the same time, VCs are sitting on a record level dry powder. So there is a record level of money available to invest and we will try to dig in what's going to happen. So. Um, Julian, maybe let's start for you and later stage. What have you seen? Is there a pause? What is happening with funding environment in your experience? Look, I think um, 
as a VC, I want to make money, right? I, you know, I have to make money. That's what, I, what I'm being paid for. That's why people give me money. And, you know, as the, you know, as the stock market uh, crashed, especially the pre-IPO deals, so the ones that basically, um, you know, look already at the next round when they value the, 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 the round, um, they see, oh, this, the valuation of this round is actually at, uh, at a higher level than the next round already, so it doesn't work. And so this round will be complicated, and people you know, will discuss, valuations will go down, that's actually what happened at Klana. Um, and you know, there it starts. And then it basically cascades down. Um, uh, you know, the next round will see basically the low valuation of the pre-IPO round, and so on and so on. Um, at Series B, uh, where we invest, it, I guess, reached uh, uh, one or two months ago. Um, so things uh, are getting complicated there. You know, a lot of companies that have been hyped previously uh, and overvalued in, in, in you know, setting it today um, are, are struggling. To, to you know to, to, to do the round, uh, founders wait because obviously they, they w don't want to do a uh, down round, uh, okay. and that's how basically everything gets uh, gets uh, you know messy and and slow down. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, maybe Anik, how how was your experience, and what did you see in the market? Yeah, so I I think for all the founders here um, to give this a positive note, everything will get easier besides raising capital. But I think. Recruitment, client acquisition, everything will get easier from now on. Um, but so what we are seeing, I think this, this, this started end of the year. Uh, last year, with interest rates going up, capital getting more expensive. And, and, and this year, obviously, the, 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 the conflict and the supply chain issues have developed into a hammer, um, kind of. And so what's happening is, I think it's twofold. Um, yes, there's a lot of dry powder, but fund funds will be raised at a lower pace, so investment pace will go down. Um, very normal. We have been in an abnormal period the last three years. Um, so that's number one when it comes to funding. And when it comes to valuation, um, which is, is a return to normal, uh, to normalcy. I think that's, that's how we look at it. Um, the important part here is w what does it mean you know, for the day-to-day -day of entrepreneurs? And I'd say entrepreneurs in this region, you know, um, make cash is king, you know, um, make sure you get a fair valuation, make there is capital out there, good businesses will get funded, um, prepare yourself a little bit ahead um, at the early stage. At the later stage, we'd say get cash for two years just in case and make sure growth is not the only parameter anymore. That's how we look at our business. Okay, thank you. And uh, Christian, what, what, what do you see, especially probably we are interested in the Baltics as you are one of the most established investors here? Yeah. I think uh, it's happening exactly as Julian said, that it's cascading down uh, through all, all cycles or all phases. And um, I think in this region, in seed and Series A stage, this type of dramatical impact on valuations and, and drop in deals has not happened yet, but it's more like everybody is aware that it's coming. And, and there's a lot of like waiting and seeing currently. I think uh, not the entrepreneurs have not moved saying that, hey, let's do a deal, 30% lower valuation, and, and the VCs are a bit like hesitant. And why this hesitation is there is that everybody sees that later stage is becoming more difficult. This means that uh, in order for my fund to make my returns, um, I need to actually make a deal at a low valuation. Otherwise, I will go in expensively and get a kind of shitty uh, kind of exit. Uh, so that's that's what's happening, and um, we'll see if how it uh, how it's going to be resolved. If there's a quick turnaround to positivity, then I guess that the early stage doesn't feel the impact. But if it's going as many expect that it's going going worse, then it will kind of reach also the early stage. Okay. Any, you want to yeah. add something? So, so, so I think this is an excellent point. If you want to understand most of the investors, I don't want to put us in that category, but let's say you know the the, bar, the big the big bulk of the investors is people are trying to figure out, you know, how to value stuff. <laughs> um, and so if I be an entrepreneur, I'd essentially say, you know, the exercise you have to do, it's something you always did before. It's, hey, if I raise that amount of capital, I can reach that, and I think that we were worth that much. And, um, and I think to be a little bit pro more proactive um, with some investors as, you know, everybody's trying to figure out what's, what's, what's going on. 
exactly. Okay. Um, if we could uh, switch gears a bit and kind of zoom in into valuations and deal structures, right? We we saw you know last year, uh, grow funds coming in with no leak prefs. Like we saw like Tiger Global em emerging now. Kind of I don't know what's happening with them. We saw 100x ARR multiples kind of skipping seed round. Uh, no leak prefs. Uh, completely founder friendly deals in two minutes. How do you think this is this is going to change valuations and deal structures in the coming coming six months? Julian, maybe we can start with you. Look, I think, unfortunately, it's exactly those companies that have been funded by these companies, which, you know, I think are great companies um, normally, but they typically are capital intense uh, and now high valued. And so it's unfortunately exactly those companies that now struggle, you know, because of the down round um, typically, but also because they need so much capital that, you know, if I invest now, I'm not... I'm concerned about two things, the, the return, which we talked about now, but also the possibility that they will get money as well uh, later on. And so, uh, you know, short term, I think these companies um, will struggle. So there's a, let's say, short term, I would say almost stress test. So which, is, which company will make it, which not, which is, I think, also a quality um, a factor. Um, and I think in the long term, valuations will just uh, be lower and everything goes on. And, you know, and that I think, despite any, let's say, macroeconomic uh, problems or so, I think dry powder is there. Um, valuations will go down to a normal level. And I think from there, uh, you know, we still want to, you know, progress. We still want to invest. And that's why I'm, I'm pretty positive in terms of venture capital and funding. Um, I'm less positive on, on macroeconomic uh, cycles, um, but I think this is not the topic today. So, uh, so yeah. Okay. Um, maybe, Christian, you, you could also um, tell how, how you see this valuation deal structures changing. It can definitely be an impact if there's less capital available, less, less competition uh, for deals. If there's hesitations, then somebody will, in the end, say that a I really need this money, I'll take a bit worse terms. I think this will definitely happen, but there will be a lot of polarization, I think. I think there will be the, the companies that do, I don't know, um, not that valuable things maybe, and, and they don't get funded, maybe with a really high burn rate where investors don't want to put money in. And then there are companies that continue performing well considering the circumstances and there's still investor interest towards them. So, so there's going to be a polarization that polarization. some companies can't get any funding and some, some will get slightly worse terms maybe. Okay, okay, good point. And Yannick, how, how is your, what's your take? No, very clearly I think we will have flat rounds, down rounds, um, and again, it's like return to normalcy. I, put it. I think just, you know, it's important to point out the difference, what we see in our portfolio and, and uh, what we've seen in 08, 09, 10 versus now is that the underlying assets or the companies themselves continue to execute extremely well, right? So, and versus back then, you had much more hit, you know, you had a macro hit, but also in the companies, yeah. you know, just companies couldn't Completely. execute well anymore. And so, you know, just continue to execute well. Um, and this year will be super volatile. There's nothing we can do about it. But if you think, you know, mid to long term, the trend will just continue, just draw a dotted line from pre-COVID. Um, okay. But yeah, you have to be ready, right, at the later stage to, to, to be reasonable. And investors, good investors, will also help you in that process. Okay. Yeah, because uh, just for the audience to understand, kind of uh, NASDAQ companies are valued very similarly in terms of S&P, right? So there's no premium for the growth or technology right now on the market. So how is irrational is that compared to, you know, long-term averages? So kind of no premium for 2x, 60% growth and so on. This is, this is what's happening. Also, SaaS multiples dropped from 16x record high to around 8x right now on the markets. So we, like, and this public market dictates how we operate because we are, we are not here to tell you, right? We are here to serve you as, as, as uh, investors, but we also, like Julian mentioned, we have our own um, kind of fiduciary duty to our investors to perform, to make money and so on. And, and, and this is why we want to share with you what's gonna happen actually. Okay, and then maybe if we um, zoom in to kind of clearly establishing the funding environment is changing, then how the founder should prepare better for what's about to come, right? Because it's clearly everything is changing. Um, Yannick, you wrote a great blog post about, about the 
market turmoil and how to navigate it. Maybe you could start by sharing some of the points around that. Yeah, um, I just had very briefly one point on what you said before, and this is because we, we, you talked about public markets. Essentially, you had the last two or three years, you know, I think it's easy to understand, you had companies were growing quarter on quarter 30, 40 percent, and that was abnormal it was because there was such a big demand for online products. That's dropping down now, still at very good growth rates, but analysts at banks, etc., they're like, whoa, what's going on? And so that's, that's essentially what drives this volatility that trickles down now to the private markets. Um, I think that's a very good summary. Um, so the question is, my advice, what you should do? Yes. Um, I think um, try to raise cash relatively uh, at the early stage where I invest and what I tell companies that we invested in early on is um, let's try to get cash. Um, um, it will take a little bit longer. So let's start early. Um, it's a difficult discussion I have with my but also outside entrepreneurs because valuations are not what they used to be once upon a time in 2021. Um, but that's the most important and let's focus on execution. It's, it's, I think that's key and um, don't put the company at risk uh, because of uh, uh, some valuations for, of last year. And again, remember, it's like some of the best companies we funded, um, but in general, they have been funded in these periods because in six months, let's say salaries are going down, you find again, we were struggling to recruit in all our companies. Now we actually <laughs> finally okay. can find good talent at the Nobel Prize, all that okay. stuff. So many good things are coming. So um, that's what I uh, would do. Okay. And uh, Julian, how you see this in growth stage and any advice for er kind of early stage Series A and, and companies preparing for, for a round? <coughs> so I think the runway extension obviously is one. No one knows when it gets normal. Although, I, as I said, I think it's a one-time short-term effect, which I think um, should be kind of something to be, you know, have enough cash until the end of next year. This is kind of, let's say, what we yeah. tell our companies. I think I'd, I'd, I'd add two points. I think one is, as a company, signal that you're worth the money. Um, so, you know, if you are a company that are, is active in certain uh, cities, for instance, and, you know, you burn money in all those cities, show that there's a track towards profitability in two or three cities, in the most important cities, because that obviously shows, the, you know, to investors, that you're able to scale in such a way that at, at some point everything can be profitable. So this signaling has to happen a bit faster. I think this is one. And I would, you know, as a very early invest, uh, founder, I would probably accept low valuations right now um, because the higher the valuations are, the more complicated it becomes in future rounds. Um, and obviously you should not give it a f away for free, but, you know, just accept the reasonable uh, valuation because it'll make uh, things easier. Christian, what's, what's uh, yours and Karma's experience? And do you see kind of our you know, region being any different in terms of you know, a bit lower burn rates or? I don't think that there is like regional differences mm -hmm. that much. Of course, this, this is different that here the cost base is slightly lower, so this helps. But over the years, what we've seen companies do in, in circumstances where financing is not available that readily is that the ones that have raised recently they most likely uh, benefit from, from slowing things down a bit and extending the runway in order to have time. Because time is really uh, an Im uh, important asset to have here. Uh, and and, and um, if the long-term vision is still in place and you want to execute it, then uh, cutting back in short term, trying to survive tough times and then continuing with a bigger scale, uh, yeah. that's, that's what the companies that have money uh, would typically do. And then there are companies that need to fundraise uh, this year, later this year. There are like two ways. Um, if, if, if the company is still attractive to investment community, they will raise funding, they, they are a bit more conservative. But there are also companies that find it almost impossible to fundraise. They get rejections and investors say that, hey, I'll wait it out and they don't get the money. Now, these companies, I guess the ones that have survived in, in our experience, are the ones that go into so-called cockroach mode. Okay. Um, they, they kind of uh, try to generate as much cash as possible from customers. They, they cut down the costs. They, you know, don't pay founder salaries, do, do yeah. things like that. And then they survive for a year. And then if things start getting better, they might come out again. And 
we have experience where such companies in the end have been exited for a quite good result. So, yeah. but this needs a special attitude from the founders, like like humbleness and and ready um, ability to live like uh, yeah. differently than in the past few years and so on. So, okay. and the ones that don't want to do that, don't want, don't have money. These guys, I guess, they go out of business. Okay. Yeah, it's actually a very good point on cockroach. I was always kind of uh, making this analogy that, you know, a cockroach can live without a head for three days, without food for a month, can live in space, and one day it looks in the mirror and it's a unicorn. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's don't uh, underestimate the uh, power of cockroach. Yeah, and um, and kind of just also to, to reflect a bit, uh, I think it's very important also for you to measure your company in terms of net burn over new ARR added, or let's say sales and marketing expense last quarter over new ARR added, try to try to look at your business in terms of efficiency before also bouncing, bouncing it to the investors. So I think it was all very, very great advices. And then um, if we try to establish positive, uh, something positive around this, right? Because during crisis periods, a lot of great companies are to build, build and born because, because Right now, even th with firings that are happening, there'll be a lot and a lot of talented people working in tech industry going, and, and I don't think they're gonna come back to corporate jobs, right? How, how, you, how you feel about this opportunity? Uh, how you feel about this crisis as an opportunity? Maybe also we can share some ideas. And um, Christian, would you like to start? I mean, um, if there really will be a crisis, it probably plays out from this angle, very similarly to 2008 when I started and, and this was this was a time when um, there were lots of opportunities available uh, in fund management industry some of the best uh, returning funds were started because they started investing in ideas and and uh, companies that were started uh, uh, back then so I fully agree with you that there will be opportunities I think yeah that's a short comment from me <laughs> okay Julian to be honest I think um, it's, there's lots of good parts to, to what is happening um, because it frees up resources uh, from companies that are maybe not actually worth it, yet, right? So I think, you know, I would say this, <laughs> this should be <laughs> remain in this room, it, it won't, but, um, you know, I think a lot of, especially early stage investors and business angels had, have made a lot of money with, let's say, mediocre average companies because it, the game was, I put money in and I'm pretty sure that, you know, it'll double in the next round. And I think with, you know, this blind investing will disappear. And I think all this money and resources that have been, you know, working on, let's say, maybe projects that were not really changing the world, you know, maybe not worth it. I think they can go into companies with actually, you know, of high quality. And that's why um, I think it, it, it's, it's going to increase the quality of the businesses. Okay. Thank you. And y Yanni? I think I, I, I said that already before. Mm. I think it's, uh, I think on the... At the end of the day, more things get easier now than more difficult, right? Um, as long and as we see in our portfolio, and that's the most important, that the market doesn't freeze, it, freeze so that you actually, that companies can execute and, and continue to generate uh, build a good business. That's the most important, and we don't see that right now. So I think, um, you know, it's going to be a good time. Um, and I think, you know, it's uh, even for founders sometimes, if the last three years have been so crazy, see companies, somebody raised money, it didn't make any sense from investors, it didn't make any sense. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of distracted even some founders are frustrated then. And so, you know, I, I think it's at the end of the day, you know, this year will be a bit harsh um, mm. and a bit weird, but next year and so on, um, um, things will, will, will look much better than they've yeah. been previously. I agree. Okay. It's uh, good to have uh, also optimism because, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It's, um, yeah, depending on how macro will play out, it's, it's either going to be short-lived or, yeah, we're going to go. I think, you know, besides perhaps Estonia, uh, <laughs> valuation have been, have been quite reasonable, though, in the region. <laughs> uh, that's why we're here. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, if we could zoom in a bit on, on your fund strategy, did it, did it change? Do you adapt anything? What do you think is going to be any new conversations you particularly target and uh, where you think opportunities will come? Um, Car Christian, maybe with you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for us, not too many things will be changing. Um, I think like me and my partner Marcus, we got a good experience um, 
14, 15 years ago from the previous crisis. And one of the main learnings was to have uh, a really good portion of the fund for follow-on investment so you can support your companies also through the difficult times. And this is what we've done in Karma Ventures One Fund. And then we, we currently see that it's really valuable because the companies with longer cycles where some later stage investors are hesitant, but the long-term value is still there, we still want to extract that value in, in the next five years. And that's why we have this um, we have this rule that will keep roughly half of the fund for follow-on investments and, and that helps us. Um, and, and so we continue doing that also with uh, fund two investments that we do the initial ticket that gives us like our target ownership, but at the same time, you know, half of the fund will be for the, for the well-performing and valuable companies that we can support later. So we continue similarly. Okay. And Julian, how, so in terms of the strategy, I would say um, focus on, on what you're good at. So, you know, your sweet spot, don't, you know, deviate wh whatever it is, right? It can be sector, it can be a stage, it can be, uh, you know, a business model, a region. So whatever your sweet spot as a VC is, I think, you know, really stick to it and don't, you know, don't do FOMO deals or anything, or, you know, uh, this is a quick mo money re uh, converter. I think this is kind of, we've, we've been quite good at it, but I think this is definitely something that we want to do even more. Okay. Yeah. And um, I do uh, give three answers. So at the later stage, pretty much aligned with you, it's like we tell our companies two years of cash, try to stay above 50% year on year growth. I think these are metrics I've seen all over. Um, so that's number one. At an early stage, we were very, we are very disciplined investors. I think we continue to do what we do. We, we, we. One of my investors asked me if we know, like, well, no, actually, the prices we paid were good. So, you know, was, so we, I think it's very important. So we continue to do what we do. They are probably slightly slower, um, um, but we we're very close to, to action. Um, as we, we, and we spend a lot of time, obviously, with our companies right now yeah. um, to you know, give them some comfort, or comfort and, 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 and make sure they raise capital, the ones that didn't yet. Um, the second point I think for founders, it's important just um, when it comes to overall the market and the mentality of, in, of investors. Um, right now, the pendulum swung back, right? It was very founder, fr founder first, now it's more like the investors get back a little bit of power in general. And so, if I were you, um, I had a story for raise capital presented as a very good deal for investors. You know, they are kind of bargain hunting right now. So it's important you adapt that story. It may true, maybe true or not, but present it like that, I think it helps a lot. Um. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, that's very insightful actually. And uh, maybe, maybe one very kind of precise question because at least in our portfolio, we have many conversations around how you should go for fundraising. Should you do another bridge or try to get a price round and cl clean equity structure, kind of preparing for periods, uh, periods to come? Is it better to, you know, to do second convertible after one you have or to try to aim a price round? Like any advice you can share on, on that? Whoever wants to take it. How In my opinion, like there are different investor profiles. Some, some don't like to do these types of bridge rounds at all. Some are opportunistic about it. Um, I'm usually having discussions that uh, build as, as many alternatives next to each other as you can. Talk to the investors who could do a, a, a bridge, try to kind of put together a price round. It's a luxury if you have like multiple options and then you can choose. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense to be like too fixed on just one way of doing it because um, usually there's more than that. So. Okay. I mean, I can add to this. I think, you know, from our side is look for funding. Um, and if there's no possibility, we'll do the bridge. I couldn't care less about a down round, to be honest. If it's a good business, it's a good business. Um, and, you know, it's not like going to be the only company. So um, bridge will do, but only if, you know, there's not other opportunities. Okay. I think, just let me add one thing, and I don't go into detail, but I wrote about it in, a in my blog, and I said it's called the dirty term sheet. So what's happening now is many founders and investors want to protect sometimes the valuation, and they come up with fakey term sheets that actually hide a down round and stuff. I think just overcomplicate stuff. Um, just have a very transparent, open discussion around the value of the business, essentially 
draw a picture of what you can be worth in, in, in two years from now. Um, but, but try to make it a simple process because if not, you can um, bite your uh, okay. back. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I think we're approaching the end of our discussion. We have some questions. I see one question is about the Bitcoin, if it go up, but we, we will maybe <laughs> skip this and not speculate. <laughs> and then there's a question, will the follow-up uh, investments will be more favorable over the new investments in this period? More yeah. favorable for? Sorry? Uh, more favorable for? Then, then new investments. So you, would you follow or make a new investments? Kind of save your comfort for all the time? Got it. I think with that regard, I, I continue as, as usual. As so usual. Great companies are great companies and I want to be in. I want to back them and okay. I want to be partner, to be honest. Okay. okay. Uh, and then I there think was we have like, like funds in different uh, stages of the life cycle. So first fund is currently yeah. only doing follow-ons and we're kind of looking after the portfolio. The second fund is so early in its life cycle that we don't have to think about follow-ons yet. It's, it's only new investment. So that's how we are. Uh, there was a question Just for you. Them, as yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> they are cutting us off. Yeah, but, uh, about the mang mangrove specifically targeted, uh, what will happen to your investees like Badi or Wallapop? Yeah, uh, they might be. They might have weeping construction coming. Coming. Uh, no, I, w I, I will not talk about any company specifically. But um, mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, how we invest? Uh, I mean, now is the time, obviously, to double down on your winners that mm -hmm. you like. Um, and to support these companies. I think that's important for investors. Um, and uh, I think we hashed around that topic already. I think uh, yeah. the, 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 the companies um, that need cash and they might struggle to get cash, well, you talked about it. Mm -hmm. You need to get the company into the safe harbor right. setting. Okay. Uh, it's very safe. Yeah, and I think we're just right zero, right Perfect. on time. Perfect. So thank you so much for listening and thank you for participation, sharing ideas. I hope it was useful. And yeah, we'll see you thank in you. the conference. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank Round you. of applause for a really insightful discussion and conversation. So if you're a founder, make sure that you start signaling fast and you consider accepting lower valuations as well for the reasons you've just heard, guys. So before we jump into the next session, how many founders we have here in the room who are fundraising? Can you raise your hands? Okay, we have some, some hands. That's great because right now we're going to dive. We have two hands from someone. That's amazing. We're going to dive into international VC uh, site and how to get their attention by being a Lithuanian or not necessarily Lithuanian founder. And during this discussion, we will try to understand how do they make decisions when it comes to investment? Is it the looks? Is it the skills or the founding team? Or maybe that's the vibe that attracts the tribe or both, including the numbers behind the valuation. So it's going to be very interesting to explore how do the Baltic founders actually what do they say in front of international investors' eyes nowadays? And without no more talks, I would like to invite the investors themselves on the stage. So please welcome Tom Lehe, partner at Speed Invest. I cannot see Tom. Are you ready? Are you here? Yes. Hello. Welcome. Dominika Stankavicius, venture advisor at Launchpad Capital. Love us. Irene Oskula. General partner at 500 Istanbul. I'm trying to see where is Arin. Yes, here we go. He's coming from the backstage. Alan Fonskin, partner at Antle C. Here we go, ready with the mic. And our lovely moderator, Gerda Sakaluskaite, managing director at Lithuanian Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. So, hi guys, uh, it's um, a really great opportunity, this group of international investors, uh, and we will tackle this, I think, really uh, important topic for startup founders, how to get your attention. Um, first things first, uh, it seems that uh, Baltic ecosystem, uh, Lithuania included, is um, 
a new hotspot for startup ecosystems. So would you agree? And uh, do you notice that international VCs are starting to screen this region, Lithuania, more intensely than it used to? Um, maybe we can start from I'm Alan. Here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I think definitely, I think um, y you see more and more um, awesome companies, oh, well, um, that have come out of this region that are kind of breeding the next generation of, of founders. Um, at the same time, we're seeing that um, in the typical markets where we typically invest, valuations are going up and up, so we're looking for um, kind of the next places to go. Maybe that changes short term now for the next few months, but uh, I think overall, definitely heating up. What about you, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, or would you agree? I, I definitely like completely agree. So, uh, like, like a little bit like Antler, we do invest across sort of PC and seed. So we're quite early on. Uh, so looking at those valuations, Yone from First Pick, if she sees, she had this presentation yesterday at the investor camp where she was saying, you know, uh, the valuations across the Baltics, uh, especially at the seed as well, has risen quite significantly. And one of the reasons for that is a lot of other people coming in, like uh, outside of the Baltics to invest as well. Um, so yeah, definitely. And I'm seeing, I used to come here, I think like pre-COVID, so mm -hmm. for, for a couple of times. And I was typically one of the only foreign investors back then over here. But now, like, whenever I come to any event across the Baltics, I see a lot of different faces, so. So, so we're getting there. Yeah. Nice to hear. Uh, the first um, thing when I'm thinking about founders, uh, there is some phenomenon, uh, founders charisma, uh, in terms of when we're investing in startups. So I would just uh, ask you to be really, really honest. Uh, with me, have you ever invested in a startup uh, and your decision was heavily made by uh, founders' personality and strong reputation? Um, Tom? I mean, I mean, if you invest in very early companies like Seed, Pre-Seed, uh, you don't invest in companies actually, you invest in the founders. So I think that's completely normal that you um, need also a leader who is able to motivate the team through ups and downs. So you need strong uh, charismatic guys or girls um, leading those companies. So that's completely normal. And uh, also leadership that is able to raise the next round, also able to convince uh, other investors. So it's, yeah, the earlier um, the company, the more it's actually about uh, the people. What about you guys? Anyone? Who so, I mean, from, from our perspective, we are the sort of very early on investor, generally first ticket. So, that's all we invest in, pretty much. So, at the time of our investment, I don't think there's any data at all, uh, other than, you know, the founders themselves, their track records, what they've done, all that sort of stuff. So, typically, when we invest, we're really only looking at the founders. Mm -hmm. Personality wise, I mean, obviously, you know, Charisma, like oh, there are all of these sort of different words that investors yeah. use, like are they driven, resilient, charismatic, they can then lead, all that sort of stuff, which does tend to get a lot of, like a little bit subjective, I would say. So everyone has their sort of different ways, weights on sort of which one to prioritize and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but it is very much about the founders at, at the very early stages and it's the, the whole, I guess, um, work that we try to do, spending time with them, looking at their track records, you know, talking to them, trying to understand the market so that we can ask questions about the market to them, to yeah. try and sort of gauge whether, how sort of smart they are and all that sort of stuff, is all, all that we do pretty much at this level. And you mentioned some features already, resilient, charismatic. What, uh, what are those features for you guys personally? are the most attractive ones when you see the person for the first time maybe and oh he has this you know set of uh, features of the founder I'm looking for uh, Alan maybe yeah so I mean first of all second completely what, what these guys say I'm, I think we are the earliest um, yeah. uh, that there possibly is um, and what we actually do is we we work for three months with founders before we decide to invest uh, because it's all about the people um, at that stage. Um, and there's, there's a number of things, I think, to, to your question that we always look at. So when working with people, when we build, try to build that conviction, 
do we do we believe in the, these individuals? Do we believe in those teams? Um, it's are they ambitious? Are they hardworking? Are they driven? Um, are they kind of willing to go the extra mile, not give up? All of this stuff I think is is, is common. Um, but then when we talk about things like charisma, that doesn't mean that every single successful founder has to be the person that goes up here on stage and fills the room. Um, it then also really depends on what they're building, right? If they're building a super technical product for a technical audience, um, then you need a very different personality than um, if you're building a direct-to-consumer company. So I think then also what we look for in those founders really depends on the context. And maybe I can just add, we're investing uh, in fintech, and if the startup is regulated, we really want to see the people who can work with the regulator, because that's very specific for, for fintech, but we need those people who can, you know, bridge the gaps with the regulator. Even if the founder is very great and outgoing and, and so on, we need people who can actually work uh, with institutions. Maybe just yeah. to add here, we just talking about the CEO, I, I feel, and in the end we are uh, investing in teams, complementary teams, um, one technical founder, one, I don't know, strong in product, the other um, in, in leading all those, uh, bringing all, everything together. So it's, it's actually about the team and then there's often one, a guy or lady who, who's, who's leading, who is potentially a bit more charismatic. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, we, we actually try to avoid in um, companies with a single founder. We always want to, that the responsibility is carried by, by multiple uh, people. So what I'm hearing is, so maybe that founder importance of his charisma is maybe un understated a bit sometimes, or uh, it's just uh, he should be a good seller, uh, he should uh, work for it, and uh, you actually evaluate the whole team most of the times, and it's not uh, dad that you are like always uh, uh, fooled by uh, founders charisma and just putting money in so because what I'm uh, trying you know to provoke this because um, uh, what I'm hearing uh, all the time that you should be like really really charismatic inspired to sell the product and service mm -hmm. for uh, for VCs because it's such a competitive uh, environment and you need to be um, is, uh, you need to be seen properly and our attention span and VC's attention span is really, really small. It's like really, really tiny window of opportunity for you sometimes, especially for I international mean, VC's. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the sort of the, that fundraiser, that, you know, that person who, who's more of a salesy type who can sell and all that sort of stuff, obviously, you know, it, it does sort of draw your attention. But, I mean, we, we do see like across, you know, all of, the, all of these guys probably a lot of startups every year. So we'll be able to s sort of separate the real from the fake a little bit. And there are different personas for different businesses, as, as Alan said, you know, there's, there's you know, there, there, there's the fundraiser persona, there's this team leader persona, there's a very uh, introvert, very technical guy persona, but and all of them have their places with, within a startup, so, you know. It's not just, you know, you, you need so to be that sales can guy. Can introvert can be a good uh, founder and uh, sell the company well? What do you think? Have you ever had this kind of... Definitely. Person? I uh -huh. mean, we, we've seen founders who are more introverted, who are very technical, as, as, as mentioned. But, you know, from the VC's perspective, you want to invest the money today and you want the startup to raise the money. Yeah. In the next stage, the founders are going to be talking to the other VCs, right? So you want somebody in the founding team who can actually sell the idea. So again, it's about, you know, getting diverse people into one team, maybe helping them find somebody who can come into the founding team and uh, working their way through. Because if there's only one person who's introvert and very good on, on the technical part, they're not gonna progress that fast, so. So uh, I will continue if you're done. Uh, you are very familiar with the Baltic scene here. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you say that Baltic founders are any different? I mean, in terms of their um, personality traits, uh, style, and so on. Would you indicate something uh, exceptional? Maybe you notice. Yeah. So I, th I think the, the Baltic founders, especially the, the Lithuanian ones, I think they are used to change so much. Like we've li we are living in the country that has been created, you know, from from scratch. The legal system, currency, everything has been created in 30 plus uh, years, right? 
So we're always ready for, for change. So we're resilient for that. So I think that's what I see in the local founders, which is not that common uh, in, in the Western Europe or, or other countries. So it's that resilience to change. And I think this is what the, the local founders can actually pitch in uh, through their uh, investor, investor talks as well. Oh, we do have one uh, interesting question from the audience. What would you rec uh, recommend for uh, first-year students who participate in a fair for growing their potential per personal charisma, leadership skills for potential startups? <laughs> so uh, what would be like a um, tip from you guys <laughs> for early, early uh, first-year uh, students? Um. I, I think I, I think this whole, this whole charisma thing is is to some extent put into a box of um, kind of you genetically either have it or you don't, and I don't think so. Right? I think story it comes down a lot to storytelling, both in fundraising but also in kind of communicating your strategy to your vision to potential hires, your team once you have them on board, etc. And just like anything else, that's a skill, and I don't think that just goes to first year students. I think that goes throughout. Um, and that's just a that's a skill that you can practice and that you can that you can build, um, and I think kind of going back to the the the, the introvert founders, I've seen brilliant storytelling introverts who don't go into a room and immediately dazzle everyone with their communication skills, but who just really have that down. Um, so I think practice. And maybe one tip for me would be if you're a first year student. Find a company that you like, find a startup that you're passionate about, their mission, work with the founders, learn from them, you know, be a sponge that absorbs the whole information, the charisma, and it will come. Like, you, you have to find the people who can lift you up, basically. And I think that's, that's pretty easy to do nowadays in the startups. They're quite open for interns coming in, so. Yes. And maybe oh. we also uh, look for founders that are actually um, where we see a lot of potential, actually, because we invested uh, in them for, for like 10 years' time or so, and over the 10 years' time, they normally develop a lot, to, a lot, and are becoming charismatic people, because uh, very early on. Um, so it's all about the potential, actually, we see in them, not just, uh, yeah, because there is it's a, so many learnings they will do on, on the way up. Um, during building um, their venture. Let's talk about, I think, uh, don'ts and mistakes. Um, in your experience, uh, what founders should don't do when reaching out to VCs? Uh, what are the most annoying things they do? And you are just I mean, be honest. I said, don'ts, I mean, uh, there are also a lot of don'ts for VCs, and uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> should I, but they could do better, or I mean, um, maybe a couple of points. I mean, um, firstly, because we invest in founders, it's, uh, they can't delegate the fundraising to anyone else in the team. Often there's like, I don't know, a fundraising associate who's basically be made being responsible for, for raising the capital, but how is, she po how is he or she possible to do it? It's impossible. So it's a CEO job or founder's job um, to do it. Otherwise, um, and also to have the first call with, with the interested investors. So I think that's um, the first point. Secondly, I wouldn't involve any advisors uh, in, uh, the, in fundraising, particularly if you raise pre-seed, seed, it's more like a negative signaling. Um, we, I think investors expect the founders to do it themselves. And lastly, I would actually target the right investors we see. I would actually not reach out to everyone. I mean, I'm uh, focused on fintech and I, on my LinkedIn, it's, it's very clearly that I invest in only in fintech and every day I get like uh, pizza tech startup from the US. I don't know, whatever. I mean, that's not targeted. They waste a lot of time. It's just um, uh, sending out messages everywhere. I mean, they're for certain startups, there's certain VCs, generally. And then, maybe lastly, VC is not one size fits it all. I mean, VC is not always the best uh, in, uh, investor for, for every kind of startup. I mean, it really depends. Um, there's so many 
other forms of or, uh, types of financing. So I would also actually, as a founder, ask myself, do I really want to get into the VC game? Because, in an, because VC is all about big outcomes. So big outcomes, do I really want to create like a multi-billion company? Do I really want to go through this journey and, and have, I mean, um, because then I need to be able to grow like my company, double the size of my company every year and it's a lot of stress. So, I mean, VC is not, not for everyone and shouldn't be, right? So, and, and I think that's my advice. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe just uh, adding on, on that, there is a saying that founders are like, we're too busy on our day-to-day -day stuff, so we don't have time to uh, talk to the VCs. I think that's the biggest BS that you can do as a startup. This is you who are driving the investment, the strategy. If you're heads-on in customer success answering the emails, you're doing something wrong. You need to hire someone, you need to start delegating, or you need to hustle then and work 24 seven. I mean, it's, it's your choice, but you have to talk with the investors. You don't, you, exactly like as, as you said, I, I've seen companies who hire investor relationship people who've been in the company for three months, who don't have a clue about what the company does, what are the risks. So I mean, what is the value then for, for the VC, who, as you said, have a short uh, attention span to talk with the person who doesn't know the company? So I think, you know, always I would urge the founders to be in the front lines, be active, talk in the events, uh, go out there, network. I know it's hard for some people, but it's a, it's a skill that you can learn. Anything to add? <clears throat> if I may, I may add one thing. I think to be deliberate about fundraising. I, I talk to so many founders who kind of are constantly latently fundraising. Um, fundraising, if you do it properly, takes a shitload of time. Um, so my advice to founders that we work with is either you're in fundraising mode or you're not. If you're not, you focus on building your business and don't waste time taking endless coffee meetings because it also takes a certain dynamic to get around together, to get that dynamic, to get that formal uh, and all of that stuff. But when you go into fundraising mode, then be deliberate. And then you need to, unless you're a serial entrepreneur that has exited before when you can just call up your friend and you get the check, you need to talk to 50 plus potential investors. You need to be targeted about that. You need to have your homework done. You need to have your shit together. And then it, when you go out in the weeks that you're fundraising, you talk to 20 plus people per week. And likely that takes 70, 80% of one founder's time. And then you get through that and then you go back to your business. But I think this doing both things half-assed um, is something that I would strongly discourage. And sorry, maybe just one last point on, on this one. I've, I've seen founders who start raising when they have like one or two months runway. You're putting yourself in a very dangerous position. Please start ahead of the time, prepare, plan this very well. Because if you're desperate for the money, it shows during the pitch. And it's a very big turn off for the VCs if, if the founder is desperate to get uh, the money. So I think we are coming to an end, but I just had one small question uh, from the audience and I think we can uh, end up with, one, with this one. How should the last year student, I think there are like a lot of students here, <laughs> uh, student uh, Sam Hilsen to be hired for internship at VC because it looks like mission impossible if you're not an English speaker. So it's a good topic, I think, how to get a job or internship in VC. Uh, we talked about founders a lot. Uh, about the founding team, but uh, when you sh want to start somewhere in, in, in the business, um, maybe it's uh, uh, interesting to be in VC as well. So, and I think it's getting popular, isn't it? It's just um, uh, such a vivid industry, I would say. So what do you recommend? How to be hired uh, in a fund? I mean, it's, it's just like fundraising, you hustle, right? So <laughs> you, you don't talk to like three or four companies, you talk to probably 20, 25 companies. Honestly, I don't know how the sort of the general market is currently in Lithuania, but you know, maybe try and do, uh, you know, internships not only here, but across the Baltics, maybe across, you know, Europe in general, uh, try to take that leap. And you just hustle, I think, it, there's not, nothing more. To what do you mean hustle? You should be the oh, proactive. Oh, you, ne you network, you write to a lot of people that you know, you do cold LinkedIn outreaches, you know, that's, that's just how it works in general, right? Yeah. Anything? I, I would say, you know, VCs 
want to get more deals then, right? So you have to put yourself in the mentality where what can I bring to the VC that they would benefit at the end of the day? So if you're, I don't know, from the Baltics and you want to be doing an internship, I don't know, in Berlin, London, or here, you could say, look, I have these 20 great companies. I'm sure you're going to be interested in them. Let's talk. I, I want to present all of them to, to you and why, why do you want to invest? So I think that's at least would be a good try for uh, internship, bringing some value to, to the VC. That's a great tip. Uh, uh, Tom? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I would get up to, there's so many great VC podcasts and things. I mean, I would actually try to educate myself and, and getting a sense of what a VC is about and to, yeah, and, and in the end, I mean, we look for diverse backgrounds. So it's really difficult to say there's not one path to becoming a VC. We are like everyone in our fund is very, very different. Um, and yeah, you know, I'm not also not sure whether VC is great for um, the first internship. I think you should actually go to a couple of first jobs or first internships and then um, VC can result in, a, in, in becoming a VC. But I think yeah, without having any experience before, it might not actually be the, the right choice. Yeah, I'm se seconding that. I think we're in the luxury position that kind of VC is the sexy thing to do. So the candidate inflow is insane that I think all of us get. Um, so that if this is your first internship, kind of the likelihood of us picking a different candidate that has done two internships at two unicorn companies um, or done an internship at a top other institution um, is just very, very high. Okay, guys, I think uh, the audience heard a lot of tips, a lot of do and don'ts. Uh, thank you for this talk. It was my pleasure. Thank Thanks. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you for all the tips and tricks. And as you have just heard, venture capital is not necessarily your way towards funding. There are different ways you can grow your company, your startup, and sometimes you have to think as a founder, why do I want to raise those funds and what do I want from my startup? Since we covered quite some investment topics and we covered also got some perspectives from the founder side, we're diving right now into the ecosystems. As I mentioned before, the Lithuanian ecosystem is booming and we're in a very good uh, position to reach the new growth growth records this year, right? And, but the question is, which building blocks do we have to move and do we have to add in order to have the sustainable growth and development of the ecosystem and making it a huge pillar of the whole country? So in this session, what we're going to do, we will briefly go through the initial findings of the Baltic Startup Ecosystem Report done by Civita, commissioned by Google for Startups. And then we will bring the discussion to the next level. So what do we need to bring on the table to move the ecosystem to the whole new level? Let me invite the panelists to the stage. Inga Langaite, CEO of the Unicorns Lithuania Startup Association. Welcome. Vitis Wagentas, co-founder and CEO of Eneba. I can see he's coming from the black curtain. Yes. Hello. Rokas Chalashavichus, partner at Civita. And our moderator, Odris Janulis, industry manager, expert at startups, Baltics at Google. I said, please don't do it. Hello. Hello. All right. So, 21st century. It's it's all good. So, thank you everyone for coming. We have yeah. an exciting panel here. And uh, to kick things off, I'll ask actually Rokas from Civita to give some context and then do a little presentation about what we have been working on the last couple of months. Thank you. Okay, we have the slides. So guys, apologies for a bit of the technical challenges, you know, 
tech conference without technical challenges is not a conference, so we obviously have to have some. But here we go. We have the presentation by Civita Quick Report. And guys, the stage is yours. Good afternoon. My name is Rokas. Uh, Audrus gave me only five minutes to run this presentation. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, we are conducting the study. It's not complete, but we will, you know, share some insights. Um, so what do, what do we have? Yes, in the Baltic countries, we have a pool of about 3,000 startups, and we have th 13 unicorns. 10 unicorns in Estonia, two unicorns in Lithuania, one in Latvia. So yes, Estonians are, are ahead. But in fact, building a unicorn is very difficult. Only one out of 200 companies have a chance to become a unicorn. But in general, if you think about startups, building a startup is very, uh, uh, making a successful company out of a startup is very, very difficult. Even if you say, look, I'm not interested in a unicorn, I would like to build a smaller company, 50 employees, couple of million in revenue. The success rate when you start from zero to build this you know, company, a successful tech company, is only 5% if you look at the statistics from uh, Baltic startup data set. Yeah, only 5%, only one out of 20 companies will reach 50 employees with a couple of million revenues. Now, if you have access to funding, yes, I mean, you were basically received VC funding, that success rate increases, but it only increases to 8%. Again, less, uh, uh, basically more than nine companies will, will not reach that status. Again, if you want to increase that success rate, if you have a serial entrepreneur in your team, yeah, he has experience building, you know, some companies, that will also increase your chances of success, but only again, 10% in Lithuania will become successful, 15% in Estonia. So we basically, you know, what the statistics says, Building a startup and making it successful is super difficult. Yes, we hear a lot of success stories. Hey, here is TransferWise, Bolt, Vinted, Tessonet. This is great. But reality is startup life is brutal. There are so many companies uh, failing and actually so many uh, problems that they are facing. Now, when we asked uh, the startups, basically, what are the most important you know, problems that you are fa uh, facing? So a couple of uh, problems stood out. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a secret, but one was lack of, uh, uh, a lack of talent and lack of funding. Yes, yeah? so two important problems, and we would like you know, to discuss these two problems today uh, in the panel. Uh, I will still take you know, a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about these two problems. Again, you know, based on some insights. So one thing that stood out and was surprising to me is that, yes, like we talk quite a lot, that lack of technical talent is the biggest problem we need to get those startup visas and get IT people, scientists, biotechnologists, etc., etc. But when you actually talk to startups, startups say, hey, actually a more important uh, talent problem is, 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 is getting access to this, you know, commercial talent, you know, people who would take my product and help me scale it globally. This is sort of the biggest pain point. Yes, you know, finding a, a market product fit and helping me to sell the product that already built, more important even than technical talent. Of course, technical talent is also, let's say, a problem. And then also um, having access, you know, to venture capital is also, let's say, a problem. When you I will skip, when you look at sort of, let's say this, if, if we talk about VC, on one hand, you could say, Funding is not a problem because if you look like at Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, especially during recent years, we are attracting, you know, so much capital. I mean, record levels. If you look at you know, international benchmarks, and this is also, let's see, I was surprised. Estonia, uh, during the last seven years per capita, they, 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 they attracted more money than UK, than Switzerland, than Germany, than, you know, only uh, Singapore and Israel are ahead. So you could say that, hey, on one hand, you know, ta uh, access to funding is not a problem, but still startup says it is a problem. What we see that these huge numbers, yes, let's say these record numbers, if you look again deep down, more than 80% of this capital will be attracted by top 10 companies. Yeah, if you remember, we have 3,000 startups, but top 10 companies have attracted more than 80% of this capital. Yeah, so like majority of startups, 
they're getting 50,000, 100,000. And what we see that this uh, funding is lacking it, it, because in the Baltic states, we have like a lot of early stage funding. But if you want to attract more money, you basically need to go to foreigners. And this is like st statistics, they say that, look, I mean, if you want to attract more than 50 million euros, all of that will basically be, need to be f uh, funded by some foreign venture capital. Even if you say, I want to attract more than two or three million round, two thirds of that money will come from foreign VCs. Yeah, so this is like the, 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 the situation, let's say in the Baltic countries and that we really need uh, somehow, you know, to, to, to get, uh, get access, you know, to those foreign, you know, capital. Now, if we talk about, you know, talent, again, one of the things that we, we wanted to say, look, what about options? Can options be used as a way to attract talent? And again, if you ask this question, you know, very bluntly, how important is options, you know, for these employees? Maybe they will say, hey, options are not so much important because you will say that, you know, 9% of people in Lithuania, they said that, you know, options are among top two, three, uh, top three reasons, I mean, to join a startup. In Estonia, this is much higher, 24%. And the thing is, let's see, when you, again, do deep dive, and this is my only last slide, last point, is that importance of options is correlated very much to the knowledge about it. If you have people who have experience with options and they have received options, 80% of those people will say, yes, options are important. Probably, you know, this is that top, top talent. If basically you have no knowledge about options, or let's say the bottom, only, you know, 16% of, of them will say, you know, that options are, uh, are important to me. So again, so this is, you know, something again to think about, let's see, whether we can use, let's see, options as a way to attract top talent, because when we are attracting top talent, we are building, you know, successful company. Then, you know, there is an exit. That exit provides good returns. Good returns, you know, attract more venture capital. And we have this cycle, yeah, of the success, yeah. So success builds success. Anyway, I think I will stop here because we have very nice, you know, panelists Professor, here. I think let's, let's still uh, maybe ask our audience to maybe join this survey as well. Yes, and we are still like... Uh, 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 let's say that that uh, survey and study is not complete. Here is a link to startups and we are inviting really, you know, startup. It takes actually, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. So it's not going to be, you know, three minutes that you will, you know, finish it here. But, but we would really, really be thankful and appreciate if startups who are in this audience would, you know, take this link and, you know, fill it, you know, when they're at home because we would like really to understand the pain points of, you know, Baltic startup ecosystem and what could be the ways to improve it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Robert. So, two problems, right? Talent and funding. That seems to be quite uh, hot topics and issues. And uh, let's let's discuss maybe how we can solve for them. So, firstly, talent, right? I think education is definitely an obvious choice, but we discussed stock options as a great tool to maybe solve it quicker. I know Unicorns LT has been doing quite a lot of work about it already. Inga, maybe you can share what's, what's the latest and what's still to come. <laughs> So the latest, uh, latest thing is that uh, we are discussing with uh, tax authorities regarding uh, explanations uh, they are giving to startups, but not only uh, startups regarding uh, taxation, uh, uh, taxation of uh, stock options. So we have great law. Uh, we don't know yet in practical uh, way how it works in reality. Uh, we will know from the next year because we will uh, have those first three years uh, that uh, they are kept. Um, so we are discussing in advance with tax authority so that we could share with them uh, how it works in the real world for them to understand this quite technically difficult uh, tool to motivate people uh, and tool I would see very uh, great tool uh, for smart and hardworking people in startups uh, in success stories to become millionaires. 
Um, yeah. And, and I know there were some stories already that some companies in Lithuania deployed this program, but it wasn't met all that well. It wasn't understood that well, right? Can you maybe share? Yeah, the, I think the survey shows that uh, very clearly. That mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, story of one uh, one of our uh, members uh, just told me that uh, they raised some uh, capital and that. that uh, new uh, money uh, coming, they decided that they will offer stock options for all employees in the company, not only for the top managers. And uh, they were so excited about that. Uh, and after the event, after communication with the team, uh, founder complained to me that, you know, we weren't understood by all employees because they didn't understood quite well what they got. Uh, and some even asked, you know, maybe instead of the stock options, I could have uh, some um, financial raise of <laughs> my uh, salary. Uh, so uh, I guess we still, this is still a new uh, tool uh, in our ecosystem. Um, not many success stories or, or we don't know them publicly. Uh, that uh, people get uh, financial reward uh, yeah. from stock options specifically. So, so clearly there's some work to be done around evangelizing them, how they work, what, what benefits it can really bring. Vitas, maybe we can go to you and can you share how you're using that already as a tool within your company? Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Vitas from Eneba. So excited to be here first of all uh, and uh, excited that there's so much people here listening to us. Um, yeah, so first of all, uh, there's a huge difference between creating a company which is a venture capital um, backed versus like uh, growing on your own and uh, one of the key elements of growing the company from the venture capital way is an ability to pretty much distribute the wealth so first of all us at Aneba we believe that there is only way how we can build the ecosystem of startups here in Lithuania and Baltics is when everyone works so hard for like 10 years or like Mantas was mentioning 10 years is too much like <laughs> but uh, for a long period of time long nights and a lot of efforts and there is like two three people gets money and that's like that's pretty much it uh, so we don't believe in this we believe that is the model of a past we want that hundreds of people who contributed to the product, contributed to the organization, would be able to get their dreams come true, create other startups, and uh, we have a few examples uh, already happening in the market. So, um, and you mentioned backstage as well that some of the senior hires that you recently were able to hire was also probably just because of stock options was possible to do, right? Uh, totally agree, Odrus, and uh, the thing is that if you are looking for a really, really senior person, uh, he's coming most of the time coming from the top tech companies around the globe, he would expect, and his remuneration, like in total remuneration, the ESOP will be the key element. Because the ESOP he's getting at Booking.com, Facebook, Google, will grow, will grow in 20, 30 percent, year over year, safe bet, all good. But if a person believes, and he believes in that 10, 20 or 50 X, that's one of the key elements for him to drop his cool job with all the snacks and cool offices around the globe and join your startup with the long hours and crazy pace. Have you, can you maybe share some stories of how were you approaching this before? Maybe is grand vision and just exciting product enough or stock options just got to be there and there's no other way? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that stock options is like absolutely minimum what uh, the people expect uh, coming to your organization as a startup because as Rakas mentioned, there is a high chance you will fail. Um, so yeah, but uh, at the end of the day, the core job. So why? people join organization and why people leave organizations is because of what they do on on daily basis mm -hmm. so you as a founder as an entrepreneur you need to create those environment for them to flourish and it's super hard to do so you tell promises or things you are having your organization and when someone joins you understand that well it's not quite the way you described or at least but at least you tried but that's a common thing so uh, until the moment you are inside and see everything, then you realize where you're at. 
But at that moment, you have a choice. After those couple of months, seeing how everything goes, you can decide, is it for me, it's too much, or I'm super excited about it. And uh, backstage, we also discussed about some of the obstacles we had in hiring like top-tier talent. Can you maybe share some of those not-so-nice stories as well? Uh, yeah, so first of all, uh, congrats to Inga. Uh, they're doing a wonderful job with, with Unicorns Association, uh, trying to pretty much put the environment for all the startups around the Baltics to acquire the top talent and, expect, and meet their expectations. Because we are not compared, when, when someone from uh, Google joins you, uh, that person is not comparing you to other startups in Lithuania. He compares you to Google, so he expects a certain uh, set of things. And uh, current regulations are a very, very good step forward. It's like a huge job, uh, job already done, already in place. So we have the framework to which we can work, but there is a lot of uh, problems there. And uh, I was mentioning the, the problematic area of employee of record when someone is working in uh, Germany, France, or Spain, and when you legally uh, have, have that person on payroll, it's uh, hard to give the ESOP to that person. There is a lot of uh, lack of interpretation how everything that would be after your exit, etc. So well done for the community in the first steps, and uh, as a startup, a lot of things to do in the future. Yeah. Inga, maybe we can get back to you and uh, a bit of homework maybe for the association as well, right? How, ca how can we improve this still? Uh, yeah, so uh, burden of uh, bureaucracy or paperwork uh, is, is burden not only for, for the startups, uh, for other businesses as well, but especially for the startups because they are very fast, very fast moving, growing, and they want to focus on, on product, on, on market, uh, uh, etc and not on the paperwork. <laughs> and we still have this understanding that, uh, uh, you know, uh, business uh, does something uh, wrong, must be do something wrong until it proves otherwise uh, from regu regulatory um, uh, bodies. So uh, uh, our mission as association is uh, to, to communicate with uh, uh, bureaucrats with uh, tax authority with other uh, agencies to explain them specifics of uh, startups uh, so that we would prevent some uh, conflicts or misunderstandings uh, with uh, bureaucracy but uh, yeah th but, but this is question for our decision makers uh, in, in politics uh, who we want to be as a country if we want to be startup nation uh, why not I would say this is really great ambition. Uh, then we should ask ourselves uh, what besides you know, capital, talent, and, and some regulatory uh, things, what else should be done? Uh, and I think uh, mindset of uh, bureaucracy should be changed mm. uh, quite drastically. How can it be changed? I mean, we can't probably expect that they just suddenly come and like, <laughs> no. yeah, from now on yeah, we'll we can uh, <laughs> are, dream. Are there more voices needed? Or, or how do you um, see this? Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, cur current government uh, is the best uh, that uh, we had in, in our uh, recent history. A round of applause, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> even though, of course, they are not perfect. I'm not saying that. Uh, but they are really uh, interested to, to hear and uh, to, to hear our thoughts, our challenges, to, to hear our suggestions, what uh, should be done, even though, uh, as you might uh, know, that this part of, of, uh, of the state is much slower than business and specifically startups. So sometimes we are feeling that we are moving on yeah. very different uh, uh, speeds. speeds. Yeah. So, <laughs> but nevertheless. Uh, we already, you know, University Lithuania Association, we, we had only one year uh, in, in full uh, speed and we already have some progress in, 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 in regards of uh, regulatory uh, issues. So I just, uh, yeah, this week um, one uh, law of enterprises, a new, uh, new version is registered and, and one of the changes that uh, it's going to be changed, it's like uh, 
regulatory regarding uh, share classes. Mm -hmm. uh, classes and this, yeah. this topic was uh, raised, I don't know, like for the past 10 years, mm -hmm. right? That we have to change it, we have to improve it. But the uh, association started uh, to work. We raised that question, one of the top uh, uh, issues to be fixed as soon as possible. And I, as I always say, this is hygiene. This is nothing, you know, um, there is no wow, <laughs> wow changed. So, um, yeah. No, kudos to what you've done already, and I think the, the future is really bright there, so, so we'll be looking I'm forward to sure how, how it's going to be improving. <laughs> Uh, Vitas, maybe we can get back to you regarding the talent, right? We discussed this. Two core problems that startups usually face is talent and funding. And usually there's the notion that there's lack of funding. Um, but we also like to discuss that how senior talent is able to unlock that, that, uh, that big venture capital. Uh, can you share how you see this and, and how was an EBA story in, in this whole journey? Yeah, absolutely. Hap happy to. Um, so. First of all, it pretty much goes in uh, kind of circle what you need to, to, to build a successful business, you know, because if you don't have a great talent, uh, you cannot build a great product, you cannot find a product market fit and, and eventually uh, get, funded, get funded. So I think what is really important uh, to stress out is pretty much the creating that uh, MVP, and everyone has a different a definition what that is, but pretty much the iteration with the users are a core element. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our belief, as, as an EBA we grew, we, uh, from the founder's background, were coming from the advertising agency, so we used one of the great tools of performance marketing to pretty much iterate with the users and understand what we need to change, update, well, I would say sometimes reinvent the product <laughs> because uh, what uh, something what we have built for the past like two months it's a completely shit. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so it's it's really important to have uh, an ability and not to be afraid and uh, spend money, prove it, and make that hit. And uh, testing is the only way how it worked for us, how we believe it should go. It's our formula. It doesn't uh, mean it would work, work for all of you, but at least you can try. It's the best what we find so found so far. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, when you find the hit, when you truly understand that, okay, users start loving it, then it would be easier to access to the funding. Mm -hmm. I completely agree to the seed and pre-seed funding here in Lithuania and Baltics, but when you go outside looking for a capital, you know, no one knows you. You're just a random guy from East Europe. Uh, for some US funds, they are like, like, okay, Lithuania, yeah, we heard Vinted, cool, cool, but uh, pretty much nothing else. And uh, then you come and asking for a guy with a, like a, a super cool suit that you need 20 million. It's like, wow, man, really? <laughs> you are somewhere over there. Like, would you like, like even like put that in the company or you would run away with that? Uh, that money so you know these are the, the challenges of, of fundraising outside but that gives you a great way of thinking and preparing so coming back to, to your topic of uh, entering the growth phase or attracting the capital uh, in the like millions you really need uh, to have the proof which you are uh, getting through the iterating with the users and then not be afraid of failing that. And the feedback the market will give you, it's super important. The investors will push you on the most harsh part as uh, from starting for the first mini minute of the meeting. So I would say good luck, understand that no one uh, cares you, but uh, uh, only you do, but you need to believe in yourself and yeah, push it forward, push it guys. <laughs> Well said. Uh, why it's important to have unicorns of really big, big companies, right? I think, Rokas, in, in the survey, we found that uh, only a small part, we mentioned probably 10 companies, right, at le in the Baltics that are causing the big, big uh, funds coming in and causing the, the actual numbers to be that high. Um, there's another number floating out there in, in, on the internet, I think, that roughly 40% of all VC capital is being funded, is being spent on user acquisition and marketing. So 
seems like this combination of stock options, senior talent, and having this growth engine is the way to really attract those big, big, big amounts. Is that, is that how it really works? Is it that simple? <laughs> to be honest, yes. You know, it's a fun fact. Uh, we have these internal discussions of like, the way VC is calculating uh, or evaluating you is pretty much napkin calculation. Like it's primitive. And uh, like there is those uh, memes about like uh, the, the graphics which show like only up, etc. but that's true. And uh, you know, but you can test that with your friend when someone comes to you and pitch the idea he wants to do his business and when you ask, okay, so how much sales you have or something and says none, so you are not excited. When he says, okay, so I like, I'm growing like, like crazy. Oh, so then you are interested. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, the very first point of that growth. And uh, once you, everyone is interested, then they look what is underneath that. And that is unit economics, how sustainable you are growing. Because growth, just in sake of growth, means nothing unless it's sustainable, unless it's uh, calculated. And then if underlying metrics are also confirming what you're saying and that curve to the up, well, you have a line of investors, you are oversubscribed and enjoying the fundraising. Yeah. That's so simple. And, and suddenly the second problem of lack of venture capital seems to be gone, right? Yeah. That, that, so that. don't be afraid of spending money for, for marketing and testing, <laughs> but learning very fast. Yes, <laughs> fail fast as well. Um, one, one more thing I think to... Um, uh, maybe we can talk a bit going back again to the talent, right? And how foreign talent is also one of the pool that is just being kind of starting to become used by, by Lithuanian companies as well. So we have offices by Tessinet in Berlin, Vinted as well. Um, Vitas, has, have you had some experience in, in trying to attract foreign, cap, uh, foreign talent as well? Yes, I think, uh, I don't know how much time we have. Oh, we'll we have, we, we don't have time. So uh, look. Attracting uh, top talent outside of Lithuania is a no-brainer today. I mean, if you are looking for an uh, engineer, at least those top 10 guys who already have the money, they're already fighting for them, and you come as like number, I don't know, 156, and they say, hey, come work with me. So, you know, going outside is a no-brainer for Lithuanian startup. Uh, I'm not talking about the core team, but like after that, uh, you need to brace that and understand that you will need to do that. And uh, it's not easy, but once you have established process, trust me, sometimes I feel that going outside, it's such an easy, low-hanging fruit to find a really good person to join your company when fighting for those five guys here in, in the Lithuanian <laughs> market. And uh, so, so, yeah, so you have to try testing it, reading it, understanding what needs to be done. It's a lot of work, yeah. but once you are there, you have access to really great people around the globe and they're really excited about Lithuanians, they're really excited about the products we're building. So, yeah. pretty Awesome, easy. awesome. So, so to, to sum it up, I think um, there are definitely lots of building blocks that are needed for ecosystem to thrive. I think we're just at the beginning of this to get the stock option right to get the talent sorted. The funding will probably come natural, uh, natural once you're growing, right? This is, this is what it takes. And, you know, a couple of cycles like this, we have seen that already in Estonia. It's beginning definitely here in Lithuania. We can all see in the numbers and, and in, the, in the air, I think. So thank you so much, uh, Inga. Thank you so much, Vitas. Thank you so much, Rokas. Thank you for what Unicorn LT is doing. And thank you, Nebo, for showing the way. And thank you, everyone, for Go. listening. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. So if you want to move the blocks, we also have to collaborate and connect the dots. And if we want to test, we have to fail fast and try again until we find the right way to grow. And um, our next talk is very much also about collaboration. Recent events have shown how important it is for Europe to achieve independence in the energy sector. And we will dive into sustainable energy, its potential to accelerate that much needed energy sector transition and how different ecosystem players, such as startups, investors, energy corporations, and the government can collaborate 
to drive this very crucial change. I would like to invite our panelists on the stage to start the discussion. Please give a round of applause to Erika Shagolova, Head of International Development at Ignitis Renewables. Okay, Erika is coming. Also, Dr. Sharuna Stamaitis, CEO of Ineon Software. Hello, hello. Jigimanta Zabieta, co-founder at Lectrium. Hi. And our discussion moderator, Arvidas Pleta, innovation partner at Catalysta Ventures. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, such a nice panel. So I will start with myself. I'm Arvidas, partner with Catalysta Ventures. And I'm, as a human being, I'm a much user of energy, and I really love renewable energy. I have uh, solar panels on my roof. I have electric car, planning to buy a new one. So, you know, I feel like this is my topic. So I'm really happy to be here. And also as Catalyst Ventures, we support startups, impacting startups, the way I grow. And usually it's with B2B connections with corporates as well. So here also a lot of connected things. So, uh, you know, with probably two questions we want to discuss today. It's uh, how to become more independent in energy. And the next one is, uh, how can it happen with renewable energy? So this is probably the, the idea. And uh, let me start with questions. So Erika, first of all, I'm really happy that we have you here. Uh, for quite a long time, uh, energy used to be a sandbox for only men. And <laughs> now it's changing. I'm really happy about it. And uh, you know, the, the question probably, you know, Ignitas seems to be a very big company. Lots of energy you're producing to both businesses and consumers. So in terms of uh, renewable energy, so what's the capacity you have now? I mean, what's mm -hmm. the, the situation now and uh, how you're planning to increase it in the future? So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to join this panel. It's uh, really a pleasure to represent this <laughs> women in energy. And um, if we talk about our company, Ignitus Group, so we are very much focused uh, into renewable energy uh, strategy and myself responsible for international development of renewable energy projects. So this is our the main topic and target for the future. Whereas currently, Ignitus Group as such, we have um, 1.2 gigawatt in, in green generation portfolio. We have a target of four gigawatt um, green generation to achieve by 2030, which will contribute highly substantially to the, to the uh, targets which Lithuania as a country has uh, committed to European, uh, European Union to become climate neutral economy. And um, yeah, and we see of course that uh, the targets should even be more ambitious. So we, we very much welcome the, the ambition from, from everybody in the industry, from everybody in the country. Nice, so we're on a good path, I see. Yeah? I mean, Definitely. we have more and more renewables. Uh, Jigimantas, you spent quite, you know, many years in different positions in energy. And somehow, I mean, as a lot of people as well, you, you end up with a charging startup. And you know, it's always for me like, very interesting to hear this answer, so why Charging. It seems that right now we have more charging companies than electric cars in Lithuania. <laughs> so what's happening? Why? Yeah. Uh, the funny question. Uh, <laughs> indeed, I think that the, the most important thing is that that's it. Electric vehicle revolution happened, and it not only happened in Norway, where this month we have like 95% of new cars sold in Norway being electric. That's it. Now in Norway, there is this moment when if you buy an uh, internal combustion engine car, you don't know uh, in a few years if there will be gas and gas stations. Because why should those co companies keep gas stations running if everybody is driving electric? So it's a risk. It will happen everywhere. Now it's happening in Sweden, Denmark, Netherlands, the leading markets. And if you look into US, uh, there was you know California and then and, and, uh, Florida up until the moment when Ford released F-150 
150, this huge truck, enormous truck, it's like big, everything big, is, uh, everything is big in America, right? So Rivian, another company, they released these, these massive trucks. And with that, the revolution happened. Now everyone, uh, you know, can find an electric car that fits your needs. And price-wise, is one or two years until we will have uh, break-even points in comparison to co internal combustion cars in, in, in the economies this level. So it happened. Driving electric is cheaper right now. Uh, I'm driving electric car, and my leasing ma monthly payment is less than I've been spending on gas for my previous car. That's it. Okay, yeah, I can compliment you because in the same station, just maybe let's look to the audience here and, you know, I want to do one experiment here. So, how close we are to Norway? So, can we raise hands who are driving right now electric car from here? Okay, so still path to go. Uh, so, still things to do for, for charging companies in, in Lithuania and, and abroad, yeah? Thank you. Uh, and Sharunas, uh, by all the, all the other things you're doing, one thing which also made me even surprised here that you have a doctor degree in, psych, in uh, psychology, yeah? So, it's philosophy, yeah? Philosophy. philosophy. In the beginning I thought, okay, it's philosophy, energy, how it's related, but when I thought, okay, it's all about philosophy, how to balance all the energy, and so on. So, uh, I want to start with asking you, as we work a lot with uh, solar energy, so what are the biggest maybe issues the biggest challenges so far why we uh, not everyone is using solar energy so far yeah so uh, that's a good question uh, but uh, let's say in lithuania uh, there are two problems so uh, land where to build solar installations and electrical line so two limiting factors and everything is booming so the parks are being bought like in 20 minutes you have no more uh, places in the park the new park is appearing in Ignitis platform and it disappears in like 10-15 minutes so uh, solar is uh, let's say so in Lithuania land and uh, lines and on the bigger scale so we have also the basically supply problem so there are not enough uh, modules not enough inverters you need to wait so this queue is also uh, also semiconductor components and all these shortages, we are limiting factor. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I'm speaking like uh, around Europe itself, so that's, otherwise we could build more and more solar. Okay, but hopefully that will cha change, yeah? And, and we will have more capacity, or what do you think about it? Yeah, sure, so we have new factories built for semiconductors. Uh, let's hope finally COVID will be solved in China and we will go to full production for solar modules, because at least they are uh, leading and we have also nice Lithuanian companies building models maybe they will increase capacity also Europe and uh, US to producing models itself so then we will uh, overcome that shortage but uh, now European Commission has uh, so big ambitions for Europe uh, for solar so you will need like 10 companies like Ignit is building solar and it will be not enough I mean hundreds of big companies will be necessary to build to complete that, uh, that okay. ambition okay nice uh, thank you. I, I think that no, we can come back to this question a bit later. One thing I really want to cover today and to discuss a bit about this energy independence and uh, how much this energy independence is related to renewables. Is it 100%? Is it less? How do you see it? And how it's important? So, you know, who wants to start this, this part? Well, I can begin so okay. that because we are quite close to it uh, in our developments. So basically, uh, from what I see, there is no chance to not to be uh, not to be independent in other sources like uh, coal or oil or whatever. We will need to build green uh, green energy uh, plants, and uh, that's no other way. So in order to be independent, we have no other option only to build uh, wind, solar, and some other power plants. And there is no way back because the money. Well, first of all, it's a planet. Uh, second thing, all money comes from Europe to a green project. So you need to use that fund to build that. So there is no other way. Uh, on the other hand, looking at the project uh, which we are happening now, like Ignitis and like uh, electrical car chargers, you are a problem for the grid. 
<laughs> you're not making it more stable. We are not <laughs> problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like wind is blowing, you have production. Wind is not blowing, you have no production. Uh, electrical car charges, you're bringing problems like blackout downs, like blackouts in Norway. No great because everybody started to charging at the same time. So basically, not to be the problem, you need to build the systems which can control that. So uh, in this equation, we need also batteries to come or some other means of where we can store that energy. Because we have some peaks, we need to reduce the peaks. We have some shortages, we need to fill that shortages. So that, that's what is the future for independence, what I see. Yeah, and I have a comment here. You said really correctly, we need batteries. And uh, if you think a little bit, you know, from you know, outside the box and you look at your electric car, that's actually a battery on the wheels. Yeah, that's true completely. When we are looking into electric cars and into the development of the infrastructure for electric cars, we are thinking, you know, five, seven years ahead, and we realize that your electric car is actually a battery of your power. Imagine you go to your work, and then your office has a solar on the roof, and you charge your car fully. You come back home, and you turn on TV, but the electricity is being fed from your car, not from the grid anymore. So you will be driving your power with yourself everywhere where you need. Hopefully you don't need to go to supermarket afterwards when your car is discharged, yeah? Or that's not yeah, so the, 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 that's, that's the thing. You, you go to a supermarket to buy groceries, your car charges, and then you go back home, you do not need to buy electricity from Ignitus anymore. But at the same time, Ignitus won't have a problem to manage the peaks and all of that because your car will do that. Okay. So the electric car at the same time, maybe if today it could you know, be a challenge, but tomorrow it's going to be a solution. Well, basically it's two things, big battery and a means of transportation. So yes. you can use it as a battery, but also have some electricity, green electricity to drive it. So for startups, uh, you know, for people, for entrepreneurs, there's this uh, question, uh, riddle to solve. How can you convert your miles, kilometers into kilowatt hours? How can you get rid of euro or dollar and exchange your range? How much will you be able to travel and how many hours will you be able to watch TV at your home? And this, you know, combines to one thing. It's your electric car. Okay. And, you know, it's also interesting to hear from you, Erika, and you are what Ignitis Group is the biggest producer of energy for, for Lithuania. So how do you see this one? Is, is it possible to have all energy, at least in the nearest future, from renewables, or it's maybe mission impossible because it's also a lot of skeptics who are saying that no, 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 it's a limit, maybe 50%, maybe 60%. So, you know, what do you think here I mean, as an expert? So, um, coming to this question of uh, energy independence and how significant the role will be played by renewable energy, so it's 100% uh, yes, it will play a very significant role. And basically, even now we have the target set for, from from European Union, right? That by 2050, at least 80% of our um, consumed energy will be from renewable energy sources. And we cannot go actually other way because it's the only it's the source which renews itself. So it will be you know all the time here for not only us but for our future generations as well which means that sustainability is preserved right which we are all targeting in uh, becoming energy independent and um, we just had a few weeks ago uh, a talk uh, a discussion with our some colleagues from from finland and there's it was a good remark made there that we were so much focused on climate change as the main problem which we want to solve with renewable energy projects Whereas we forgot that another, uh, on another hand, we have a, this huge problem of energetic independence in Europe and that we need to tackle that in parallel to climate change as well. Whereas the same what colleagues have mentioned regarding the challenges which, which arise, so these are definitely on the table to solve. Energy system security and stability is what comes together in line with, with the questions, will, it be, will only renewables be enough? And to answer this question, we need to look then at the grid, at the balancing systems, at auxiliary services, and storage is one thing. We are 
I'm really happy that our um, our uh, government looks further in the future for hydrogen technologies and we are already thinking of that whereas when the colleague is, is talking about uh, electric vehicles so this is one part from another angle basically uh, climate neutral economy where you know if we will start using more sustainably if we will have the systems more sustainable and more secure you have the whole package so so in the long future, definitely energy independence is there for us with the renewables. I hope this future will come sooner. I mean, as, as we talked with Gigimantas in the beginning when he said that, you know, the payout period, I mean, changed yeah. from, uh, from, from 10 years to six years right now. So I think there are still some solar parks outside here. So please Google and, and, and try to, to book them. Uh, let's come to the next a bit of question. Uh, so many kind of challenges awaiting us. And one of the always solution to solve challenges is to co cooperate between yeah, startups and, and corporates. And uh, there are lots of startups here uh, who are maybe, you know, also some of them working in the energy sector. So, you know, this cooperation sounds very nice usually. Okay, let's cooperate. But the question is how? And maybe, you know, let's start from, from you, from Ignita's point of view. So do you cooperate with startups? If yes, so what kind of startups are welcome to come to you? Maybe we can... Know, link it in you or write you or what's what's <laughs> happening here what corporations you're looking for so definitely we cooperate with partners <laughs> <laughs> we have actually our innovation department in Ignitus renewables which is very strong and working exactly on the challenges to overcome in the, in in the future exactly for which we have mentioned here right so data companies which which um, data is you know the the basis for a lot of transitions and and, and, and technology, you know, um, technological future. So it is the same applicable to renewable energy and energy in general uh, as systems. So technological companies, startups, which which can bring added value into solving our challenges, which we have, is is definitely uh, more than welcome. Um, and I think with without this cooperation without innovative solutions right and without looking into future we would be we definitely are not able to move on anywhere so if startup sees the opportunities they can approach you approach someone definitely what's, what's the definitely um okay so i guess you know you definitely always can text me via linkedin and I will find the right, uh, the right contact person in the group, but we have um, an innovation department in Ignitus Group who's, who's also there to, to, to uh, check the possibilities uh, of cooperation. So, so I think, you know, Ignitus Group's um, contacts are very easy to find. Okay. I, can, I can tell from my personal experience. Uh, it's exactly that. You find the right person from the innovation department, you find it on LinkedIn, you write a nice message, and then you have a cup of coffee to understand. And what was surprising is that you can, you know, not like get everything you ask for, but the data is available. Data is available, um, you know, cooperation is available. You could, you know, agree on pilot terms and pilot yes. your technologies and yes. all that. And this is amazing. Like we can praise Ignitas, it's really open for innovation. But there's another challenge here. Uh, for like really innovative projects that are, require R&D. They are capital intensive. And for startups that, you know, are living from, we do not have the old money. We do not have the family and full money. Sometimes For Lithuanians, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's a bit more difficult to get the first 100K to build something. And uh, there is lack of R&D, capital for R&D. Venture capital pays you to sell, not to develop the technology. And uh, I think the challenge uh, for this, you know, to startups to develop this, you know, uh, technologies that help to increase the independence or like increase sustainability is to unlock maybe for European funds, maybe for some governmental initiatives that hopefully be in the future to unlock, uh, you know, these uh, projects for 18, 24, 30 months. To, to, to develop these crazy solutions that can help with load balancing, with uh, management of, uh, of the grid, and, and helping people to build microgrids, to become independent individually. Because the country's independence starts with you. 
with you getting uh, solar on your roof or somewhere outside uh, the city, an electric car, a uh, smart home, being mindful about your daily decisions, and this is how you become energy independent. And then the governments and uh, companies such, you know, Ignitus will do the rest. Okay, nice. And, you know, it's a good point you touched about R&D thing. So probably, you know, also as I know, uh, big companies also have R&D teams as well. At the same time, there are accelerators around. We run one of them as well. And, you know, all the startups also welcome to join and then, you know, to build this R&D capacity later on to go and sell. So, so yeah, that, this is quite a right point as well. And Sharunas, I mean, your experience with uh, mm -hmm. cooperation and partnerships, some advices to startups, how to start it, what's important in energy? So, uh, yeah, about cooperation with Ignitus, so it works, it's a sandbox program, it's ESO and Ignitus kind of uh, together, I do not, one person is working in both companies in the innovation department, but, uh, so it works, but you will not earn money on that immediately, so you will need to show something, and we did already a few projects. We are not bringing much revenue, but still uh, we are on the hope to, to build something better and to solve certain problems for, well, in our grid with, together with Ignitis. Uh, what we would like to add as well, and the PhD helps a lot, by the way, PhD <laughs> is in elect and telecommunication engineering, but it's written still PhD, I can do philosophy about science. So, uh, but uh, on the other hand, it helps a lot with uh, grants. So, uh, what helped our company a lot to develop products, because mm -hmm. as you told, yeah, investors, wait, wait, you need to sell, 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 MRR licenses, whatever. Uh, but it helps a lot those grant programs, like Norway grants, like um, you have some other, like Experimenta, some different programs we can find, there are plenty of them. And if you are a little bit experienced in uh, the scientific project, how to prepare them, or you can, hire someone who knows that and you can get those funds and we can cover really a big part of your development team costs like 70% or something so it's huge help for you to develop something. And energy and especially renewable energy is really hot topic so yeah mm -hmm. if someone thinks about applying to this one I would say it's, it's one of the hottest topics right now I mean yes. energy one. I would say now smart grid is happening so the thing which everybody was speaking 20 years ago now started to be to happen. And in smart grid, there are no rules, basically. And there are plenty of business models. So basically, you can have your 1,000 small power plants connected uh, virtually into one big one and sell it to 100 factories. And this, this is one of a business model. So, and there are many, many of them balancing services, disbalancing services, whatever you want in this uh, exists uh, now in the smart grid. So really, there is plenty of room to start uh, some startups and to find the niche there. Okay, and we have uh, questions from audience. Jonas is quite active, asked even two questions. So Jonas, I will choose one of, the, of what we used to, to, to ask. And this is question to Jigimantas. And this is also a very interesting question, I would say. So does EV charging going to get more expensive or vice versa in the future? Because it's also, we're seeing how Norway is moving probably, you know, and prices yeah. are increasing. So maybe some people who are thinking about buying EV, thinking, okay, but Today is cheap, but maybe tomorrow's will be yeah. super expensive. What do you think here? Uh, yeah, it's uh, complicated. Here in Lithuania, in Norway or US, uh, because Lectium is an American company and our commercial operations in, in the US. Uh, EV charging means that you have to have a smart socket that will put electricity from the grid to your car, meaning that the main uh, cost is the electricity. And electricity will be more and more expensive. That's, uh, you know, inflation and all, and then transition to renewables and to the independence cost and electricity prices, I believe, most likely, will keep rising. Mm -hmm. So, yes, but at the same time, uh, the, the, the chargers themselves with a massive, with economy of scale, uh, will get cheaper and cheaper. And currently, a single charger that you put in your garage to charge your car in the U.S. market is much cheaper than Lithuania, by 30, 40 percent, some of them. So it's uh, also, you know, it depends on many, many factors. However, uh, petrol for your car, for internal combustion car, will become much more expensive in a much faster pace than mm -hmm. the rise of electricity prices. It's, uh, yeah, I, I want to, to, to continue on that one and maybe let's discuss a bit of also 
as we still have four minutes left about energy prices overall. And some people are saying that whenever we will choose only renewable ones, it will be very much ex more expensive. So what do you think here? Uh, will it be more expensive? Or compared to maybe oil, it will still be, you know, much, much less expensive. What, what's your thinking here? Well, we actually predict that uh, the prices are when we will come, you know, to the to the point where it is stabilized, because now what we see in the market, it's we all understand that this is not a healthy market, right? Situation, mm -hmm. and this is impacted by various factors, which are quite external. But uh, when we will come to a more more stable uh, electricity system with renewable energy, and uh, when the supply chain will st stabilize. Um, prices of, uh, for example, construction of uh, and development of huge, uh, large-scale wind farms, uh, solar parks, they are decreasing all the time, actually. So there is uh, a lot of assumptions which lead us to believe that the electricity prices will be going down in the future. We do not prognose that uh, the electricity prices uh, will keep at the same level as they are now, actually, in, in our scenarios okay and if, if i can yes. make a very short thing uh yes prices will increase but uh, the amount you spend on electricity will decrease because you will use less electricity and you will buy less electricity because you will have a solar on your roof and that electricity will be for free six yeah. eight years of buyout period and then for the next 20 years the sun will be for free so it's a long-term thinking which yes. we yes. also encourage to, to apply yeah because it's, today it seems like yeah, in the short term it might be more expensive, but in the long term it, it gets less. So for the last kind of shot, maybe uh, let's make a bet now. I mean, so about this renewable, we said 80% of, of renewable, of all the energy Lithuania needs will be on renewables. So what's the year do you think it will happen? The winner will be the ones who, who is most optimistic. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> what's your bet? then we will have 80% of renewable energy. In uh, the we already produce 80% of our energy. We just import the 60% of, from somebody uh, from Saudi Arabia, from Sweden, from Latvia, mm -hmm. which is also, you know, in, usually is renewable. So we are not that far. We already locally produce 80% of renewable. Yeah. <laughs> um, if if we would if if I would make a guess and I'm I actually hope and uh, I see our government's right ambition and uh, I in the current situation for the need uh, of energy independence right I hope that we will raise uh, ambitions to the higher level and put effort in in bringing home those ambitions so. I would actually say that it will come faster than 2050. So let's hope for 2040. Okay. <laughs> Over there. Okay. Yeah, okay. So if I may guess, so the first question we were discussing when we have finally that disconnection from rail to Europe, maybe in five years, maybe now in four years. So that will be the big step here. And about production in our own country in Lithuania, so I guess from the wind what we see, very nice numbers you are bringing and a lot of uh, terawatt hours per year. Uh, I know a little bit more from Sun, so the projects which should happen in very close like uh, two, three years in Lithuania will, will be also uh, hundreds of megawatts, so basically uh, I guess it will be much faster than 2050. Yeah. Maybe in 15 years we can reach okay. that. Yeah. Nice. No. And everyone can help as well, building solar roofs on, or if, if you have capacity, going to solar park and so on. So, yeah, thank you. It seems that our time is over. Thank you, everyone, and thank everyone who watched us. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing next year where we are with the renewable energy. And... Uh, we have covered quite some topics right now during the day. Startups, investments, founders. But what we were still missing, talents. Because without talents, there are no startups, there is no growth. And right now, we're going to dive into international hiring at scale. And for the ones who've been in the ecosystem and in the news, 
You could have noticed the headlines were a lack of talents. There is a shortage of talents, no matter it's the Baltic states, the Nordics, the whole Europe, or even outside the Europe. But what do we mean by that, that we are lack of talents? Since the business models are changing, we're getting more into the hybrid working environments, we're getting more into remote thirst, the moving became really easy, especially after the pandemics. What are the challenges we're facing as founders when we have to hire internationally? We're going to hear right now a panel of experts who will share their learnings and how to actually do the international hiring at scale in a successful way and what kind of learnings do they have already to share with you so you can avoid that. I would like to invite to the stage Ilona Bernataite, Chief People Officer at Kilo Health. We would need some round of applause. Hello, Ilona. Agne Salamonaite, Deputy CEO and Chair of the Board at Connect Pay. Welcome. Rita Simonovicuta, Head of Culture at Watagraph. Karolis Chasonis, Talent Acquisition Unit Lead at Interactio. Welcome. And our moderator, Justas Gruba, Country Manager at Meet Frank. So let's dive into the talents world. and share the stage with uh, such experts. So the first thing that actually came to my mind when I thought about hiring at scale in general, that it's actually a really exciting uh, kind of a phase for a startup. Uh, you get to see people coming into office, getting hired, getting onboarded. Um, but it's kind of a not only fun and games when you think about it. If things go south, it can actually really affect uh, the growth of your startup. So, uh, actually, today I share stage with uh, f uh, representatives from four startups, uh, Watergraph, Kilo Health, Connect Pay, Interactio, and uh, all of them are actually already in kind of a this phase and are already in this stage. So, uh, hopefully, we can hear some cool insights, uh, discuss about things, and uh, kind of uh, know more about international hiring at scale. So, maybe quickly, all of you guys can introduce the companies that you're representing, and then we can kick off with the question. So, what are you guys doing? Uh, yeah, sure, maybe I can start. So, yeah, I, I represent Watergraph. We are a um, uh, B2B SaaS platform, and we help marketing agencies across the globe uh, with their mar uh, reporting uh, and uh, data analytics. And uh, yeah, we, as a company, we grow rapidly, as most of our colleagues. We're not the biggest in the market, but definitely very international. We have uh, 20 nationalities actually right now working alongside each other. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think shortly maybe that would uh, cover it for yeah. Autograph. Yeah. Sure. So. Hi, hi everyone. So uh, I'm con from Connect Pay, and we are um, providing business, well, providing online businesses and marketplaces with financial solutions like bank accounts, payments, cards, and and all the uh, payment initiations, everything that they can trade and, and do things online with their clients as well. Since our clients are uh, global ones, so so is our team. We are based in Vilnius and and found in Vilnius and created in Vilnius, but uh, we've got probably now 10 nationalities and in, in not staying in the office because it's a workplace we work remotely everywhere um, yeah and I think that's the crucial part for us to keep that global focus for our people who are in the team to serve the clients who are globally as well yep. cool. Hello. yes hi everyone um, so Kilo Health is a health tech company and we do a lot of different we build a lot of different products in digital wellness and uh, chronic condition space and we definitely learned a lot of lessons about scaling fast because uh, from 2021 to 2022 we grew by 460 people which was I don't know 70 percent uh, so uh, I'll, I'll be happy to share some of those experiences and uh, currently uh, most of the people are still based in Lithuania, I would say maybe 90%, uh, but we definitely have uh, a lot of uh, international people working around the world. Good. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Karolis. I represent the Interactio, and uh, inter at Interactio, we're building bridges to limited knowledge. So basically, we are a SaaS uh, company, and uh, by, our, by help of our platform, we are allowing 
basically all the world to speak in their own language. For example, I could speak today Lithuanian and you can choose any kind of a language that you are speaking your native language and then you could understand me in the real time. So we are connecting um, governments, uh, institutions, corporates and the whole world and allowing them to speak natively. Okay, cool. So since we already know what all of you guys do, uh, we can kick off the discussion. So probably the first question that came to my mind was, what are the main challenges that startups actually face when they start to hire at scale and especially internationally? So who would better know than probably Kilo Health at this point? <laughs> so, so yeah, the second fastest growing company in Europe. So please, Lana, maybe you can share your insights about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think one of the lessons we learned um, in scaling from 150 to 600 people in one year is that um, you definitely have to be ready and ready, I mean you have to have um, internal processes, infrastructure and enough people even to onboard those new joiners and you have to take into account that also it will cost a lot of money for you because those uh, new joiners do not bring the value from the day one. Um, and also you don't necessarily use their full potential uh, in the first place uh, when you have one senior person and then three new joiners at the same time. So all those things kind of make uh, a little bit of a house which doesn't necessarily is good for the business or even for those new hires and uh, you might lose uh, both some capital and, and money and also you might lose some people in the process which they leave because they feel that uh, it wasn't smooth process or it wasn't what they were expecting. So what we are doing now this year, we are definitely slowing down a little bit our hiring processes and trying to streamline the internal processes to be ready for the next hiring uh, phase. Yep, Carlos? Yeah, uh, on top of that, uh, what Alon actually said, uh, all of those administrative tasks, teams, you know, recruitment teams, needs to be in place in order to have a success and uh, build candidates, candidates pipeline. But uh, when I started Interactio, I understand one, one thing, that we are not doing compromises on personality. We would rather uh, hire for the attitude uh, instead of, you know, technical skills, instead of person who has huge portfolio, extensive experience, and uh, we'll, uh, we definitely will choose eager person who aligns with our values. At, at, and uh, at the end of the day, I think we did a pretty great job with that because uh, when you sp uh, are dealing with different uh, teams, uh, resolving some projects, discussing, having the discussions basically, uh, you know that at the end of the day you will reach the same goal with minor adjustments, minor compliments to your project or, or, or discussion basically, but you are seeing the same vision, you are seeing well basically what Henrik has created in, at Interactio and we are seeing uh, to the same direction basically. I can share one of the uh, more of a, like a founder's dilemma or like the manager's dilemma. When, when you scale and you grow, uh, I think in our example, it's technology and people that drives the company in general. So that's, that's two key parts. Uh, when you have a team of 30 people and you probably know everyone basically by names, by what they do, where they're from and, and, and so on. When you start scaling, then you lose this um, a close, very close relationship yeah. to every, every single every person. Single person. And then you, you sort of, at some point, you start asking yourself, so um, why am I doing this? Why do I need the scale? I don't know majority of the people or like half of the people. So is it still, am I still there where I want to be? And, and is, do we need really the scale as well? So that's just, obviously you go through stages and this is something that you uh, meet at some point of, of, of growing up as well. But the other thing as well, I think the challenge is to keep this culture and, and the personality as you mentioned, right? because you definitely want to work with people like you, but then when there's a scale of, I don't know, 150 plus uh, people, then obviously you cannot have the same people. They obviously have their features, their individuality and things. So how do you get, you know, everyone on the same page, aligned with the same attitude, with the same willingness to achieve the same goal as well? So this is, there's no answer that I would provide, right? Because everyone yep. is, uh, facing it or sorting out in different ways, but I think this is the definitely a challenge for a majority of the of the people at least I've I've talked to as well at some point to, to go through. 
Yeah, and I can second that actually, because uh, me, uh, as a head of culture, I exactly entered at that stage when Metro Ralph was, uh, you know, scaling and figured out that, yeah, culture is the way to go, you know, if we want to keep the, not only the momentum going, but really hire the people for the values that, that we live and for the values that, you know, work for the company and what we stand for. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely a challenge when you, how to, you know, communicate it to, to, the, to the candidates and to the, well, existing people already to make sure that we all live, you know, for the, let's say, to work and we will all work towards the same goal, which in our case, yeah, we are on the mission to empower everybody to make, uh, you know, better database decisions and fast. Yeah. So it, it's really, uh, you need to find it in the candidates too. And uh, yeah, getting back to the factual challenges, uh, as when, when we started scaling, we figured that as a B2B SaaS platform, we don't really have even enough candidate pool in Lithuania to be able to scale, sure. not in quantity, but in terms of positions that we need. Uh, just to give an example, product marketing manager is something that you rarely see in Lithuania labor yep. market. Uh, so definitely this is one of the challenges that we needed to overcome. And we were happy to, uh, well, I'm personally happy as a people person that we have very involved uh, hiring managers because I think that's also one of the key things in order to overcome challenges quickly yep. when you're scaling to have very involved hiring managers. Otherwise, you, the process is going to extend even, the, uh, even if they're there. Yep. And, uh, you know, you snooze, you lose in this hot uh, labor market. So that's just my two cents. Yep. True. Well, in general, hiring at scale is a really delicate balancing yeah. act. So, so yeah, that's true. And kind of limiting yourself to, to one market where you're searching for people would be kind of a shooting yourself in the foot. So that's true. Yeah. But okay, uh, we can jump to another question. So uh, what do you guys think is the key thing to make uh, hiring at scale successful? So maybe Carlos. Yeah, and uh, it already started talking about that. Uh, yep. I think there are two most important things about that when you're considering not Lithuania, but um, throughout Europe or, or even the USA or something like that. So first of all, you need to understand that the hiring is a two-way street. So you can have a recruitment team in place, huge experts, big pipelines, lots of candidates. But if you don't have a hiring manager who is engaged into the hiring process uh, and knows how to do you know, interviews, how to speak with the candidates, how to sell himself, how to sell the company, you will go nowhere basically. And uh, throughout my experience, I had many, many uh, these cases when, you know, you're presenting to one position, 10, even 20 sometimes candidates, and there is still no hire. And when you dig, dig deeper, you understand that, well, hiring manager is like doing something, but actually not decisive and uh, doesn't want to, to actually hire. Another thing is to consider for us uh, um, the culture, definitely the culture. Because even, for example, 300 kilometers from Vilnius, for example, to Riga, um, our Bal Baltic neighbors, right, makes a huge difference in, in uh, how people approach their tasks, how people work, uh, how they handle projects, what are the tempo of working, you know, uh, what kind of a questions they would ask and so on and so forth. Um, for example, if you were hiring in Scandinavia, right, so you better just send out a bunch of emails uh, and not to their personal uh, emails, for example, but to their uh, work accounts because for Scandinavian, if you are reaching out to them, to, to them via phone or email, personal email, email address, it can be considered as an intrusion in their personal world base. So uh, engaged hiring managers and know, uh, knowing how to do that. And of course, you need to do, uh, do your research on the certain markets where, where you are aiming to hire. So these are two things. I can uh, share actually the opposite example <laughs> when because uh, yeah definitely culture plays a very important role and in some markets like southern markets uh, like for example we have colleagues working from Kenya from Nigeria it's exactly the opposite like they WhatsApp you they're super personal yeah, uh, yeah so it's definitely culture is very very um, in, well interesting but also a challenge to definitely consider when when you know going very international because. Yeah, it's very much dif different across countries and we need to consider that and uh, well share with hiring managers if they haven't had experience before because I believe, uh, well, COVID actually enabled this opportunity, right? To, to become very much international, uh, not only to us, uh, 
Uh, but then uh, we must understand that it was a first time experience for a lot of not only, you know, uh, recruiters, but also hiring managers to work with distributed uh, international teams. Mm -hmm. So definitely something yeah, to overcome. <laughs> Yes, and, and one lesson we also learned is that um, you need to prioritize and understand which positions you actually want to you know, recruit outside of Lithuania uh, and where that talent pool sits because uh, we sometimes have uh, 100 open positions and then we, we would go to all 200 countries, uh, the amount of job ads and CVs we would get would be insane. Um, so we said, okay, uh, we need to prioritize both countries and the positions which we really want to, you know, hire outside, which maybe does not exist in Lithuania. And second thing, we also got back to the cultural thing, how not to make those p people feel awkward when, I don't know, one person sits somewhere, you know, in Africa, one sits somewhere in Asia. So we said, okay, let's do some maybe European hubs where we can at least have two, three people sitting in a little office. That's one of the reasons we opened last year also Berlin office because we said, okay, you know, let's make a hub. We are also now opening an office in, in Riga. You're considering Stockholm, Amsterdam as an office uh, hub locations to keep people a little bit feeling having that kilo culture wherever they are. Um, and that definitely works for us at the moment. Yeah, this is, this is critical and I think uh, it's a good timing for us to talk now because we're now, what, the third year that we're all working online and remotely and it's like a new normal. Um, but I, th I think now we can measure that every person really needs the human interaction as well. So uh, no matter how used we are on working remotely or like independently and, and have the operation standards, rules, everything is fair, everything is communicated, but really like to keep people on board and to keep people like retain them as well. I think, I think the relation matters a lot. And as you said, having a hub where you can meet every quarter at least or every month, like we, we've noticed that we need to, to do a vocation somewhere. So I think the, um, this infrastructure that needs to be not only on the paperwork, like mm -hmm. on, the, on the standards, how we operate, but really um, think where do you meet? How often do you meet to, to keep the relations going between people, starting from parties and, and brainstorms, strategic sessions, everything like that as well. Yep. Okay, cool. So actually, uh, uh, while you talked, I, I checked one of the questions that popped in and it actually kind of uh, correlates with the same thing that I wanted to ask. So uh, so the person asked, asked uh, uh, let me see one second. So how do you build a talent acquisition strategy when you're experiencing such a rapid growth? So my question on, on the other hand was, let's say, even if you are already experiencing, but maybe even prior to that, when you, let's say, you just raise your series or whatever, you would start to, start to hire. So what things do you kind of try to plan out prior to, to doing that? Well, I think mm, it's important to start with the headcount, right? To understand how many people will you actually need in order to well plan then how many recruiters you'll need in a, in a talent acquisition team. Uh, and then whether we have that talent in-house, I mean in Lithuania within borders, or do we need to hire somewhere else? Just as an example I mentioned, right? So with, the, with the positions that don't exist in the market. I would start with these things. Yep, yeah. okay. Uh, well, our experience as well, like as you mentioned, right? The roles, are they present? Where are they present most? Sometimes it's a, it's a good market. Uh, I know like one of the competitors or like one of the peers, they've just let go or like they're optimizing. So you always watch how the industry behaves and, and see where that talent is probably available at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, but I, I think it, it depends on what you're looking at and, and, and the scale of it really. So, and then get, get wild and creative of how to acquire that, right? Or the tax, perhaps like legal tax system, that 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 jumps in as well. And, and how do you um, hire people? You know, if it's worth it at all, because yeah. at some point it gets pretty expensive if you don't hire, uh, you know, locally. And so, but you probably mm. would have <laughs> experience in sharing here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, checking the salary ranges in uh, <laughs> different countries is probably one of the things. Uh, checking in the market saturation, which we did uh, on LinkedIn, kind of some analytics of in which country, which kind of professionals there are and how many open positions are in that country to understand even if it's worth it going to that country. And also all local rules and regulations. For example, in Germany, the notice period is three months. So if your hiring process is three months and then their notice period is three months, you have to understand that it will not be a fast hire uh, and it might take six, maybe to eight months to take someone in. 
Um, so all those kind of little tweaks, or in Scandinavia, it's also there are some additional pension funds which might increase, uh, you know, your costs by 20, 30, 40 percent. Um, all, all those things, um, and also it's 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 sometimes it's easy to put a, a LinkedIn ad, you know, job ad, and get CVs, um, but it's not easy to attract the right people, and for that you also have to put a lot of effort. So we sat down, for example, with the communications team, and we tried to build a strategy. Okay, how do we become more known in those markets or those countries where we want to come, that people that we would attract the right people that senior, more senior people would be interested because they're not interested in some little unknown companies, they apply just to big names. So there's kind of a lot of elements, little elements here and there which you need to do to make sure that uh, you find those uh, top talents. Uh, totally agree, uh, great perspective, great, uh, great plan uh, to have. But I wanna share some insights from startup life. So if you are working or looking for a work in startup, you need to understand one basic thing. Things can go, can change during the week. Yeah. We're not talking about the quarters, we're not talking about months or so or years. Lots of different changes can happen throughout the week. And ideally, you will have that plan, you have uh, understanding of the um, salary, uh, benefits, uh, vacations, everything basically, and you are uh, really good prepared and uh, going and, and recruiting uh, in that precise market, for example. But you have to have really strong team when you are going to, uh, from 70, 60 people to one and a half, uh, one, 150 people in a half a year. It's total madness. And you need to watch out over your team, uh, prepare them for that. And uh, basically, if you get the right core of uh, talent acquisition or recruiters, HR, then you can easily uh, figure it out everything. Because we had lots of different scenarios where apparently there, for example, in Italy, if I'm not mistaken, there is my team, they can pull me uh, if I'm wrong, but uh, they have 13 and 14 salary, I believe. Uh, for example, we're making an offer to candidate, candidate decides to move from UK to Italy or Spain. How we approach that? Do we offer a contract? Are we employing him permanently? So on and so forth. So I would say prepare yourself, embrace yourself, because it's a real madness. But uh, as we are looking um, at the moment, uh, the changes that, that we went through, uh, you gain during one year, you gain three, four years worth of experience. So if you can get, get a job in startup, do that. Yeah, okay, cool. So. Uh, I actually uh, wanted to ask guys, uh, what are the kind of uh, countries that you might target if you want to, to kind of uh, hire at scale? Would it be only that you are uh, trying to hire someone from Europe or is it more like uh, anywhere in the world because it's kind of a remote, uh, remote times? So maybe you can give your... Yeah, well again, it depends on the position that you're recruiting for, right? Like uh, as I started and then as uh, Alona shared an example, you really need to map out the market first. And if the candidates that you're looking for are there, great. But if they're not, it doesn't make sense for you to go there or if it's too expensive. So at least, uh, yeah, that's, uh, th I think that's, well, that's what it depends on, uh, whether you have talent uh, in Lithuania or not. And then you look where you have it. For example, in our case, uh, because we are yeah, a marketing uh, platform for data and analytics and reporting, then uh, yeah, uh, we need to look into more, let's say, developed markets uh, uh, in that area. So then more naturally it's gonna be US or, or Europe when, uh, well, where we're gonna focus on. But again, it depends, uh, it depends on, a, on, a, on a position you're working for um, or looking for. And um, to, to give you another example, like customer success, right? If we yep. want to, to take care of our clients in APAC region, then probably somebody local there would, uh, you know, un sure. maybe understand the culture better and uh, the customers, uh, you know, uh, would be maybe happier uh, to, to, well, with that culture fit. So it really depends on, yeah, on the position, I'd say. Yeah. I agree with that uh, totally. Uh, Business-wise, if your client is, I don't know, if you go, go to a market, uh, Poland or, or Netherlands, you would definitely look for a salespeople or business development, someone locally there for, mm -hmm. for the network and access, faster access to, to network as well. Um, 
customer support probably can be anywhere, but definitely you would look for someone, native speakers at least, so uh, anyone would know the, 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 the culture and language of, of, the, of the client as well. IT, like tech, can be anywhere, really. Like, it's, it's not a matter of geography anymore. I think that in, in this nomad world, like, you can hire anyone. Then you look at the tax and legal and perhaps the, the way of employing rather than the actual target as a person. And um, working hours. Yeah, sorry yeah, for interrupting. Exactly. But yeah, that sounds obvious, but it's such a learning to learn <laughs> that, hey, working hours need to be at least in a similar time zone. Yeah. <laughs> well, like communication, because you yeah, create something yeah. as well. <laughs> and, and then, well, we at least are regulated, right? So we, our license is local here. If we expand, we probably could uh, w would acquire other licenses somewhere else as well. Then on the compliance part, the legal part, you would need local. So again, that depends really on the business case, on the model where, where you're at. Well, guys, if a good candidate lands in our hands, we would hire him or her, <laughs> even if he or she is from the moon. <laughs> <Don't laughs> <don't laughs> yeah. cool. um, but uh, definitely, for us, at least at this moment, we decided to focus a little bit more on Europe uh, because of a lot of reasons, again, some of them being even uh, that the distance, flight distance to Vilnius is not so far, so especially if you have more senior people, you can ask them more often to come down, you know, and to see you and to spend uh, time with the team, etc. Um, there are some reasons, like customer support, we have them all around the world because uh, of the time differences and, and all of that, but uh, the focus, we, we try to spread around the world and we said, okay, let's start with Europe now, let's go strong in Europe and then we'll see. Yeah, I second Alona, basically, whenever we, we, we can find suitable talent, um, we, we will hire him or her. Um, but uh, sometimes we have precise business cases. So as we are working with governmental institutions such as European Parliament, European Commission, NATO, United Nations, and so on and so forth. So sometimes we need to you know, have a precise location such as Belgium or France and uh, to hire those specialists over there. Um, sometimes when, uh, what Rita mentioned that uh, you need to understand the working hours it can play to your advantage. For example, if you need to cover USA, um, Asia, or something like that, definitely you will hire there because our company's policy is uh, not to have 24 seven operations. It's, it's total nonsense, in my, yeah. my opinion. So we aim to hire in certain countries. For them, it will be like 8 in the morning, 9 in the morning, usual standard business hours, yeah. Okay, cool. So actually, we kind of learned a lot, I think, and the main thing that all of the startups should consider, I think, moving forward is that there's no borders anymore to hiring talent. If it's a good talent, uh, go for it. Uh, the country or the culture, for sure, is not a limit. So I think we are kind of wrapping it up. So maybe uh, last tips from everyone. One quick tip. Somebody, let's shoot. Mm -hmm. I can go first then. Uh, okay. I think it's also important to not forget that it's a big organizational change for your people who are currently hired in Lithuania, let's say. So you need to definitely also consult with them and, and do that change management that now the teams won't sit just in one room in, let's say, Vilnius or Klaipeda office and that the main language will become English, which also might be a struggle for some people. Uh, and we have some cases where people needed, you know, or asked for English language courses once we moved uh, this January to full English kind of speaking company. So this is something also to definitely consider and talk to your people first. I was going to uh, suggest the English, which is, seems to be obvious, yeah. mm. but it's not so obvious when it comes to the organizational culture. So one thing that we definitely like we now introduced to check the written English of every single person who comes into office, because there's not so much time to talk all the time, but definitely the communication turns into English and, and written English in most of the time. So fluency, structure of thoughts, and, and this is something that it's definitely needs to be considered, not as a, um, an obvious thing, <laughs> but yeah. definitely needs to be checked everywhere. What I'd add is, uh, as you're, yeah, if you want to uh, scale uh, successfully, you need to not only focus on recruitment, but also on retention, actually. Yep, and that comes in a lot of forms and with a lot of initiatives, but since the international hiring is happening remotely because of COVID and also post-COVID, so those processes and documentation of it and building really this hybrid culture is also very important in order to scale successfully. And yep. that's what I would like, a tip that I would like to add. Yep, and Carlos. Yeah. Uh, so investigate the, the, the culture where you're trying to hire people. Be tr as transparent as you can because yeah. we had uh, projects who failed, uh, we missed our deadlines. 
but in this case, you need to uh, keep each and every stakeholder on the same page, so be as transparent as you can. Uh, and as Rita mentioned as well, uh, we are sometimes talking about recruitment as, you know, finalized fraud. Mm -hmm. It's not. Yep. The job, the, the work basically just begins and need to uh, figure out how to engage those people, how to keep them motivated, how to keep them aligned with the company values, how to, uh, you know, connect them with other teams, other hobbies and so on and so forth, how to make them feel at home. So, yeah, these are good tips, but keep in mind that the, the work just begins. Okay, guys. So I think that's a wrap. Uh, the minutes are over. So that's it then. Uh, thanks for the stage, guys. Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really love the fact that, and the note that hiring at scale is the balancing act. And it's so true. When you grow that fast, it's really important to find the ways how you can keep the transparent communication and trust of your employees. So uh, I'm pretty sure we all gain quite some great insightful tips. How can we hire internationally and transform our organizations? And now we're moving into a different part of the day, a fireside chat, the first one of the day, and with a very intriguing name, farmers and investors, how to advertise effectively. So what's going to happen right now? We're going to dive into the story on how the FinTech company of the year found an opportunity in an unusual market and how they use advertising to grow their business and reach two very distinct audiences. So for everyone who is scouting right now different opportunities and ideas, I think that's a very great fireside chat to listen. So I would like to welcome on stage Darius Versetskas, co-founder and CMO at Heavy Finance. Welcome. And our moderator, Justinas Yojinis. Natalie Lithuania at HTT Pool. Enjoy, guys. Uh, not feeling too down. I hope this uh, chat will um, lift the spirits and should be quite interesting. <laughs> Hello, that is. Hi. Hi, all. So, Happy to be here. So, um, first question. Let's, let's give people some background. So, tell us about heavy finance. What is it? What do you do? And kind of a, how did you start the whole uh, idea? Yeah, so basically we enable you all to help farmers to move to more sustainable ways of agriculture. Uh, you can simply invest in loans. It's pretty much like e-commerce. You go to the website, you choose the loan that you want you to invest in, and you put your 100 or more into agricultural loan, and you're getting profit of average 11.8 at the moment. So yeah, that's the that's drill. There's five countries that we are issuing loans and anybody from anywhere in the world can invest. Nice. So, you know, you, you're working with two very different audiences. Oh, you know? yeah. Because <laughs> basically you have to bring these two people together. So um, how do you go about it? How, how do you bring and reach both farmers and, and kind of uh, investors? Yeah, so I suppose that farmer side is uh, a little bit more unknown and uh, exciting to... So we often imagine farmer as some kind of a very old school person. Honestly, uh, if you want to reach a farmer, you just need Facebook ads because they're sitting in their tractors and they're scrolling Facebook. That's, that's the profile. And it's not just the young farmers, it's also people in their 60s. They're just like us. It's just we don't have tractors, we're not that rich. Nice. <laughs> and then how about the investors? A bit easier? Um, yeah, with investors, uh, I suppose, well, with farmers, we are giving the money, so yeah. it's a little bit easier. With investors, we have to take it, so it's more about reputation building, about uh, closer relations. Affiliate marketing works quite well for us. Uh, it's, it's not much of a display advertising as it is actually a little bit uh, digging deeper into explaining them the product and then helping them understand why they should invest in agriculture and they're explaining them that it's it's a very stable sector uh, that does not uh, get the effect of, of general market fluctuations so it's different but uh, we're actually with both uh, sides we're heavily dependent on, on performance marketing yeah yeah i was about to ask like how much do you go into performance and how much do you go into brand marketing 
Is it like all eggs in one basket? Do you deviate between the two? How does it work for you? Yeah, so generally for us, Facebook and Google uh, takes basically almost all the budget. Uh, we do not uh, yet believe much in awareness uh, and all, all, all the soft uh, powers of marketing for purely driving conversions. Uh, if, if we need investors, we're optimizing everything on getting the registration of investor. If we need farmers, we're optimizing on getting the lead of the farmer who wants a loan. Uh, I suppose that's, that's the beauty of the early stage. You, you don't invest that much in, in soft marketing as you invest in conversions and you track everything that you can track because you know that your budget is quite limited and you just have to nail it. So tracking probably was the, and still is the most important part of the marketing. But what, what are the key metrics that you track? Like what's the most important thing for you when you kind of look at the daily, I don't know, daily run rates, what would you, you have like as a kind of a daily metric? Yeah, so the most important is definitely uh, registrations for mm -hmm. investors, how much of them registered and converted to later stages because we have all the requirements of uh, know your customer law, uh, IML, and et cetera. So how much uh, people get through the tunnel, what's the price of person to get through step of the tunnel, and, and for farmers, it's basically how, how many of them left the inquiry and how many of them are farmers. Because what's surprising when people are getting desperate about uh, their life and, and they really need a low one, doesn't matter how many tractors will you put on your website and how many tractors will you put on the ad, somebody will still fill the form writing that they need 200 for television set. <laughs> it's just <laughs> life. Right. But you still get a lot of requests for, for tractors. Yeah, so. yeah, still, still a lot for tractors, but some of them want, I don't know, camera or whatever. Uh, it's just, they, they need it, they think if they can uh, lend money for a tractor, why wouldn't they for a, lend for a camera? Course. happens. <laughs> of course. I remember you mentioned one campaign that kind of uh, slightly backfired for you and was completely misunderstood by, by the audience. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, we uh, sometimes are trying some ironic messages. Uh, so one of them was uh, loan doesn't cost a cow or, or for Lithuanian audience nakarva <laughs> kainuoja uh, and we basically we wrote quite a bit that it's specialized loans for farmers, there's a cow in the visual, and the audience just didn't get it. They, they, they didn't get the saying, and then we got lots of consumer loans. We bought lead for like one euro 30, uh, instantly like 300 leads, uh, all of them have nothing to do with farming. So yeah, that happens in, in Bulgaria. We tried uh, getting a low one is a beans job, which is a popular saying there. And it also brought very strange traffic. So what I understood that both with visuals and with messages on performance part, you have to be very straightforward. Irony and, and interesting sayings though, do not necessarily perform that well. Just go straight to the point. This is what we get give you and you know, this is what you can get and that's it. Yep. And yeah. you know, we always want to be catchy. We always want to say something smart and insightful. But yeah, sometimes the, the message gets lost. And actually, especially now when uh, lots of campaigns are going on, on broad and we're not segmenting that much, being just up to the point is crucial. But how often do you, for example, change the creatives? Um, do you do that routinely or do you have just like one messaging that really sticks for you and you can just have it as an always on campaign? Uh, we tried both. Uh, I remember probably our longest running campaign was we believe in Lithuanian farmers, Portuguese farmers, and that really stick to them. But after some time you, you see that the, the effect wears off and uh, basically if there's no significant success uh, and, and we see that results are slowly getting down, we're changing every couple of weeks uh, ju just to get, uh, get more leads and well, that, that really works. A uh, person sees new visual, new messaging and, and that 
attracts that person to, to make an action that we need to, him to make. Nice. Um, talking about, you know, previous years, uh, we had the whole iOS 14.5, you know, change. How was that for you? Did it affect you or were you prepared? How did it work? Did it give you any restrictions or anything like that? Yeah, I suppose for us uh, there were quite a bit of changes because first of all as a financial institution we, we got some restrictions on segmenting, uh, then IOS and honestly I'd say that it didn't affect us as much. Uh, maybe our user base uh, is also less of IOS users but I suppose we have just all, all of them. Uh, it's not, we don't, uh, we are not that much focused on iOS uh, ecosystem, but there are some, and I wouldn't say that we are affected uh, very much by that. Uh, I suppose that remarketing becomes a little bit more complicated due to tracking, uh, but still remarketing is very much relevant for us and it, it still works. So I, I wouldn't say that that was a major change. Mm. I would probably more hope uh, Google Performance Max to be a bit of a bigger change because it is quite, quite a significant technological improvement mm. that is still ongoing. Yeah. So when we're talking then top of the funnel, do you just go then for, for kind of a broader audiences? Does that work or, or how yeah, do you yeah, approach it? Yeah, it's absolutely broad audience. Mm. It's, just and then, then you have to be actually very precise with your offer, and and you have to tell in your creative part and in the copy what is your audience and, and describe it pretty much. Because if you're going broad, then it, it heavily depends how yeah. first people will behave. Yeah. And also, we we do train the algorithm, so we push back uh, the data about uh, leads we're getting. So we're saying this, this was not a a potential client for us, but this was a potential client. And this was even better client for us. So by pushing data back to Facebook and Google, uh, you can actually train the algorithm very, very well. Uh, it requires quite a bit of effort uh, from, from marketing technical setup, from IT, but once you're done with it, it's amazing. Did it take you long to get there to kind of a where, where the algorithm is really working for you and then you can kind of a just let it go and then fetch leads? Uh, we had various experiences. For example, in Lithuania, first months were very easy. I made the banner myself, which was pretty awful, and it still performed well. In Latvia, it didn't at all. Uh, in Bulgaria, it was lots of clients that uh, were not uh, potentially our clients. In, in Portugal, we're running the very, very same ad with the broad targeting for one year and a half now. And we're not touching it. The price is too good to be true, therefore we're not doing anything. Sometimes we're getting a bit too many leads and we cannot handle that, but we're thinking we're getting it so cheap that, well, if, if we touch it, maybe something will happen because it doesn't happen often in your life that something is too good to be true. So if it happens, you just want to keep it this way. Just just go bring me leads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got it. Um, what would be kind of a biggest, you know, kind of a lessons that you've learned throughout kind of a, all your work as a, kind of a CMO? Any big do's and don'ts when it comes to, to performance marketing? Um, first of all, I suppose, especially a little bit older crowd in marketing, at least from my experience, trust their guts quite a bit. I do not trust it. Uh, always invest in tracking. Understand it extremely well, especially if, if you're running everything on digital. And if I can reach all the European farmers on digital, then it just means that everyone is reachable on, on Facebook and Google. So you just measure it precisely, and if the campaign is not running well, don't have hopes, Kill it immediately. Nice. Um, is it difficult for you, you know, because you have to look at both audiences, is it easy or difficult, you know, to, to maintain equal growth? Because you have to have like a, a certain ratio, right, of, of farmers and investors coming into the platform. Difficult to maintain? I would imagine um, it is. <laughs> we, we've been running the company for two years and it's still, it's not just difficult, it's nearly impossible. You always have too much or too little of, of something. 
Just, it's, well, it takes time. I suppose after two more years, I will say that, yeah, actually, we, we're getting pretty stable supply and demand. But first period, lots of unexpected things can happen. And you see that these mums are very active for farmers. But, for example, on the investor side, they have to declare their taxes and have lots of stuff to do. And they're just not investing. So it's, it's a constant thing. You always have to, if, if you solve all the problems on one side, then you have lots of problems on another. And you just keep going and going and going. Yep. <laughs> nice. Do you have a specific um, strategy for entering new markets? Um, is there a specific way? Do you start, I don't know, maybe with one audience or both audiences? Is there a specific way how you tackle that? Honestly, we, we do things on exploring new markets, simple, stupid. Uh, you hire two or three salespeople because, well, for us, localizing is very important. Mm. And then you just start driving traffic very often with the same visuals as we have in all the countries uh, because, well, just it's the same sector. We, we see that it, it works. So very often visuals are pretty much the same, sometimes adopting a bit. But generally even the same message because what, what you need is to learn if all the research that you made makes sense. Yeah. So it doesn't, uh, you don't need to learn that uh, the lowest uh, amount for lead uh, is let's say 10 euro. You're very much okay buying it for 30 if needed because what you need is to find five clients. Mm -hmm. So basically you just agree, okay, let's spend 5K and get five clients, mm -hmm. sounds good. Then you go for optimizing, but first of all, you just need to understand if there is a market or not. Mm. But what's then, you know, what's a good ROAS for you? Do, do you have like a, a floor that, you know, is bare minimum for you? Um, what's the highest you've been? Yeah, so last May was the most successful month for marketing. Uh, one euro spent brought 11 more. So that, that, that was quite... Yeah, we were pretty happy. <laughs> I can imagine. But, but usually we're trying to, if we spend one euro, at least two euros should, should get back. Mm. So yeah, mostly it works. Uh, we're not spending too much on testing. Uh, I mean, we're testing a lot, but with pretty small budgets. Mm. Uh, and, and then still like 90% of the budget goes where we already understand things. Uh, if nothing very unexpected happens, bringing two euros back sounds good. Mm. <laughs> nice. Um, you mentioned localization, that you need to kind of localize very specifically for the markets. How do you go about that? And, you know, especially with, with you know, multiple assets across, you know, digital areas, you know, website, Facebook pages, and so on. Is that how, how do you go, uh, go about it? Yeah, there is so much space to get lost, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, but actually, uh, I'm not a big fan of, of uh, translation offices. So, since we have localized teams, uh, I'm just asking people who are not necessarily the best in their language, but they definitely know the language that our customer speaks. So, I'm asking them to adopt the message. It ne does not necessarily have to be the same, mm -hmm. but but yeah, then they're uh, doing. Uh, the messaging in the way they understand according to uh, my general framework and so far it, it has been pretty well though yeah sometimes on, on the website you see that conversion doesn't happen that click-through rate is high but you see that people do, do not get to filling the form then you start exploring maybe some things that mm. you thought that makes sense uh, in English or in Lithuanian does it make sense in Portuguese and yeah. then you're looking for ways how, how to change it or just try to meet more Portuguese people to ask them what they think about it. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily <laughs> translate in the other country. Yep, yep. Got it. Um, we do have one question from the audience. Um, so Anonymous, hello Anonymous, <laughs> is asking, um, you mentioned that you were able to reach a lot of farmers. There is still a portion that you were not able to reach. Um, what other channel would you use to do so? Yeah, I suppose that there are quite a bit of farmers that we do not reach through Google, Facebook, uh, and generally digital channels. Uh, but the, there is a problem why I don't want to reach them at the moment. Uh, they are a tough crowd. Uh, 
we're an online business where we do not have much of the human interaction or no human interaction at all when dishing the loan to the farmer because they have uh, mobile signatures, we're signing the contracts, we're meeting at the notary office if needed. So if we go to regional press, let's say, we, we would get lots of calls, but then it creates quite a bit of friction points for operations. So as long as we can grow through digital channels to tech savvy uh, farmers, we're just doing that. We love them. You don't know how amazing and innovative some of our farmers are. Right. Um, TikTok? Uh, not yet. <laughs> but but yeah, I'm maybe. thinking of it. From time to time, I'm thinking about testing it. <laughs> I would imagine you know, if farmers are sitting in Facebook, they might as well sit in, in TikTok while they're you know, going across the field. Yeah, it, it perfectly could be. Nice. All right. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, have a good rest of the day. Thanks a lot. It was nice to be in front of you. I hope you learned something about farming and marketing. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. So the only constant is the change. And instead of trying to go over the roof with your creatives and messaging, sometimes I guess the best way to go is being direct and local, to speak your customer's language. That's a very great learning and very great chat. So without any further, we're diving into another fireside chat, which is going to be about the funding and growing your startup. What's happening right now with the ecosystem? Everyone who wants to create a startup, become a founder, see the only way to grow is raising the funds from a venture capital. That's also something we heard in the previous chats. But right now, what we're gonna do, we're gonna dive into the bootstrapping world. And how can we actually raise, how can we actually grow without a venture capital or outside investment? And what are the challenges? Maybe some kind of tips and tricks along the way. So bootstrapping your startup, challenges and lessons learned. Let's greet Mendogas Mikalayunas, CEO of SME Finance. Hello. And a moderator, Sandra Goldbrick, founding partner at Baltic Soundbox. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're going to talk about bootstrapping. I mean, as an investor, I always say that there is this, this internal uh, battle between like the startups that are raising money and the startups that are not raising money. But what I should say, I have like a huge amount of respect for those startups that are actually bootstrapping. So uh, why did you, I mean, why the decision to bootstrap a startup? Why, not, why didn't you go like typical venture capital way for the FinTech? At the beginning, we were quite local basically to, to raise some VC fund, uh, external capital from VC, you, sh you should go big. <laughs> At the beginning, we wanted to be a, a little bit uh, slowly down, a little bit step by step going to the market uh, because it was quite new market. We started with invoice financing product, meaning that was very niche, local and very expensive, 24% yearly. So it, it was very costly. That's why, you know, you should, uh, you know, focus on the product development at the beginning, uh, find the market fit, and then you can raise more capital. But when we started, you know, in 2016, uh, uh, in July, after two weeks, we already had first client. And after two months, we already were profitable. So we see that there is market fit. The end user pays this 24% at that time. And uh, we have the spread, and the spread was quite impressive at that time, so there is a space to invest. That's why we actually, why we want, we didn't want to sell part of the equity for external partners, because we, we have all money since the beginning. So, uh, after, you know, uh, when you want to go big, uh, to be more like uh, Baltic-based, uh, Pan-European-based, or European champion. So then you, of course, uh, without external funding, without VC funding, you can't reach that type of level. So, but at that stage, it was good, good decision. It was good decision. Okay, so you started uh, bootstrapping and so on. Uh, comparing to the startups who raised some venture capital, what were ma main challenges? 
uh, at the beginning was you know to follow always follow the budget if you have the money you can invest if you don't you can't invest you can't hire more people you can't uh, invest into development so but of, of course at the beginning we are uh, like we were we were focusing on, on revenues if you earn revenues if to reach the level of profitability if you keep the level of the expenses as you expected then you boost everything but you are you you were like more agile based on monthly basis you ad, you always adjust your revenues you adjust your expenses and if you, it's according to our plan you can uh, uh, speed up everything. If not, you slow down. Uh, let's let's uh, let's do like small example. You know, uh, if you see the opportunity to reach uh, break-even point during 12 months, we invest directly. If not, we are like estimating once again this action plan. <laughs> okay. Uh, were there any like uh, uh, good consequences? Are definitely that you are like big and growing and successful company. Uh, what were some bad consequences of this decision, if there were any? Uh, let's some think. missed opportunities, probably. Maybe, maybe uh, you know we were like pushing a lot of our team, focusing on KPIs, goals, a lot of tasks. So not all uh, not all people are ready to do that because. Uh, I do CrossFit, so you should uh, swim, uh, run, everything, everything. You should do everything. So in the startup who is bootstrapping, you know, you you should uh, prepare for everything as well. But not all people are ready to do all all this stuff. So you should find not only market fit on your product, but uh, fit with the people as well. And uh, uh, during these six years, we we lost quite a lot of people because of this bootstrap business approach because this was unusual you should work harder you should work smarter you should work more hours <laughs> logically to to make uh, to reach this uh, level or kpis or milestones internally yeah you work in the startup right yeah uh, and then uh, the next question about bootstrapping so uh, well, for example, the startup is coming up to you and asking you, okay, but how can I bootstrap if uh, I don't have money to develop my product? What shall I do? Uh, how, how, how did you start mm -hmm. it? Uh, where did you find get the, the initial money from? Good opportunity for us was like this because we were profitable. Actually, as I mentioned previously, uh, we, we, we want uh, our decision based on profit and revenues. If you earn some money, you can invest. But if you don't, you have opportunity to, to, to earn this money, then you should be like only smarter and more hard worker, <laughs> I think, in that way. It's typical. You know, more hours, more manpower hours you should spend on task to accomplish it. So... But at what point, so then, from your point of view, it does make sense to start raising venture capital? Uh, when you see the opportunity, uh, go bigger than you have than you're bootstrapping. So at, at that stage, what we are quite big, we, we are reaching level of 40 million euros. On monthly level, we are reaching around 2 million euros revenues. So if we want to build pan, pan European, you know, uh, unicorn or similar, uh, so w then we should invest more. Meaning that it's not, you know, uh, 1 million euros investment. We are talking about 10, 20, 50, 30 million euros investment to build something big. Uh, and that, in that situation, you can't, you can't earn that type of level of uh, profit. That's why you need external capital okay. to bootstrap. Not only for the bootstrap, but for to, to speed up everything. And what would be the rules for the team uh, that want to just start their startup and bootstrap and go to come to some level of success? Typically, uh, I was like figures focused, so always follow the budget. Okay. It's uh, actually it's one of the main reason uh, you should have diversification in all kind of activities. Diversify your funding sources. Diversify, diversify your, your suppliers. Diversify your team. You know, uh, diversify your revenue streams, your um, uh, countries. You know, so not not focusing only one thing. You know, so diversification, I think, is the king.
to bootstrap, uh, more power, uh, more extra hours. I think it's it's very important. Extra mile from the team, focusing on tasks, on key tasks, not to do everything. You should do what, what is the most important at that time, not for just doing tasks. I think, of course, you should have the trust from the main stakeholders. Who is the main stakeholder? Identify that. For us, it was the client and uh, that investor. So we are working for, for these uh, stakeholders very intensively. Okay, and at some point you will become an investor yourself, right? Like you Maybe. Probably <laughs> already, or as a company, you'll start investing in startups. So would you be also looking for the startups that are bootstrapping, or would you be investing in the early stage? Um, actually, we are thinking about uh, open this line at the moment, uh, but we will see, you know. Uh, when we will have more money, when we raise more money on uh, on VC side, I think it will be part of the our strategy to, to find good partners in terms of m and it's like part of the m and market, and I think it will be the topic. But at the moment, we are focusing on our task to build a uh, European champion. It's our core task, so uh, other opportunities, it's like side jobs. It's not our core <laughs> at the moment. Okay, and uh, if you have some, you know, uh, Series A, Series B stage investors in the fund, what's your traction? Just out of curiosity, where are you now in terms of customers, countries? Ah, okay, okay, so we are already in four countries. We're reaching, as I mentioned, level of 14 million euros. I think in the end of the year we will reach, like, we are doubling our revenues, near the 30 million euros. So, um, Evaluation, we think it's around 300 million euros, so it will be quite big. Uh, uh, it should be quite big investor in that type of uh, uh, game. Actually, uh, we are launching like additional three countries: Netherlands, Spain, Germany. So it will be like seven countries already in place. So it's huge market. Uh, now we have 2,000 customers, but on country level, we can doubling this uh, customer base easy. So, you know, during a couple of years, I think we will reach like half a billion euros of valuation and uh, we will see how it goes. Half unicorn. <laughs> half of unicorn, yeah. But First half a second half. <laughs> okay. But it's doable case because we already have like, mo we already more in finance more than 1 billion euros. So it's doable and uh, it's proven model already in four, four countries. Yeah. I do believe it. I mean, and we also need the next unicorn in Lithuania. And coming back to this bootstrapping topic, mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's pretty hard. I mean, there are a lot of companies on the markets and like the other startups and so on. It's pretty hard to find the team. And I guess when you're bootstrapping, your salaries are pretty low. And uh, how did you manage to find those people that helped you to build like up to where you are now? Actually, it's not uh, only Mindugas working on that side. Our owners working very hardly on a bootstrapping business. It's like hands-on approach, not from the top management side. It's from owner side as well. It's one. Uh, second, to hire more people, we are, you know, we are spending our evenings in LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, actually, LinkedIn then top. Uh, Portals, our key key finders of core team. It's not you know headhunters finds uh, for you the core team. You find your your owner finds uh, core team. So we are spending a lot of hours to, to 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 attract the team to convince them work smarter, harder with you. Uh, uh, what are the extra incentives that the startup can own the team members at the early days when they don't have the, like really high salaries? So, actually, we have quite high salaries, so it's one. <laughs> so it's okay. it's one, maybe. But uh, the key decision, you know, to to change uh, solid position and go into our, you know, platform with our core team, actually was ambitious, and what we did in the past. So we bootstrap business uh, without external financing. So the other people who are coming into our you know, core team, they see it. these guys quite smart. They, they're reaching from zero to 300 million euros book. It's hard to do that. How many startups you know in the market who bootstrap such type of level of the startup? So our team is very strong. <laughs> so that's why it's like chicken and uh, egg game. If you have score, 
who is very strong, he attracts automatically more. Yeah, exactly. But now, like, you have six years of experience, all this traction, all this recognition, and it's amazing. But at the very early days, uh, when you wanted to attract some people from the markets, and again, you are a no-name startup, ah, okay. and there are much more, you know, banks, for example, where you can work. Okay, at that, at that stage, at the very early stage, it was, like, maybe more personal touch, and, uh, like, very close background of the people. Actually, when we started everything, our core team, our owners were ex-bankers. So ex-banker understands very well ex-banker. So it was like we are talking the same language. We know SME market is underserved. Uh, all banks are, you know, very conservative. <sighs> okay, it's two touch points already. You are, we are paying quite good salary. It's third touch point. You want to change something in the market? Yes, I want. Okay, it's fourth change touch point. <laughs> so step by step, you build uh, the, these touch points very in very close, uh, you know, circle. Okay, okay, that's interesting. And uh, if you would be like launching the startup now, like today in 2022, with all mm -hmm. this. Uh, things happening around us. Uh, would, you have, would, would you have done something differently, or would you have done the same way, like a bootstrapping and everything? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, of definitely. So, uh, what we will want to make uh, it happens either basically, it was invest more into technology, because when you bootstrap, uh, you should learn to invest into technology. But I wanted to to make like more parallel. So invest uh, at the same time when you are growing. So we did a little bit different way. At the beginning we earn, and later stages we invest. So work as you can as parallel these very important topics. Mm -hmm. It's one of the main goal, uh, tasks. Is and second maybe um, find the core team earlier as you can because then you should you will you will one day you will tired. <laughs> So uh, you will be less tired. So core team is the key. Yeah, core team, core team, invest more in technology. Uh, probably fundraise some money from the investors. <laughs> it's maybe not uh, not not this topic. I think uh, at the beginning, yeah, uh, more this topic more important because the core team will find the investors. If you ha uh, had uh, more technology based solutions, the investors will come itself because you, the revenue is growing. We are doubling the revenue, so it's without uh, very, I would say, significant investments into technology even. Mm -hmm. And probably one of the last questions to start wrapping up. Uh, you're a very young fintech company, uh, and people- Not so young, six <laughs> years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, six years ago, you were the youngest probably fintech company. And normally people don't tend to trust young companies with their money. So what did you do to build your customers' trust at the very beginning? Okay, so maybe uh, SME Finance is a fintech who, has an, who is understanding SME market. We are experts of SME market. We are ex-bankers who worked with SME market very more than 10 years. So our core team uh, is building the trust uh, uh, in investors for the investors. So I think uh, the team convinced to invest, basically. Yeah, but it's we should mention probably that the investors are your customers for like investing through a platform. Uh, uh, yeah. Because like, I think probably not all of the audience yet know what you're doing, but mm -hmm. after this they'll definitely know it. Uh, so basically you mean that uh, the founders were just calling potential customers and, and convincing them because they know them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, actually, as I mentioned, I attract the first client. I was call, cold calling. I was uh, talking with them, convinced them. I talking with investors. I talk, was talking with uh, customers. I was lawyer. So <laughs> I, I did I did everything, actually. So, but when you understand the market need, there is market need already in the market. So uh, you you should find the angle of selling this product. Okay. And uh, probably the last question, as we have to wrap up, what would be your advice for the future founders who are sitting here and watching you and thinking, okay, maybe I'm going to be there in six years as well. So, your advice. Okay, so don't afraid, guys, to, to take the challenge, change something in the market what, where you don't have 
deep expertise even. If you have deep expertise, it will be much, much easier to do everything. If you don't, but try, still, it's uh, it's doable case if you will be focused, if you will have uh, like more, how to say, smarter decisions on that uh, bootstrap business. And uh, think about, think global and think about your end user. There is market fit, uh, they buying your services or you should, should uh, uh, adopt it and uh, go uh, think about go global as well, okay. I think. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, that was amazing. Thank you. I guess you have any think about your user, right? Thank you. And then you had a success story right here on this stage. And right now we're diving into the fireside chat about the founders, their boards, and investors. So once you raise an investment, what happens next? What do you do after it? You have this all investors board, but how to get the most out of it and what to look for when you are selecting a VC? And what does founder friendly mean? I would like to invite on stage Eric Lashi, managing partner at By Founders. Where is Eric? Hello, Eric. And also a moderator, Mike Butcher, editor at large for TechCrunch, to have this great conversation. Have fun, guys. Testing. Ooh, it's Ooh. Cool. the mic is on. Yes. The mic is here and the mic is on. Hi, everybody. Who's heard of TechCrunch? Yes, of course you have. Um, Mike Butcher from London. Hope you're having a great time here at Startup Fair. I haven't been back to Lithuania for 10 years. That is terrible, isn't it? So, I'm, but I am pleasantly Things have surprised. Changed. Huh? Things have changed. It's, it's terrible here, really. Don't come. <laughs> Horrible country. Boring city. Everyone's rude. I'm joking. British humor. Okay, right. Let's get into this. Um, so before we start, but everyone, first of all, I want you to, uh, if you're going to the party tonight, if you see me, you've got 10 seconds to pitch me and then you have to buy me a gin and tonic, okay? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I'm kidding around. That can only go wrong. I'm only joking. Um, so, um, Eric Lachey, great to see you. Likewise. You heard a lot about Buy Founders. Um, it's quite interesting fund. Um, you were originally part of the early team at Skype. You were at Trade Shift. That's quite an interesting, interesting one because Trade Shift's been through uh, some interesting times in the last few uh, years. Uh, you, you did Memo Lane, which you sold to HP. You spent eight years in Silicon Valley, so you're an original gangster. How about that? <laughs> He's an actual founder who's now a VC, which is nice, especially in Europe when so many um, uh, wankers, sorry, bankers. Um, <laughs> sorry, just cut that bit, cut that bit. Um, uh, uh, are uh, VCs from ba banking. Um, so um, it's great to have a founder who's an actual uh, uh, VC now. Um, and, but what I want to know is, what is by founders, you know, what do you, what, how do you kind of like pre present it? Yeah, thanks. I think you coined it uh, very well. So I'm part of a generation of Skype and trade shifts and Sendesk Unity and many other uh, now unicorns that made it fantastic. But if you go out and ask these founders if there's like a common denominator, it was really against all odds. Um, we all were struggling to raise capital. There was very little capital available here in the Nordics and there was never anyone that tried it before. So we were like just continuously making a ton of mistakes because we didn't know better. And what we wanted to do here fast forward uh, was to create a four founders by founders fund, hence the name, of really paying it forward to the next generation of, of ambitious founders in the new Nordics to really not only come with capital, but also bring this arsenal of founders that's all tried it before to help uh, with operational guidance. So we have now 75 of some of the most accomplished uh, founders all invested in our fund, including Tom uh, 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 from here from Lithuania, that's part of that. And uh, yeah. 
And I noticed that I was looking at uh, by founders, and I was looking at the website, and it said something about the new Nordics. <laughs> now I think I know what the Nordics are, but what are the new new Nordics? New so, new? so from the get-go, and also back, back from my experience with Skype, with working very closely with a great team in, in Estonia and 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 uh, Nicholas from Sweden and. Janus from Denmark, it's like, what we recognize is that we believe the Baltics is so much more associated, closer associated with us, and hence we actually coined it the new Nordics, as we we've really feel welcome and we feel there's a lot of uh, things we can do where we can make magic together. I, I, I tend to agree. I would also characterize it as us and Russia, and that's it. <laughs> and uh, everyone else, and then Russia. Bye-bye. <laughs> Um, yeah, fuck you, Russian warship. Right. Um, and uh, relationship between inv founders and investors. So um, I think what we need to do is let's do a little bit of stuff about like when you deal with founders. Right? So and let's try and keep it real because I think that everybody has to go through this process. And I think you know, we've all heard the terms. It's like a marriage. Um, and then you get divorced, or you, you know, you have great kids. Um, it, you, you know, what, what's the, what, how do you characterize it? Because, I mean, what, for instance, when, when an entrepreneur says to you, um, you know, when somebody asks you advice and then you're not going to invest in them, uh, what do you say? What, you know, when they say, what should I look for in a VC? Mm -hmm. um, what do you say? Yeah, so I, I think it's. There's definitely been a transition or a, a, a change. As you said, there was a lot of bankers in the past. And, uh, and now I think we've seen much more a level head of more and more founders and operators that become involved in VCs. Hence, they can provide much more advice and so on. I think at the core, when you're looking for an investor, you want to make sure that they have conviction, that they really are, are, are resonating one-to-one -one on the vision and ambition that you have, that you have that. Uh, secondly, is like that they have the competencies. Like, are they really competent about what they're talking about? You would hate to see that somebody you decide to partner with for the next 10 years actually has very little insight to what you do. We often turn down what we, you could say were great investments, but where we just simply say, we don't know how we can help. We, don't, we are not the one that would be the best to carry you through this and hence, we step out of that, right? Mm. Uh, then so you, are you saying that you, you, you want to make a commitment? If you make a commitment, you really are, you're in it for, you know, you, you're really going to go deep because... Like crazy deep, yeah, and which yeah. is also just a, a little bit of, like, when we, as by founders, uh, we invest, we have published our term sheet on, on, on a website uh, to be fully transparent. Mm. But in one of them, we show we invest in common shares, not we don't take liquidation preferences. What does that mean? That means that we invest alongside the founders at the same risk level. We go all in. Either we go up yeah. or we fucking fail together. There's not right. this middle ground that, oh, now we want to take our money back and you are like, whatever. Yeah. So this is really a... So a common thing. shares. And is that, I mean, I think I've heard that a few times in, in London and amongst some investors. Do you think that's becoming a more pre preferent, preferent, preference or a, a more of a wave of, of amongst investors? Uh, or is it, or is, is it still quite a minor part of the market? We, we, we see that in the early stage, it's starting to, to go through. We see a later stage, there's still the old school bankers that want their liquidation preferences. And then we also see that during the current situation, what's happening now is that more investors are becoming you know, more risk averse and they are starting to uh, impose liquidation preferences uh, in the term sheets again, which they yeah. have been a little bit more. I want to, I want to talk about that subject yeah. later. Yes. But what, it, it, uh, uh, once, okay, you've done. You've got the investment. You're doing. The, you've done the deal. Now, what you do? You know, what? It, how do you get the? How does an entrepreneur get the best out of their investors? What sort of questions should they ask them? So, I actually, I think it's one of the things when you meet with 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 the investors. Exactly. Be careful that it's not just you talking. Ask the yeah. investors questions. Like interrogate them. Like really is saying, why do you think this is interesting for you? Like, what are the things we could learn? From our side, one of the things we, we use uh, that we have coined the ugly slide. So when we look at investing in founders, we're looking for passion, we're looking for love, and we're looking for the ugly slide. 
So what is that? We're looking for founders with passion. We're looking for products that people love. And then we're looking for the ugly slide. We ask people, so what is it that keeps uh, founders up at night? How can we help? Because all the nice talk about pitches, 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 and so on, it's mm. just sales, selling yeah. a used car. When it really comes to the core of it, what is it that keeps you up at night? That's where we listen and hear how we can help. Again, coming back to, do we, can we get conviction and can we see how we can help? Often we have founders that are saying, I'm all good. It's going great. We don't have competition. We don't have anything, whatever. And for sure, if there's two things that we uh, look at, like if a founder is either lying or he's ignorant about his own business, we would never invest. Right. So that's why we asked for the ugly slide. There's no startup without a board. Um, yes. And um, what's the best way of thinking about a board? Is it kind of like air traffic control? Is it is it there to kind of give you advice on how to run the business? Yeah. Um, so, you know, and you know, what sort of things should you look for? Things like diversity. What are the, some of your thoughts? Yeah, exactly. I think um, for us, we very make very clear to any founder that we invest in that we sit to serve. We say it very clearly. We sit on the board as long as you feel that we add value. The one day do you feel that we are wasting your time in a board meeting, in anything of activity that we are providing, just let us know and we'll step out. Then we have really not fulfilled what we wanted to do. So we sit there to serve and we are not there to control. Like it is not for you to, to come and try to impress us in a board meeting, no. It is for you to be 100% transparent about what's going on and what is the need you have. We often see founders, they, they waste their own and our time by coming to the meeting, uh, maybe unprepared, but at least saying, okay, we spent two hours going through all the numbers. That's not what we are all about. What you do is three, four days ahead of the board meeting, you send the presentation with the numbers and you say, dear investor, if you have any questions to the numbers, I'm happy to address that in the meeting. Otherwise, what I would like to use the board meeting for is these two or three strategic yeah. questions that I really would like to have a detailed, thorough conversation about what we should do. Yeah. And that brings so much more value out, right? And then coming back to the composition of the board, you Don't know, be in a board meeting sitting there looking at numbers. It's like, no, Bad it's idea. such a waste of time. And it's such a waste of time of having somebody that have like prepared slides and then go slide by slide and talks about them. We can read. We can read. And, and we would be happy to, you know, address if there are things that where we see red flags, we don't need a narrative around it. Mm. So, so just like figuring out how you spend the most time. Yeah. But again... On your board, you know, one thing is really make sure if you have the opportunity to choose, find investors that you feel could add value to you and know this space can help you with connections, opening up, and ev eventually also have capital, of course. But uh, what we often do at By Founders, given the way we are structured, yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we go back, sorry, we go back and say to the founders, I don't need to sit on the board because I believe somebody else in our group of founders that's involved in our group will be much better fit. So for example, if anybody knows Vivino, the app Vivino, so we invested in a dating app on Iceland called Smitten and they really need to figure out app engagement. So we asked Heine, who's the co-founder of Vivino, if he could sit on the board instead of me and then you know, they had a conversation, magic happened, and that's how we do it. Right. And, and we have many examples of that. And also, I think, you, I think you probably agree that you can increase the diversity of your board by saying some, I, some board members are, are allowed to be remote, right? So, yes. you know, the, you'll, you'll increase more gender, diversity, ethnicity. Absolutely. So, I, yeah. I think the COVID have had many crazy yeah. things, but the good thing is that we realize there is a remote first uh, environment and where you have an opportunity now, you don't need to have your board sitting here in Vilnius. You can have your board sitting anywhere where you can handpick the best board members. And you should also look at, like when you're looking at angels, go out, find the best uh, angel investors 
anywhere in the world, but board members for particular as well, and then bring them on as well, and then look for diversity. Don't create the bro culture. It's, it's yeah. like, if it starts at the board level, guess what? It's also at the executive level, and it's in the whole uh, organization, and it's just toxic. So really find ways to create inclusion and diversity. That's a really, that's really good advice. Um, okay, right, okay, breaking news, we're all fucked. Um, there's going to be a recession, uh, there's, uh, there's going to be a downturn, and LPs are withdrawing funds from uh, the VCs. Um, uh, uh, startup valuations are plummeting. What do we do now? What's going to happen next? Do you know? <laughs> if uh, I knew, I wouldn't be here. Uh, no, I think, I think it's, to some extent, it's a good reset that we are seeing right now because, for example, 2021 has been super overheated and overheated and, and valuation has just skyrocketed. And I think for those who are just out there now starting their company and, and going out, I think it's, it's all you know, business as usual in the sense of they need to prove what they are building and getting great investors on board. For those who already raised last year, for example, at very high valuations, they will really need to look to preserve capital because right now the valuations have almost halved and, and it will be difficult to then not have a down round, which is nobody wants that, right? So, yeah. overall, down rounds are bad. Yes. Overall, I think Google down rounds. our advice right now to anyone that's running a startup is preserve cash. Like, make sure you can hold water, like your, uh, you can breath underwater for a longer period of time because for the next 18 months at least, it will be a very turbulent space. Yeah. And the VCs, we will be very cautious of how we deploy capital because eventually we will also need to have to raise capital and our LPs will also be very cautious of how they deploy capital. Um, just a quick note, by the way, uh, guys, you can uh, put questions on this Slido thing if you want to do that, uh, but it's, make sure it's a good one, otherwise I won't read it out. Um, but what else is going on? Uh, so LPs withdrawing, I mean, but you know, kind of, let's face it, you know, um, the VCs part contributed to the problem by boosting valuations in the last couple of years, <laughs> didn't they? So yes. va valuations kind of went sky high. Um, don't you accept some responsibility for that? I, I think there's definitely been, um, we've seen over the last couple of years, a number of like, it's, I would push the responsibility on the late stage. Uh, hedge funds that have really gone in and, and deployed a lot of capital in the private market, but suddenly as they've seen the public market go down like 30% or more in their balance, they now are overexposed in the private market and they are stopping every activity there. And as they stop there, suddenly a lot of companies that were supposed to do like pre-IPO financing and so on are not getting there. And suddenly the other investors that's been carrying them are knowing that we need to carry them for a longer period of time because there's not the capital available. So they are also saying, hey, we need to make the uh, readjustment of how much we do follow on investments to carry the, the companies we backed. And suddenly they are not doing new investments and hence we need to carry the portfolio companies that we've invested in for a longer period of time. So it trickles down and yes, the valuations have absolutely not helped to an environment now where it's like, like at the perfect storm, everything comes together and, and it will be difficult. Right, so yeah. Lastly, um, what's your impression? Because my impression, I've, I've been to, I went to Tech Chill, I skipped um, Latitude. Latitude 59, um, and now I'm here. And I'm getting kind of a feeling like um, that, you know, the whole of the Baltic, Baltic region is really exploding with talent and startups right now. In particular, I've been pretty impressed with what I've seen here in Lithuania so far. What are your impressions as, as, a, um, as, a, as an investor in, about the Baltics? Like from the get-go when we started by founders and why we set the new Nordic, it was important to include the Baltics yeah. into the geo where we invest because we are just seen, uh, led of course by Estonia, uh, like an uprise, an incredible uprise, like looking at the population, you have three million, and you basically have almost made as many unicorns as, 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 as Denmark and or Estonia that has eight or some says 10 unicorns in a population of 1.2 million. And like France have a, the same amount of unicorns that they are 65 million. I think the benefit that really you have is 
very, very high level of education. People are super smart. You are like basically also saying like this is the way you can prove yourself mm. and hence you're ambitious. And then the third thing is that similar to Denmark where I'm from, we will, you will never be satisfied in serving your local market. Many French, many German, many British founders, they're like comfortable of saying, I made it in the UK, it's yeah. fine. So they don't think out of the box. You are from the get-go thinking, I need to be a global uh, startup, otherwise yeah. I won't succeed. Yeah, I think the secret reason is you're just getting bored of Copenhagen and this is a lot more fun. Yes. Great. Right. Well, thank you very much, Eric Lash from uh, By Founders. My name's Mike Butcher. Uh, and I shall see you on November the 1st at Web, at Web Summit, November the 1st. Come to the Europa's Awards. 600 people are going to have a great party. See you later. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you. And Mike, it's great to have you back 10 years later for the 10 years anniversary of Startup Fair. Absolutely. Welcome back. Cheers. Cheers. So if you have already closed your investment round or about to do that, make sure you make most out of the board and you ask them questions rather than just talking by yourself. And right now we're diving into the employee stock options and key things to know. Have you, everyone heard the stories of startups reaching an IPO and employees cashing in? Stock options became a very attractive employee compensation part of the package, right? And often it might be the main reason why employees would like to join the startup or the scale up. However, they do involve some risks and while European startups has begun slowly embracing this form of compensation, they don't do that with the same kind of confidence and open-mindedness as in the US. So the panel will feature representatives from the VC, law firms, and some of the biggest startup names, names in Lithuania to learn about their experience with employee stock options and advice on how to do it the right way. Let's invite to the stage Giedre Chugadiena, partner and head of corporate at Trinity Urex. Arnas Totalis, CEO of Hostinger. James Ethan, CFO of TransferGo. And the moderator, Odris Milukas, founding partner and CEO at Open Circle Capital. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, the floor is now ours and we want to have a good chat not only between us together here but with your questions too, I have them online. I will not read everything <laughs> if I don't like the question. Okay, so let's start. So today's topics we want to and have to talk about ESOP and uh, I don't know most of here knows about the ESOP or heard about them but let's start from the beginning. Uh, maybe from the James, start from the beginning, and uh, what is the ESOP? So the ESOP is the Employee Stock Option Plan, and I think it's really important to understand that it gives you the right, but not the obligation, to buy shares in a company. And a lot of young founders, when they set it up, they don't set these things up. And we'll talk later about who should get them and what, but it's really critical that you have one. And the VCs may disagree, but 10 to 12% of your equity should be an option plan whether it be for the C team, the founders, or for the other employees. So it's really important that you get this and you top this up every time you fundraise. So employee stock option, yeah? It's, it's an option to have shares for employees, yes? Ernest, well, you are the Lithuanian company here. Do you have an ESOP in your company? Uh, yeah, we, we have an ESOP from 2017. I think we were one of the first companies to introduce it. And uh, the main reason for that, it was not a, a, like necessity at that time because like it, no competition basically and we needed to explain employees what, uh, what does it mean and why we do that. But the main reason is that the great and big things cannot be uh, built, uh, like should be built by the quite big teams. And uh, you need uh, motivation, you need ownership, and uh, at the end of the day, if you have some exit one day, you don't w want to be alone at the party, you know, celebrating uh, lonely. You s somehow imagine that at a certain point uh, there should be a great party where many happy people are out. You know. 
and, uh, and that aligns incentives and, uh, and we are all in one boat. And when we set it up, uh, it like, like there were no legal framework, we just uh, hired uh, lawyers and were thinking about workarounds, how to do it and taxation. So it took quite a, ti uh, quite a lot of time to, to, to find the best way to do it, but uh, we did it and I'm very happy about that. Just more for your experience, uh, did it help? Like people like it, you feel more motivation, uh, like more encouraging motivation to do some more things at night and stuff like that? Uh, definitely, like it's, uh, it, uh, it helped a lot, uh, but we also learned some lessons uh, that what we can do differently. So at that time we were maybe about 30 people and we give it uh, stock options to everybody. We were made quite inclusive and now we updated plan uh, and we didn't give it to everybody because like what we noticed, what we learned that uh, you need to be mature to understand uh, what does it mean and how to, how basically the company valuation grows. Because if you are like pretty young, it's not about an age, but about maturity, you probably don't understand, you know, that certain actions that certain things brings value to the enterprise and to the customers. And without this understanding, they just don't believe that it's real until they get the money, you know. So, so basically, oh, okay, I have something, I have some contract. So you need to really understand what does it mean so that it changes your mind that, you know, you, you feel the ownership and you understand what you can get, on what conditions you can get, where is the company on the journey and so on. Jebra, could you please elaborate? Now you're expert in ESOP and it's often seen now in your everyday routine and the companies that, that come to you to do the ESOP and how do they understand it and how the employees understand it and how company understand it? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Options are really popular for, uh, in the activities of the startups and um, there were differences in the explanations, uh, ex explanation of this term. So uh, what the state tax inspector inspectorate says that um, it is of course uh, a right, not, not an obligation to an acquire option. the yeah. shares, right. And then uh, there are a, certain misunderstandings so whether the company might uh, uh, issue the shares automatically or not uh, for example upon reach of uh, certain uh, kpis you just give the shares it's not acceptable for the tax relief so it's not allowed to do that uh, and then the problem is that uh, this explanation changes from time to time so each time when you uh, either you want to issue a sh uh, share option or want to uh, execute it, you have to check what is the situation at the moment. Okay. So maybe that's that give more money to employees and that's it. Why do you need those options of stocks, you know, to just give more money and etc. cetera, et cetera. But it's like, of course, silly question because when you're a young startup, you don't have such this kind of money. You know. mm -hmm. So how do you deal with James in your company? I think you, you also had this problem. Yeah, we, um, we've had two, in, you know, the first plan was just for senior employees and now we are actually giving stock options to everyone. We're about okay. to roll that out. Um, Is it a secret how much to everyone, like 1%, half percent, like 0.01%? Zero, zero no, we have a calculator, so you put your salary in and it will tell you what you get. So it's yeah, very this is, transparent. This is, the, this is the good moment. So it's not like random, you just go and pick it. I'll give you 25% because I like you. It's, it's not random. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andres. Yeah, yeah, but but really, it's like uh, I, I read like many reports in the Europe, you know, it's, and it's calculator by your salary, by your yearly salary. Yep. You know. yep. Yes. And that's how, that's how we're doing it. So we're about to roll that out for everyone now. Nice. Nice. And the people like it? Like they, yeah, people, people they take it or they say, no, I, I just want bigger salary? No, you have to be really good at, at educating on what it is and what it means and what it should do. And we're hoping is it's going gonna, it's gonna to help with tenure and keeping people with the business because, you know, it vests over time. So you yes. earn the, the number of shares. So hopefully we can increase the length of period people stay with us. I'm going to jump through the earners, but I'm jumping together. Vesting. What is a vesting? Uh, five years ago, I started to read some contracts and I, was, uh, I read vesting. What's a vesting legal term like for young people to understand here? I have shares, I have 10% of shares, but they're all vested. <laughs> What's yeah. wrong with that? 
this term is not in the in the law. Okay. So when you come from the university, you don't understand what is it's vesting. <laughs> <laughs> so. But what uh, is it? Uh, vesting is just um, a step how to uh, become entitled to the shares. So uh, you are vested shares uh, in uh, several periods, and after all these vesting periods pass, only then you execute the option and you acquire all the shares that you have vested through those periods. So uh, vesting is not uh, the same as uh, uh, the option period because you do not really acquire the shares after each vesting period. Okay. Am I clear? <laughs> Uh, I will have questions and will understand. Are we clear? But as I understand, in simple words, it's like um, if you work three years or two years, you deserve those shares. Yes, period by period. Period by period. Okay. Yes. For example, you work for the first year uh, and you have to achieve certain KPIs. Uh, when this year passes, you see whether these KPIs are already achieved or not, and then you go to the next period. Uh, then you also see what is uh, the status, mm -hmm. and then after the third year, you see what was the status, the status is okay. uh, for each vesting period. And I want to ask every one of you, I heard like a thousand times, like we have to give 6% of the company to the ESOP, you have to give <laughs> the 12, you have to give 8. So how, did, how to understand? What part of the shares should be given for the employees, for the main employees, for them to be more motivated? How did you decide to make 12? Well, I, I think it depends on your stage, but I think between 10 and 12 is reasonable. And then when you raise your next round, you've got to remember to top that initial pool up because that pool will become 5 or 2 or 1% very quickly. So, mm -hmm. you know, in essence, we've all taken 10% from California. <laughs> Okay. So that's what Western Europe's done. Arnas? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It depends. Eight, 10, 12. It depends on, uh, on the stage of the business and <laughs> are you planning some uh, investment around so you are growing organically. How big is the business? So uh, if it, you tie it to the salary, so how much employees do you have? Like in general, I think it's, it's uh, there are some rules like common practices, but you also should uh, do some math. And to understand in which stage are you, uh, if, if you young like startup or you're a mature company, you want to do it just for executives. It's, I think it's just you need to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, also, so there is no right number, no right number, like six, uh, three, case four. By case, just case by case, look at I think best practices and then um, adapt it to your situation. Okay. That's it. in your opinion. And also, when so the investors come, they uh, have kind of opinion already formed. Uh, so uh, usual numbers are like 10 to 15 percent uh, that are devoted to the ESO plan. Okay. okay. So, what's the problem with the ESO in Lithuania? But in simple words, do we have good legislation system, or we should change it? Or is, uh, or is it still tax deductible or it's, it's non-tax de deductible? How is it? Legislation is very good, <laughs> um, but I see an, another problem. So if, if I may, I will yes. explain it a bit in more detail what I think. <laughs> because uh, when you look at the chronology, uh, the whole story began in 2017 uh, when we received the uh, Social Security Relief. So in that uh, year, uh, it was said that uh, if you uh, hold the option for three years, you will be uh, social security uh, contributions exempt. Then in 2020, we have uh, one more tax relief, which is uh, personal income tax. And then one year later, in 2021, uh, state tax inspectorate issues its position. And instead of three lines or two lines in the law, we received several pages of explanations how uh, it, sh it should be applied in practice. And then this year, uh, we also see that the individual explanations uh, by the state tax inspectorate uh, are even more uh, strict than, than the official position. So next year is going uh, to be the year when the options will be executed. 
and one more year will be the year for declarations and payment of taxes, so we will see. So what I wanted to say that um, legislation is very good uh, because you are, have tax exemption, but uh, before each um, step you have to check what uh, is in the legislation and position of the state tax inspectorate. So I understand good that we cannot live without lawyers. Every time we have to check everything. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very bad in general. Yeah, it's expensive. Maybe more elaborate <laughs> oh, a little it's bit. It's not a uh, like lawyers should uh, should have some income, so it's not an issue. But the time is uh, what matters. So, for example, uh, we wanted to update our stock options plan, and it took us like seven months, uh, like back and forth, back and forth with lawyers, with uh, like shareholders, and, and when you count, is it worth doing that? Yes, it, it worth, but we could have spent this time on business. So, yeah, so basically it, it, it consumes a lot of time and it's unpredictable and it looks like the legislation is great, but some people in some government offices, they, they think at this legislation and they are brainstorming how, what we can do that in order not to achieve the goal of the legislation, but in order to tax them, you know, and then. So, so it looks like uh, that the yeah. parliament issues a law to make a relief, and then many people are thinking, okay, what, how we can block it, you know, <laughs> from here, from here. And uh, so I think the goal should be in general for the whole uh, government, let's be the best place in Europe for yes. the beginning, you know, uh, for the SM, uh, employee stock option plans. So in this case, you can encourage more investment and so on because it's number one basically ranked. So you, what you need to do to make uh, analysis, like ask investors and like uh, companies, uh, how do you rate this country and this country and the practice and the, let's just be number one. I think it's uh, really achievable. We are not far from that, but just need to everybody to agree on that. Yes, as we discussed yesterday, you know, we have to have this narrative that we're the best place for the startups in Europe, not the last, not the blocking every, every stuff, every good stuff that we do. James, uh, do you have uh, ESOPs on UK company in TransferGo or you have a Lithuanian company? No, we have it on the UK company. On UK company. Uh, and and uh, the UK setup and structure is very good. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if can you elaborate that a little yeah, bit. It's what can we learn? The, the, the rules are very clear. You go to the tax authority and agree a value at each point. So there's limits as well that it's very easy to understand. The legal structure of the schemes are cheap and easy to implement. Um, so there's, on, there's many startups started that run these cap table programs and these EMI schemes yes. for you. So it's really good. So I think, you know, if Lithuania wants to attract talent, I mean, if you tried hiring a product manager, it's impossible right now. Yes. So if you want product managers that come to Lithuania, we need to make the, 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 the schemes easier. And it's very true because I have a few companies in my portfolio in OCC that they also used all the ESOP for the existing employees, but they try to hire people from outside the Lithuania or Baltics in Europe, and without ESOP they are not coming, and they ask about legislation, the sh classes of shares, and the ESOP, so that's stopping everything. Good, and uh, maybe as we have a lot of young people here making new startups from the beginning, uh, some recommendation from every one of you, like what do you recommend on ESOP subject for a startups together? Well, firstly, you have to decide who would you involve in the uh, ESOP because uh, those persons will be entitled to decision making finally. And also they have to understand the value and the impact, how will they affect the, um, the shares that they are going to acquire. So I think that uh, this one is important. Also, uh, what are the terms like cliff, listing and execution? Because uh, tax relief is applicable only if you have uh, the execution term of three years. Also, um, whether you will uh, give uh, the shares only to employees or you will risk a bit and you include uh, freelancers, board members. So these will raise questions uh, from the tax perspective. Well, and the, the remaining uh, issues are business issues. Arnas, recommendations for the ecosystem? Okay, if you, are, do if, from the if you are just starting, I, I, I recommend you not to overthink. 
because it, uh, it's like, it's pretty complicated, so I think it's better to create some MVP to do something, you know, agree and then later put the papers on. Not like too late, when it's too late, but if you just start from paperwork, you won't build anything, I think, in general. But uh, it's the legal things, it matters, but it's not the most important thing in the beginning of the business. And, uh, and as soon as you are able to do it, I think it's worth doing that because uh, for the benefits you can get, uh, like uh, fostering ownership of the employees, uh, aligning uh, long-term thinking about the company. So I think it's a wonderful instrument, uh, but, but it shouldn't be like, okay, we have no idea, but we are drafting with the legal companies, uh, you know, how we, what the contract should be like, and it's probably these contracts are 50 pages or not, so. It takes it's time. Difficult. Even to it read takes it, yeah. time and, yeah. and takes time away from the business making. Right? Yeah, yeah. I recommend just do the business in the beginning and then do the paper afterwards. James, I'd say just make sure you have the ten percent at the beginning. You can figure the plan out later. <laughs> but if your if your investor doesn't agree at the beginning, he's not going to want to do it later on, especially if you build a lot of value. So to have the shares available, and as Anna said, just f figure the plan out later. Uh, my laptop is down and we have to think about questions from the audience. I have a new one. Very good. Look how great it is. Uh, guys, uh, from the VC fund perspective, I would say don't let somebody to have like corporate on your cap table because it's a red flag for the investor. If you have a corporate and a company like 60% and the VC says that the founder will not give his effort for the company, so the VCs will not invest. This is the recommendation would I give you. I had a lot of uh, stoppers of this, red flags. So this is my recommendation. And, and, and let me see from the question. Okay. What is the best time to give ESOF before raising round or after closing the round? Anyone wants to jump on that? Uh, I think James more, you know, has more rounds here. <laughs> Many rounds. Uh, I, I think you do it. Do it as get the shares and the top up as part of the round. I don't think you know. There's no point burning through because you're gonna you're gonna negotiate to top it up anyway. So for me, it doesn't really matter. You just need to make sure in your in your you know your your investor is okay that he's topping up the round the pool. And maybe it's easier to give options before the round uh, because uh, you don't have to negotiate with the investor. But on the other side, uh, the investor might not invest. If, uh, if they do not really like the, those options. If, if to give my advice from my experience, uh, when we do a round or a round, uh, we like ESOP to be established and we can do it together with the founders. So it's a, it's a good way to do it, if I answer the question. How to avoid stock dilution in the future if you're a pretty small shareholder from the beginning? Uh, it's, be you cannot. <laughs> Make money from the day one. Uh, take a bigger salary. What about phantom shares options in Lithuania? Gedra, I think this is maybe for you. The phantom shares, uh, I like those. Is it possible from legal tax perspective? Maybe I will, would firstly explain what, what are those phantom shares. So uh, these are used when um, uh, the person wants just to get uh, money and, and that's it. Uh, he does not really care about the shares. Uh, so compensation is offered instead of the share uh, of the shares. Uh, so this is allowed uh, under Lithuanian law, but uh, then you will uh, meet the taxes. You always have to pay the taxes. This is like this yeah. is a normal thing. <laughs> but the problem is that uh, when you get the shares uh, and you um, you hold the option for three months, uh, three years, and. Uh, follow other rules. Uh, you are not you are not paying the taxes at the moment of getting the shares. You will only pay uh, when you will sell the shares. Also, it will not be considered that uh, this is your salary, so uh, social uh, security contributions will not apply. So uh, you see that the numbers are a bit lower and postponed. Do you have a phantom shares in your companies, gentlemen? Uh, it's, no? it's not allowed. I think in. Uh, current leg legislation, but as far as I know, uh, it's on the to-do list, I think, of the of the government, you know. And in general, we need uh, to update uh, uh, corporate uh, co companies' law, 
because uh, in the current situation, if you have too many shareholders, it can stop uh, making uh, decisions, like, uh, because you need to have... Uh, Permission of all small yeah, shareholders, yeah, yeah. yeah to it's do like something. like a lot of bureaucracy and then... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, from every decision, you have to have signatures from like 20 people. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. this uh, stock option shares should have different rights than the common shares in terms of uh, voting and so on. So I think uh, we're waiting. We are all waiting for this update and it uh, makes, uh, will make things easier. I think from Unicorns, I'll tell you, you are doing that stuff with the government, you're talking to I change the legislation, yes? Mm, unicorns a lot of, and uh, quite many, I think, other businesses see the value to have Yes, More sure. Updated. All ecosystem. Updated law. And I have a tricky question. I think it will be the last one. And I think maybe James could uh, add to that. If you offer a salary and then you change it to the stock option, so the employee will say, I want a bigger salary and an option, what do you do then? <coughs> really a training question. Fire them. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we're, we're dealing with that now. So when people get promoted, you look at, is it fair to give them a top up in options? Uh, so our plan is to do options twice a year because when you're hiring so quickly, it's a lot of paperwork. Um, you want to build products, not do paperwork. So I think it's fair when you have people promoted to look at it and say, are they deserving if they move through a framework of having more options? That's, I think that's only right. You wouldn't join as an analyst in a bank and have the same options when you become a VP. Shouldn't be, shouldn't be the same in startups. Good. Uh, do you have some recommendations for Lithuanian government, Arnas or Gedra? Yeah. You already mentioned that a lot, but maybe Gedra, you to more clarity maybe in the legal stuff. Firstly, uh, it would be advisable for the institutions to align their positions. So when the legislator tells something, uh, it would be good that the state tax inspectory does not uh, tell the opposite. Then it would be good to shorten the term uh, of the option to, for example, like Latvian did, uh, to one year, and also to include uh, board members, freelancers in, into the scheme. So that would be uh, helpful. So I think we guys had half an hour for this discussion. And if you have some questions, uh, Giedria and Arnas and James will answer to you. And also ask me, I have some VC experience and have the founder experience, legal experience. So please jump on us in the backstage and let's have discussion if you need to hear more. Good, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for the really insightful conversations. And as we mentioned, you can grab them in the deal room and discuss more. How can you make it work for your startup or what to consider when joining a startup who has an offer of some stock options. And right now, we're diving into the web-free world. And web-free became a very buzzword into the, in the conference landscape as well, in the tech scene. But let's look from a very different perspective. What kind of value does it hold for the startup scene? So our next session, no surprise, what can startups expect from Web3? And we're going to explore it with entrepreneurs that have first-hand experience of building their products in the new era of the internet. Let's give a round of applause to Tadas Morukas, co-founder and CEO at Blockchain Center. Tade, where are you? I cannot see. Oh, here he is. Hello. Skirmantas Januskas, CEO and co-founder at Grab Radar. Oh, there is a huge support group here. That's great. Kaspers Ausers, Mobility and UX GD Lead at Accenture Baltics. And moderator, Gintotas Motskus, project manager at Blockchain Center. Hello, guys. So we are here to talk about uh, what can startups expect from Web3. Uh, before we dive in into questions and etc., let's introduce our Colleagues, Kaspers. Hi, my name is Kaspers. By the way, who recognizes the brand Accenture, which is up there? Can you raise the hand? I need to take a photo for report. So, 
Thank you. Looks like I need to introduce it. Yeah. Uh, Accenture is the biggest firm, IT firm in Latvia. We hire uh, half of the bachelors, and half of the master IT guys every year. We have more than 2,100 people. And this year we will close uh, also operations in, uh, open operations in, in, in Lithuania by hiring 100 people. Yes, uh, and uh, my role is that I'm taking care of 250 people for UX, mobile, and web development. Thank you. Great, thank you. Skirmantas, please continue. Hey there, so I'm Skirmantas, CEO and co-founder of Death Raider. Well, uh, I would say Death Raider is in a way similar to traditional app stores that you're used to, but also very different. Different in a way that in this world that started probably four or five years ago. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not kind of uh, saying it wasn't there, but it just started and now we're getting used to it. So, you know, think of if there were no app store, how would you feel? Probably bad. Uh, so in the blockchain, this is how we felt. And four years ago, we found a DAP Raider. So what we do is we're tracking decentralized applications. We know how much money there is flowing. We know how many users there are. So if you want to know which applications are more popular, which are not, which are worth investment, just hop on there. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Tadas. Hey, I'm Tadas. Well, basically what I do, I, I'm one of co-founders of Blockchain Center. I'm also a co-founder of Limpo. And what Blockchain Center does is we help startups and businesses to fully go to the blockchain world. So we help them fundraise, we help them release the token to the market, we help do NFT sales and everything else that's in between. Yay! Yay! <laughs> and I am the moderator of this discussion, Gintotas, and I work at uh, Blockchain Center with Tadas. <laughs> so Web3 is rather the new topic in the world. Could you please share your definition, what is Web3 for you, and how it is different from the Web1 or 2 that we know right now and we are using each day? Um, Kaspers, your thoughts? Oh, difficult topic. Uh, Web3, right? Um, this, is, this is something what, what, let's say, industry promised, that there will be infinite infinite ways of uh, making the value and not just making the value but also own it yes that's that's my okay I'll, I'll probably expand on your saying on infinite ways to create value because that's exactly what we see in this industry you know if you compare it to traditional world it's kind of looking at you need to ask for permission you need to go and, and look at instructions and so on and then kind of get access to that in the blockchain you just you know you just connect various different things. So for startups, there are so many more opportunities than in traditional world, I'm, I'm sure about that. Cool. Others? Well, um, web, web 3.0, that says that it's a third web version, right? So first of all, we have to understand what is Web.1, what is Web.2, and then we can um, clarify the difference. So, um, I can give you a simple explanation. So Web.1 is um, when it's an early internet days, right? So it was a days where you would only interact with a website in a read-only manner. So you see a website like Wikipedia or something like that, you can get some information and that's cool. Um, Web.2.0 Web is um, the current uh, mainstream version of, of the website applications that we are using. So it might be Facebook, Instagram, and so on and so forth. Um, it's mostly based on a cloud computer where you uh, not only interact with a website with a um, read-only manner, but you also can write something on the website and leave your uh, digital footprint there. And website uh, Web 3.0 is that you can basically own the content because compared to the web 2.0 you for example let's pick the facebook you post some kind of feed on your wall and it does it belong to you 
probably not because it's on the centralized servers of the Facebook. But in Web, web 3.0, you can have an opportunity to own the content that you create. It might be a digital asset, uh, songs, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure we will get deep into that during this conversation. Nice, nice answer. Thank you. Um, I heard Skirmantas mention the opportunities for uh, Web3. So what are the biggest opportunities for startups that you see in Web3? Yeah, I'd say first is, again, the, the amount of choice that you have. Um, well, in, in traditional world, yeah, we, you know, we get used to, you know, um, hotel booking platforms and so on. You can think of many of different variations, but still, Many, many things are already sort of invented. You know, we see just kind of variations of different things. On the blockchain, that's a very, very new niche, very new sphere that you can just do anything that's not possible in the traditional world we're used to. And also, Death Rider, to a certain extent, is an example here. Um, nothing like that is possible in the real world, where kind of an app store has statistics, numbers, and so on, which is very useful and very needed. So I think there is so many opportunities there in terms of just the amount of ideas that you can think of. And then we will probably talk also about sort of capital, you know, how startups get capital. So not just VCs anymore, not just investors, but uh, you can just get money from literally anyone in, in many different ways, be it tokens, NFTs, uh, or you can think of a new way. So plenty of those opportunities, really. Okay, that does anything to, to add? Yeah, I think that the uh what it, what it creates for the startups is um, additional, uh, what's the main aspect in my opinion, it creates additional ways of fundraising. So for example, if you, ha if you are a startup or I don't know, a few friends with an idea, you don't really need to go and uh, through this whole painful process, uh, approaching the VCs, um, polishing your pitch deck and so on and so forth, you can basically approach the uh, already formulated market and um, present their idea to the to the user base and actually raise the capital for your idea. Great, thank you. So, Kaspers, what's your thought? Nothing to add. Mm, startups, startups, guys, you are much faster than big, big enterprises, right? Uh, the feeling the feeling, I mean, we are working with top 500 organizations in the world, and the feeling is that they don't understand yet what do, does it mean and how to apply. So your role is to educate, and I have a story about that, but let's... let's. Okay, so we talk about, uh, talked about opportunities, but uh, how about the threats, Kasparas? Threats of Web3 is that we will not succeed in uh, education uh, of enterprises. Uh, story, it's just Im imaginary story. Yes, um, board room. There are CAO, uh, CEO. There is strategy manager, marketing folks, and they are thinking about what to do next in an, let's say next year. And uh, the, the, the the boss asks. Uh, Hey guys, I mean, um, are we are we innovative company? And uh, the strategy and CEO guy says, "Oh, we have sure we have innovation department." Okay, can we do something with with innovation next year? Oh yeah, yeah, we can. And then the CEO takes this, let's say, um, Wall Street Journal and says, "Hey, look, there is something written about Web 3. Let's do that." And the IT guy says, oh, yeah, yeah, we already planned. We already planned this um, uh, blockchain stuff. W what blockchain stuff? Uh, we will place um, in, 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 a, in a checkout uh, forum that you can pay with the Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin, that's the, the thing which is kind of fluctuating and it's not controllable and it is kind of decentralized. Yeah, 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 that, that thing. And that CEO go, go, goes back in, in the, his mind and thinks about decentralization, uh, no control. And he reminds uh, uh, last evening, he has three kids in, in the next, next room. And there is absolute silence. And what happens when the absolute silence is between three kids? 
two ways. Whether they are engineering something and taking apart your iPhone and they are educating themselves. Whether they are eating candies, covering each other, and they are like uh, burglars, right? He checks in a room and asks, Henry, did you eat the candies? No. Robin, did you eat the candies? He's hiding. So, and so forth. And the, the CEO understands that he, there is a threat because there will be nobody, no one responsible for that. And this part is very, very important that we need to educate what does it mean actually blockchain, that there is a kind of visibility, there is tracking, there is security, there is kind of distributed thing. Yes, this is the thread of boardroom, let's say. You have covered quite a lot, even the kids. Yeah, <laughs> I have three of them. Nice <laughs> <laughs> one. Um, do you think uh, big tech companies' businesses are at advantage or the disadvantage compared to startups when it comes to moving to Web3? Skirmontas, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think a bit of both. Because, uh, well, first of all, we have access to capital. So that, that's in Britain, you know, you can just get money as much as you need, hire people, and that's it. So that's a big advantage in the first place. But then what we see currently is Google, Facebook, and so on. It's pretty difficult to hire those people, you know, who want to just cook something, you know, just do something very quickly, very fast, and, and just launch. And, and you can see there are two guys launching a hundred million dollar funds and, and projects and so on. So that sort of disadvantage could be that, you know, it's pretty it's getting pretty hard to, pretty difficult to hire. Uh, talent in this industry specifically, you can hire good developers, but can you hire really those top-notch ones who can do blockchain? That's another topic. So I think, yeah, there is this advantage of having access to capital, uh, being, you know, well-funded and so on, but then access to human resources, this is where the kind of battle begins now in the industry. So in simple words, you are saying they have money, but they are so slow. They have money, but people don't want to come to them. Okay. I mean, that's a risk. I'm not saying that's always happening, but that's a risk. I, I think they don't know how to sell it, sell idea internally as well. So if you come back to the story that by saying blockchain and, and, and Bitcoin, I mean, they will be trapped. But if you say, for example, there was a guy today from the car vertical. Yes. What if? Car Vertical produce the software, give to all uh, auto dealers in Lithuania, Latvia, and, 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 and Estonia. And when you are purchasing the car, fresh, zero, kind of, um, then the car appears on the blockchain. The record starts. And this is one thing. The second thing: What if Car Vertical produce the software for official services? And if they are changing some part of the car, it appears on a blockchain and nobody can kind of change it. And in, in essence, for me, Car Vertical sells a promise of quality, a promise of, of traceability. Yes. And that kind of practical, uh, let's say, thoughts, ideas can, can educate the, the, the enterprises. So may I just add, this is an opportunity and a threat in one. <laughs> We can see so many startups, so many projects being built because, as I said, so many opportunities. But in the end, how many of those succeed? So you can kind of, you know, think of something that, ooh, adding blockchain here would be cool, you know, to a single player game. Why? So, yeah. So startups have an advantage, let's say, here with, when we compare to big companies. Yes. Um, we hear a lot of news about uh, or lethality or something about uh, crypto markets. Well, we see the situation that's with the market it is right now. Um, how does this affect the Web3 companies and or investors? Tadas, would you like to share? Oh yeah, it, it might affect drastically. Um, I know that I was in this specific position. <laughs> um, during 2017, we did an ICO, we raised I don't remember, 12 million USD or something like that. And the thing is that it, it 
it takes time for you to cash out your um, funds properly because you have to do KYC, you have to fulfill all the, all the regulations and so on and so forth. And while we, while we were in this cash out process, the crypto winter hit really hard. So that means that the market is really volatile, right? It can go this up and down. So 11 million uh, got to the 5 million in two days, then it got to 2 million, it got to 3 million, and it's really frustrating to track the market. So, so yeah, it's really, um, it might create additional opportunities when the market goes up. So if you're smart enough, you're able to invest and maybe long Bitcoin and yeah, you have to be really smart. But it also creates a lot of threats that the funds that you raise um, can become um, 60 or 70% less in a matter of weeks. What, what can be solution maybe to, to combat that? Yes, yeah, so the solution is you, you can transfer the money to the um, uh, stable. stable coins. Yeah, not all of the stable coins as you might know. <laughs> um, because of the terrorist situation, you can pack your funds, you can hedge your funds, you can use your funds as some kind of collateral. There, there's a lot of opportunities and I really agree with your um, uh, with your idea that you have to educate the market, you have to educate the, the um, startups that are emerging in a crypto market. So. Well, it's no secret that the second bear market is much easier than the first one. And this <laughs> is, you know, after the NFT boom that we had uh, kind of last year, now we see lots of people who it's the first time when they see a market crashing. Yeah, but the, the, the thing is that people are smarter now. It's a lot of people are starting to short market and, and receiving a gains. Yeah. So that's, that's, that cr even the crypto crash creates a lot of opportunities. Oh, definitely. That's the best time to build. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, each year between 35, 40% of startups, ventures receive capital from three Fs, friends, family, or fools. Is there more opportunity for funding in Web3 or is it a similar scenario? Uh, what do you think, Kaspers? I, I think um, there was a mention it already that uh, maybe you can go out to the market and, and use those opportunities with, 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 with those digital assets to get, get, let's say, the first kick. Okay, so Tadas, since you mentioned that, could you elaborate? Yeah, exactly. Nowadays, there is a few popular methods of, of raising capital. So yeah, you said friends, family, and fools. Fools, yeah. So I would add one more fucking crowdfunding, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so there is a fourth F uh, there. Um, and there's a several ways of doing that. The first one, as I said, you can, you can find um, a community that believes in your idea, and you can just release the token, which is not that complex. Um, you can also create some kind of crowdfunding initiatives based on the assets that you are released. So for example, a sandbox. Um, there's a project sandbox that, that sold digital land um, before the game even was released. So they um, started to selling assets, land, um, for the users in order to attract um, fundraising and use these funds to, to, to develop a product. So it's just an example of, let's pick a game, right? World of Warcraft, right? And there's a lot of assets. There, there's armor, there is uh, shields, there is um, swords and all sorts of magical elements. Um, so that would be that the developers would sell the assets before the game is even released in order to raise funds for the initial game release. So yeah, you can just sell all that. Thank you for this thorough answer. Uh, we have some public questions and uh, uh, don't you see it as a problem that centralized cloud companies provide infrastructure services to blockchain networks? Skirmantas? Yeah, that's, that's a bit concerning. Uh, but I think in a way it's similar to kind of how dApps are being built. You know, at first you and how DAOs, the centralized organizations are being built. At first, you kind of you try to decentralize the parts that, that you can, uh, but now still, yeah, most of the infrastructure is run on, on centralized servers. We should kind of aim to get that to decentralize more. Uh, so it's concerning. Uh, I don't know what's the solution. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, for Tadas, how can we talk uh, of decentralization if large centralized cloud companies in Pura, AVS, etc., are providing infrastructure to a majority of dApps? Yeah, th that's a good question. And in my opinion, what, what is the main difference between centralized applications and decentralized applications is um, the information, the, the key information that is stored on the dApps is on a blockchain. Um, and the uh, other information is uh, for the centralized applications is stored on the centralized applications. And obviously it's really hard to create fully transparent application that is 100% is stored on the blockchain because you obviously need to have some resources, even if it's uh, for front end or some kind of back end calculations on Azure and other centralized entities, but we, we will get there. We are slowly, we will get there, don't worry. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, I wish I was technical enough to answer this question in a deeper manner. Thank you. Kaspars, you mentioned Car Vertical. There's a question. Car Vertical started as a blockchain project, ICO2, and now it's centralized. Why? That's a good question. I need to be hired for car vertical and then I will know. <laughs> Your answer. <laughs> maybe, maybe they found that maybe the speed. Well, uh, yeah, the, the speed might well, I know it's car vertical did a successful ICO and it's really good. They built really, really great product. But I'm sure that the uh, requests to the blockchain itself, they cost some amount of money. And, and at that time, Ethereum was the, the main um, blockchain provider and uh, it's really expensive to have fully skilled product on the blockchain so I'm sure they will have uh, they will transition to the blockchain at some point because as Casper mentioned it's really good to have a program where you are able to track the all the history of a specific vehicle that you are about to buy mm, we we are talking always about Web3, so what would happen if the market will crash on, would crash on Web3? Uh, how can we protect our startup businesses from that? Well, I can also <laughs> speak a little bit about okay. that. How, well, the cryptocurrency will crash and it will go up and there, there's going to be thousands and thousands of cryptocurrencies, NFTs and so on and so forth. But you have to understand that cryptocurrency is just one of the applications of the blockchain. The blockchain in itself is the innovation that we have to focus on. The blockchain is the, is the core element. And the cryptocurrencies is, yeah, as I said, is one of the applications that actually attracts a lot of, and it's good that there, there is a blockchain, that, that there is a cryptocurrency element because it attracts all sorts of investors there because if there was no value, no one would probably use the blockchain because it's really slow, it's really clumpy, and it needs time to, to get to the point that it's going to be used on every single aspect. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be worried uh, uh, of that. I would just focus on the technology itself. Okay, there is another one interesting. Will edge computing take over cloud or will we see a great mix of both in Web3. Skirmantas, would you like to share? Uh, you got my difficult one, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not sure about that. I, I think, you know, cloud computing where we stand now, uh, we're kind of sort of centralized kind of server bases, you know, and then I, I want to think, I want to believe that this is not going to remain like that because we see what happens when some, some, some data center gets, you know, uh, damaged something happens and if we talk about the blockchain if we talk about free we don't want that to happen so I just want to make sure that this sort of changes uh, the rest we'll see great thank you mm, to add about yes. the cloud folks you need to understand that those big corporations just 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 took all the servers under the tables and just just put in the cloud it's happening right now I mean they are kind of not able to consume maybe the idea about the edge computing yet, but taking in account that power what we have all in, in the pockets and uh, elsewhere in the cars, 
then the edge computing definitely will be used in some form. Thank you. Tadas, there is a question from Tadas. So maybe it's for you. What is the risk of Web3 becoming centralized with big hedge funds having the biggest stakes in it? Yeah, that, that uh, hmm. well, well, you have well, to. Uh, yeah, obviously, the Facebook, what the Facebook is doing is they, they're creating, there's the perfect example of the corporation going to Web3, right? They're creating the meta, they're creating this whole metaverse experience where creators can create the assets, sell to the market, and so on and so forth, which on paper looks good. But the thing is that it's centralized. You are not able to transfer these assets to somewhere else and use them in some kind of uh, other experience. And, and the key, the, the, the purpose of this decentralization, decentralization is that you, when you have the asset, you own it. It doesn't matter if the Facebook or Meta or whatever goes bankrupt, you still have this asset. And you can, always, and you can use it in a different kind of environment. So I just gave you the example of um, World of Warcraft. So imagine you have a, some kind of legendary weapon, right? And there is a community of, of, uh, of the World of Warcraft. And the Blizzard goes south. They, they don't really want to develop the, the game anymore, right? But there is the community that holds all the assets and these assets are decentralized. They are still there despite the fact that Blizzard is out of the game. So what can theoretically, and what is happening in the, in the market right now, for example, the community can build some other experience around the existing assets. And, and that's, the, that's the beauty of, uh, of, of that. And, and the question was, uh, is it a threat, right? <laughs> So it is kind of threat, but uh, there's a lot of really good minds and, and just give the power to the community and, uh, and blockchain, the, central, the truly decentralized blockchain allows to do that. So. But what about standards? Can I take this sword and go in a Mario game and, 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 and hit yeah, the mushroom? Yeah, exactly. This is what I'm trying to, to, to say. But the, the community builds experience. The, the, but theoretically, yeah, you can have the, the one single asset can be a sword in one game, the spaceship in other game, and it can be, a, I don't know, an entry ticket to the most exclusive club in Las Vegas. Thank you guys for joining and thank you for Startup Fair. We are done here for today and uh, see you in the next adventures. Thank you for a really insightful discussion we've just had here about the web free and the new era of the internet. And right After having an insightful chats and discussions, it's time to get into the proactive part. Well, we were diving into the topics on this main stage. There was another stage where over 40 startups were pitching their ideas and their startups. And only 10 of them, 10 of the best startups, were selected by the investors, jury members, which will compete for the Pitch Battle 2022 winner's title and prizes. I think all of the startups who pitched today and showed up for themselves and all of us should have some kind of round of applause because they already did a big step. So let's greet them. And now... Let's hear those 10 startups who are going to show up here and show what are they working on. So the startups who got into the finals, it's Vocal Image, 10 Times Immersive, Welp, Tippet, Zanu, Mark Idea and Mark Sign, Video CV, Codigi, Ubic, and iSpeak App. And this year's Startup Fair partners have prepared some amazing prizes for you. The main prize and the main winner will receive 7,500 in cash by SME Finance. And then we have some special prizes. 5,000 euros advertising budget by HTT Pool. 5,000 euros worth Thunder Beam services. 4,000 and 2,000 euros for legal services by Trinity Durex. And also mentorship with the founders of Lithuanian Unicorn Startups, Vinted and Tessanet. And also, nevertheless, tickets 
start a booth in the startup village, and fast track to the North Star Pitch Competition by Tech Barbecue, happening in Copenhagen this September. And today, in order to choose our winners, we have a panel of judges who will be evaluating the finalists and deciding who will become the winners of Startup Fair Pitch Battle 2022 and take home the prizes. So let me introduce you the judges who will be choosing the winners. It's Odris Melukas, Open Circle Capital. Just let's wave to everyone so everyone can see you here. Arvidas Bloja, Praktika Capital. Kari King. Kari King, Super Angel. Martinas Kanzeras, Lead Band. Victoria Ratomske, SME Finance. And Giedra Chuladiana, Trinity Eurex, with a huge support team over here in the States. And you might have all the questions. So how do they choose the winner? Are there some criteria or just something what you like? So we do have some rules and the rules are simple together with the criteria. The startups will come here. They will have to deliver their three minutes pitch. With, and the pitch will be followed by two minutes Q&A by the judges. Startups who are behind the scenes right now, please follow the time because if you go over time, you will be cut off. And the startups will be judged on the following criteria. Product, market fit, business model, traction, team, and presentation skills. I heard they had quite a great pitching workshop by Gleb a couple of days ago. So I'm pretty sure they're very much ready. So right now, no more talking. And I guess let's start the pitching and invite to the stage startup vocal image. Hello, my name is Nick. I am from Vocal Image, and we created voice training and speech therapy app for speakers and singers. We are AWS AI Challenge winners. We have more than 300,000 registered users. We are growing above 60% month over month in the USA. We are awesome, and nowadays people are looking to consume more audio content and to produce it, but people don't like their voice. Over 18 million of US adults reported having voice problems, and their only available choice is voice training with a coach. But it is expensive and time-consuming. With Vocal Image App, you can improve your voice, empower your speaking skills, and even heal speech disorders. We use AI to set up your personal training plan so you can practice anytime, anywhere, at an affordable price. How does it work? Record your voice with your phone, get your personal plan, and begin to improve your voice immediately because how you speak is twice more important than what you say. Bloggers, podcasters, public speakers, and singers need better voice to increase impact and to earn more. Our addressable market is over 7 billion euros and 1 in 13 adult person faces voice problems. We can help. In January, we launched in the USA market and tripled our revenue with the same marketing costs. And right now, we are growing above 60% month over month in the USA market. We already have strong unit economics and our users unlock features and content with subscriptional access monthly or annually. And by the way, we are the only one who makes with coaching language agnostic. We have ready to use AI data set to provide a personal plan for anybody. Every training improves the data set, application becomes smarter, increasing the gap between competitors and us. Our voice guru has 20 years of professional voice coaching experience and together we launched the most prominent voice dedicated YouTube channel with over 200,000 subscribers. Our community asked for a solution to practice and we launched Vocal Image. In less than 12 months, we became top educational app in CIS countries and we are not stopping here. We are raising 1 million seed funding round to become top educational app in USA and to reach 100k MRR in next 12 months. We have follow-on investors and we invite you to join because in five years we will build all-in-one product that solve any voice problems. And just imagine if people of all races, genders or ages 
no matter their financial status or location, can speak clearly with a beautiful voice and without speech disorders. My name is Nick. I am CEO of Vocal Image and reach me to become part of this story. Timing, Nick. Great. Right now, we are using performance marketing channels to validate markets. It's Facebook, Google, Apple search ads. And if we understand that this market is good for us, we build strong organic community at this market. Mm -hmm. The mic is not working. Let's see. No. no. No? Ah, it's working now. Okay. Uh, so you have shows great traction. Have you been able to profile who are the sort of first uh, very keen customers or any like very, very attractive customer groups that you're going after? You mentioned podcasters, singers, etc. But is that what your current traction shows as well? Mostly we are targeting at amateur speakers and singers who use voice for profession and hobby. We divide them into three categories. Content creation, YouTubers, TikTokers, podcasters, health. We launch speech recovery program for people who need to restore their speech from zero again, for example, who suffered from stroke and self-perception. It's public speakers and unique ICP. It's transgender people who use our application to feminize their voice without surgery and medicine. Uh, hi, Nick, uh, good presentation. And um, could you help us understand how how long would a typical user use your app? So wh when is it like, okay, I've done it? We have retention of annual subscription of 25% and our early adopters still use our application after 16 months after the launch. It's not just buy subscription and pay, they use application. 16 months, still using. Six second, seconds for the last question. How many clients do we have that pay? Right now we have 300,000 users registered in application. We have 1,600 active subscribers and we have more than 10,000 payment tra transactions with our application. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Vocal Image. And Nick, great pitch. Thank and now, you. There we go. And now I would like to invite to stage 10 times immersive. I feel like I'm a politician. Okay. Hello, guys. My name is David Zargaryan. I'm a proud engineer with 10 plus of experience in industrial automation and product development. A year before, I personally faced with a problem when I took my child to the hospital for immunization. And this is real picture from our scientific experiment. So, in the end of the day, the children have the psychological back effect, side effects, bad wetting, loss of apathy, depression, and anxiety, and there is a high correlation between customer satisfaction rate with medical institution profitability. And medical institutions spend extra time and resources to relax a child. We made the decision to develop a psychological hypno content based on the virtual reality that abstract the child attention, leaving a fewer attentional resources for the brain to concentrate on the pain. And we want to go forward. Uh, our psychological experiment showed that we relieve a pain up to 35%. And now we are developing biofeedback based mechanisms that obscure of uh, data from the face of the patient, from the child, and generate the content accordingly, guaranteeing more immersion level. So we pay a lot of attention on the content, on the right structurization, and enabling high immersion. In comparison with our competitors, we target acute pain for pediatrics, valuing personalized adaptive content for any children. So our market is considered to be six billion. We target the medical institutions, clinics, and uh, we have a very simple business model. Currently, we are in a TRL six to seven, testing our product in the street directions, needle phobia, 
dental phobia, pre-surgery anxiety. This is a most stressful situation where they take a child from the parent to do the surgery. So we have very experienced team and we work with one of the top scientists in sphere of the pain management. This guy is like a city of the Tesla, but in the pain management. So having a negotiations with the doctors, we got a lot of direction to scale up. And of course, gambling, adults in this reset can be very interesting also. So in the end, I want to highlight that the pain management is a fundamental human right. And I'm sure with your help, we can scale up our product internationally. And here you can see how the children is passing procedure without stress and anxiety. Thank you a lot. I save a 20 seconds. Yeah, great pitch. We can jump straight into the questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So where you will use the funding? You're asking 160,000. Okay, the funding we spend on the psychological content because we are more science-driven company. We value science a lot. And at the end of the day, anyone can say, hey, this is a simple cartoon. We can make a cartoon, but we have to prove it. That's why in the October, we're going to publish one of the biggest pediatric experiments in the top scientific journal and in the, that is going to be in the U.S., pain, uh, by, published by the Pain Association. So the money went to the engineering and the product development, science, and again, engineering. Maybe a question for me. So this is a building a prototype, right? No. No, it's working. Yeah, of course. It's working. And, and it is proved. It is not just a worse So experiment. what about the traction? Yeah, currently what we are doing is like, again, we, we are more about science. We are doing deployment. We deployed in the five medical clinics, cancer center, child pediatric center, two dental clinics. We are getting a lot of data. And now we are in Lithuania after 20, 27. I'll be in the Kaunas to participate in emergency conference there to test it over there in UCLA, in Middle East, in order to get a lot of geographical data to use in the content. This is very crucial to have specific information from different geog geographical locations. Yes. Uh, thank you for your pitch. I really um, like your mission and I also used to actually work two years in a health technology company that targeted children. So I know really well how difficult it is to actually get uh, paying customers uh, because it's not on top of the priority list for hospitals. So what's your experience and, and uh, what's your sort of go to strategy with, with hospitals and then sort of medical institutions? Oh, thank you a lot. The first of all for investors, the children and the animals are the most preferable direction for the startup, right? But for medical institution in US, they pay a lot of attention on the customer satisfaction because of the insurance, etc. And I'll be very transparent, needle phobia will not make us a $100 million company, but dental for 100%. We even, from Armenia, we got a lot of requests from the suburb of the country. They are really to purchase a $1,000 unit, because for them, this is not a money. And we are out of time for questions. Thank you so much, Dantan. Have a good day. And well done. And now we have one more startup joining the stage, and it's Welp. So give a round of applause. Where is Welp? I cannot see him. Good luck. I can understand this. Labas Liotova. Hello, Startup Lithuania. Remember how you felt when you called the customer support? First, they put you on hold, and then you have to repeat the same problem over and over again to different people. That's how you're rolling your eyes. We customers hate being on hold. As a matter of fact, 60% of us will want to hang up after second minute. And one in three of us will never call back. But companies still don't get it and they still keep us on hold. It's ridiculously bad that globally in 2021, businesses lost $62 billion dollars just because of bad customer support. It's personal impacting me. It's impacting my wife. Where is she? Wife. Okay, there, where is she? I, that's the wrong hand. That's not my wife. Okay, yes. Much love. 
So it's impacting her. I can't, I can't kiss her when she's on hold. And then it's impacting you guys as well. Now, how do we solve this? In order to solve this, we have built Welp. Welp is a customer support automation platform using proprietary predictive customer behavior analysis technology. Too many buzzwords. How do we do that? We help companies to automate up to 60% of the incoming tickets and calls and help them close four times faster. That's $33,000 saved annually. We are closing the month of May with $162,000 in monthly recurring revenue, and we are going to close this, this year with, if not more, 4.1 million annual recurring revenue, helping more than 1,200 companies in 32 countries. How do we do that? We are, uh, let me just look at that. We have actually tailor-made business plan. We meet the customers where they are, or we adjust our business model as per their needs. The market is huge. When you look at the customer support market by 2025, it's going to reach $470 billion. We want a piece of that pie as well. But how do we, how do, we do that? Competition is tough. Market is busy. There are a lot of players. But having the most number of touch base with customers from CRM to messaging, as well as taking a speedboat approach, we can meet the customers where they need us. That's them. This is us. We can turn fast, adjust quickly, and meet the customer's expectations before our competitors can actually do that. Myself and my co-founder, Enrique, bring 15 years of experience in SaaS sales and in AI. Together, we are building the next customer support automation platform for businesses. We just graduated from Techstars, we raised $1 million seed funding, and now we're raising $5 million. If you have money, give it to us. Time is out. I'm sorry. Thank great you so pitch, much. Great pitch, but three minutes pitch. Ten I minutes, appreciate no question. That. No, thank you. <laughs> Apologies for going over the time. Yeah, Sibor, thank you so yes. much. As a customer support app, it's very energetic and gives us hope that someone will solve our problems. Thank you, Arvidas. Um, yeah. Arvidas. I learned yes. it not Arvidas, but Arvidas. Yeah. Thank yes. you. C can you tell me what's, uh, what markets you target and what's your playbook to roll out? We started, we did something very smart and it worked so far. With, uh, we went after the markets that our competitors didn't go. Sort of a not popular markets according to them. Many companies target right away North America. We went after LATAM, Latin America. We went after Caribbean. We went after Southeast Asia and Middle East, North Africa. So those were the markets where our competitors were not present yet. So we started getting these small and medium players so that we can have uh, upper hand. So that's, those are the markets. Now we are raising five million so that we can expand to EU. And just like you mentioned in our invest meeting that why EU, what's her name, right? So the family is bringing us here and we're expanding into EU as well. So how you're planning to sell, you know, and where you will start in EU? Right away, we are going to f uh, hire five Lithuanian locals right away here. We are working with startup Lithuania. Uh, Roberta, Aquile, and Polis have been extremely helpful for us. We are going to uh, hire five Lithuanian locals. If you're looking for a B2B SaaS position and you're multilingual, please reach out to us. They need to speak English, Lithuanian, and maybe German or French. And then we also spend $5,000 on paid advertising on a monthly basis. We also give about 30% commission to the partnerships as well. So three directions, local sales reps, uh, adver paid advertising, as well as the partnerships. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Time for one more question. Have you been able to measure the impact of, of your product to your customers? So you stated some stats. Is this from your actual research? That's a great question. Thank you so much. There's an insurance company that I can easily refer, and some of the other companies actually follow that. They come and say, so we constantly do customer interviews with them on a monthly basis to improve our performance as well. They have said that about 60 to 80% common inquiries now can actually be solved by our chatbot or voice cloning technology. Thank you. It Thank you so love. much. Acho. And now next for our next Please. time for our next pitch. And let's call on stage, tip it. I want you all to try to remember the last time you actually had cash to tip your waiter or bartender.
Chances are it was quite a while ago. And why is that? Because we carry less and less cash. As a consequence, 23 million EU and US waiters are suffering from decreasing tips, which are a vital part of their income. There's no secret, the world is going cashless, and by 2025, cashless transactions will be increased by 85%. And this has created ongoing challenges and problems for the hospitality industry, where tipping has historically been heavily reliant on clients having cash on hand. So we've built Tippet. Tippet collects, allocates, and distributes cashless tips straight into a waiter or bartender's personal bank account within seconds. My name is Totoras, I'm the co-founder of Tippet, and let me tell you how our hardware-enabled SaaS facilitates cashless tipping by providing restaurant business owners with an ultra-portable, standalone bank card terminal designed with the sole purpose of collecting cashless tips. The best part, zero integrations for the merchant. For the client, it is as simple as select, confirm, and tap. The transaction is made in five seconds, and the rest is done through our own payment processor. We launched in Vilnius last year, and since then, we expanded to over 150 venues, eight cities, and transferred over 120,000 euros worth of cashless tips. Because of Tippet, waiters have, on average, received up to 200 euros of extra income, making venues that use Tippet increasingly more attractive to potential new staff. And all of this from less than 4% of the market. We are working to become the most popular cashless tip solution in the EU and the US, tapping into the 23 million market, uh, waiter market that receives $10 billion of tips each year. And what's the best way to monetize them? Easy. Because of our infrastructure, we can charge both sides, the restaurant and the waiter. Uh, because of our unique pricing model, uh, we can have a 10 euro per waiter per month subscription and nobody feels like they're paying. We have a team of payment industry insiders, serial entrepreneurs, engineers, and we have a very strong advisory board that helps us with compliance and legal issues. Today, we just opened our fund fundraising round. We're raising 900K on our pre-seed round. Uh, to expand to new markets, further build the product, uh, and uh, increase our revenue. So if you're uh, a fund which would like to invest, please catch me after the event. Thank you. Thank you. Great timing. Questions? Yeah, so great presentation. Thank you. So what about competition? You know, in one bar I found a QR code which I scanned and uh, left the uh, tip for the waiter. So... Yeah, so there are, uh, people are trying to solve this with QR codes. Unfortunately, they usually fail. Not usually, they, all the time they fail. Because in order to tip with a QR code, you not only have to scan the code. When you land on a gateway page, you have to enter your bank card details. All the 14 digits, your name, surname, your expiration date, CVV, whatever, whatever. It takes three minutes. With tip it, you do it in three seconds. It's a very interesting transaction that you want to do very fast. So we have venues that have Tippet and QR codes, uh, and Tippet outperforms them 100x. Thank you. What markets do you operate in? Currently, we operate in Lithuania, uh, and we're expanding next month to Ireland. And from probably uh, limited data you have, what's your customer acquisition cost, and what's your estimated uh, kind of LTV or CAC? Currently, we, we don't really have that, uh, because we are partnered with Carlsberg Group here in Lithuania, so all the customer acquisition is basically inbound from them. We look into replicating that in Europe as well. So through partnerships, right? Yeah. It's a young business model, and I would like to understand that what's the competitive advantage you have against the other options, like 10 options we have in the market, because going to the Europe or US, you know, we have to have competitive advantage there. So do you have it, surely? Yeah, of course. So our main competitor that's currently uh, from UK and expanding to France and the US, uh, they also use a hardware component in the transaction process. Uh, our main competitive advantage is that our terminal is ultra portable. In many use cases can be operated with. They have a, quite a big thing that they put on the, on the bar stand and, and that's it. So that's the main thing. Three, two. How, how easy to start your business like you did? Very hard. 
<laughs> great question, great answer. Thank you, Tiffin. Well done. And now I can see that we are diving into the dog's world. And I would like to invite on stage Zeno. Oh! <laughs> Community support. Uh, the, um, the support. Hello, everyone. Uh, My name is Mindogas. I'm a co founder of Zanu, healthiest dog food subscription service in the market. The problem we're solving is really straightforward. Dogs are getting sick and even dying because there's too much sugar in regular dog food. And when my co-founder Agata was faced with this problem firsthand, she had to fight for the life of her best friend Ellie. She created the recipes for Zanu. Nowadays, we're using human grade ingredients and other superfoods to create a perfectly balanced and nutritious food. We're using freeze-drying technology to create this food for our customers, which saves 99% of nutritional value and makes it super convenient for our owners. Uh, pet wellness market is booming globally. It's around $200 billion annually. And if we're talking about addressable market, which is European Union uh, premium dog food market, it's around 14 billion and growing by 5% each year. Of course, there are other brands that are selling dog food online and offline. However, there isn't an established market leader across European Union selling dog food subscription. And the freeze drying technology makes sure that our food is by far the best in the market. The business model we operate is a subscription service, meaning that the customer pays us every month and we ship the food every month. Our customer lifetime value is already 780 euros and is growing with every month we spend in the market. That is 12 times more than our customer acquisition cost, which is around 65 euros. Our monthly recurring revenue is 35,000 euros right now. We can grow 20% month on month as soon as we remove our main growth constraint, which is working capital. And we'll do that with the next financing round. We have a perfect team to execute this business model. We are led by our nutrition expert, Agota, who is also the brand creator. We have a skill set to develop great physical products and digital products. Our chief marketing officer, Mikolas, is bringing multi-million euro marketing experience to the table. And we have an amazing team who is here today in the audience, helping us take care of all, all our customers and the marketing projects. And I'm super happy to be here today to announce that we're raising 500,000 euro seed round, pre-seed round, that we will use to acquire another thousand customers, get us to 150,000 euro MRR and raise our next round. In addition to that, this summer we are also launching cat food, so essentially we will double or triple our market. Thank you very much. I still have a few minutes. I don't know, uh, I can share. We're also opening B2B sales. Uh, we just got a big deal from Hong Kong for nearly 100,000 euros for each quarter. And now I'm out of time. Thank you very much. It's a blast to be here. Thank you. So, thank you. So what is your capacity of manufacturing your product and how you will ensure the quality when you will scale, actually? So uh, we're actually... Uh, sort of um, making sure that we don't run out of capacity. So we have plan B and C, different manufacturers. Right now, we can produce around 50 tons of freeze-dried food per month, which would serve 10,000 customers. We have 500 subscribers right now, so we have enough room to grow. And by the time we get to 10,000 customers, I think we would be building our own facility. Thank you for presentation. Uh, is your LTV 780 net or gross? That's the first question. This is net. Our gross margin is 30%. We're going to increase it to 45% by the end of this year. So 780 is gross margin. Yeah, that's how much uh, the customers pay us over their lifetime. Gross margin or revenue? This is revenue. Gross margin is 30% off of that, and we're going to increase it to 40 45% by the end of the year. Okay, thank you. And what's the churn rate? It's around 15%. We're working actively to reduce it, but 15% is a pretty good for us. Thank you. So what's the plan to get to 10,000? Did you say by the end of the year or? So like I said, we, we have a great marketing uh, director. We have a marketing message that really works. Now the main constraint is the working capital. Like we can grow, 
but we don't have enough money to produce enough food to, to, to meet the required you know, um, demand. Uh, so we're raising more money to be able to grow. We're also brokering a partnership with Uncapped Network in London so that we can use uh, loan money instead of equity money to grow faster. Other than that, uh, I think we're, we're good to grow, you know, and, and raise another round in 9 to 12 months when we reach 150,000 euros MRR. What are your main marketing channels for user acquisition? So, uh, our, at the core of our business is direct-to-consumer branding, so uh, we're uh, now actively working on Facebook, Instagram and Google ads. Uh, in the future, when we have more resources, we'll look into developing new channels like YouTube ads and uh, other networks as well. Um, yeah, in short. And we are out of time. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Zeno. Thank you for having us here. Oh, one last thing. We're launching a Thunder Beam campaign alongside our pre-seed round so all the pet lovers can join our vision. If there's somebody who would like to talk to us, we have some samples for you here today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great. And our next startup coming on stage, we're halfway there. The time is passing really fast while you're having fun, right? It's Mark A.D. and Mark Fine. Welcome on stage. Hi, how is everybody? I'm Marius, I'm a CEO of Mark A.D. And I will tell you, no surprise that each day we're drifting more and more into the digital world and our identities are becoming more our e-identities. That's a natural uh, way to go and we see what's happening in the market that lots of uh, money is moving to the uh, KYC AML startups as well as electronic signatures market is booming and according to the researches that in upcoming 10 years it will go 10 times more. And we got some cool things out of it. So we got uh, e-signing with the most uh, secure qualified electronic signatures. We got KYC and AML products. We got lots of tools who helps us to do one or another thing. But why we need those tools, why we're buying qualified signatures or doing ML checks. In fact, we're not buying the tool per se, we're buying liability control. Because through all the ages in the human history, we as a customers and as a businesses, when engaging in any relationship, we want to be secure, we want to feel safe, uh, leverage our risk and have some safeguards. Uh, that's why this business is here to stay. And once we adopt it, uh, we want natural evolution of, out, out of this. And uh, for evolution to happen, the market needs to overcome some certain challenges. So if we have uh, the signing with the qualified signatures, we don't want any borders for that. We want to have it global. We want better KYC. Better, I mean faster, more easier, uh, still secure. And we don't, have yet, we don't want yet another tool, gadget, a subscription or platform uh, to help us to do that. No, we want to capitalize as a customers and as a business on the tools we already have. And there is where Mark ID as a universal e-signature and identification gateway comes in handy. We develop three-in-one solution which addresses all those market uh, issues and which helps both sides, the customers and the businesses. You want to sign the documents, really binding documents with the qualified signatures. You want to do it globally. You want to control the signing process and get all the perks at the same time being compliant with AIDAS regulation. We have it. You want those signing tools to do some more magic, uh, for example, like enable, enable secure login to the system, do a fast forward identification for car rental, or even uh, check into your uh, hotel room. We have that. You want to add additional layer of security with a KYC product like uh, Face ID, AML checks, and so on. We have it as well, and it works. We already have more than 100 B2B clients. We have almost 10K MRR and some quite well-known brands in our portfolio. And for this year, we established ourselves an ambition to get ready for the European-wide business scale. We outlined the clear uh, milestones and OKRs, what we need to do, what we need to deliver to achieve that. We built a strong team uh, who is ready to support our mission and who is go ready to go an extra mile. We know where we're going to invest in order to reach the greater revenue. So today I invite you to join us and unlock the full potential of our electronic identities. Thank you. Timing. Two minutes for questions. Thank you for your pitch. Um, 
I know for a fact that in Estonia already we have a couple of similar businesses. So if you're expanding to new markets, what's your unique angle? Uh, what's the competition there and, and sort of what's the differentiator? Yeah, so uh, we have competition basically from two sides. So one is uh, guys are working on the e-signing, electronic signature. Another side is working uh, more on the fraud prevention and detection. And we spot this area in between where with the combination of those tools, because the three things, they can work together, they can work separately, uh, we can come in there. Plus, uh, we are looking more on the global scale, because especially in the e-signing market, the things are working locally very perfectly. But once you cross the border or the European Union borders, that's it, they end. Uh, so this is our advantage that we can go global with our tools. Do you already have any international customers? Uh, not yet. Uh, we just uh, working on the uh, customer side of the global signing. It will be released in upcoming two, three weeks, and then we are going to uh, pitch for the uh, global clients. So to which country you will expand first, and why this country? Uh, we now have been for the end of the year uh, Denmark and Belgium, uh, and it consists of several things, but uh, basically for their readiness for for this. So what's kind of your, um, what's the core pitch to the clients, right? Because there, there are multiple options to choose. Like, do you target any specific vertical? What, how, how you basically get them to buy a product? Yeah, so uh, we, we are going to the companies and uh, first of all, you need to understand the, the needs. But our idea is that we simplify the identification process. We fast forward it because uh, to do the regular KYC process with the face screening, video calls, and etc. It's expensive, it's not convenient. Uh, so we offer them the alternative, which is the same legal and secure, but just much easier to implement and much easier for the customers. And we're out of time. Thank you. It Take was care. Mark ID, Mark Sign. Well done. And the next one coming to the stage is Video CV. Good job. Achoo. Hey everyone. Hey, I'm Hans. I'm a co-founder and sales manager of Video CV, and I would like you to imagine swiping right on Tinder and matching with someone who seems to be the perfect match for your life. But only one minute into the date, you feel like you want to just stand up and run away. That's something that happens to recruiters daily, and Video CV is solving that problem. During the time when 89% of all failed hires fail only because of attitudinal reasons. We still rely on a 70-year-old screening process, focusing mostly on skills, while 95% of HRs make their hiring decisions based on personality. That just doesn't make sense. That's why Video CV is on a mission of bringing personality to the first step of recruitment. Our talent screening automation tool lets candidates show their true potential and makes it faster and easier for the uh, companies to locate the best talent for them. Our solution makes it easy for the companies to show motivation and valuable insights for the candidates and only with few minutes candidate and candidates can record their video answers to recruiters questions without the recruiter making a single CV screen or phone call. If only SMEs in MAR region could already save 1.3 billion euros and 3.6 trillion euros, actually 1.6 billion hours and 3.6 trillion euros when focusing more on personality and investing the save time into the, uh, their current employees and education systems. From case studies conducted with our current clients, we know that Video CV saves 60% of time spent on hiring, increases interview success rate by up to 70%, and our candidate feedback is an astonishing 9.6 out of 10. We are currently on five markets, recording a 7,000 euro MRR. Actually, from this week, 10,000 euro MRR with a 20% of growth uh, this year. We are trusted by some of the biggest companies in Baltics, but we are not stopping here. We, uh, before the end of 2023, we will launch our video-based assessment by machine learning algorithm, talent pool to companies, and B2C product for candidates. Of course, we also have competition, but we differentiate ourselves by extreme ease of use, pricing, and also the machine learning algorithm in the future. 
We are targeting SMEs in MAI region with 220 million companies matching the criteria. If we can get only 2% of the market share, that will disclose in 4.4 million clients and 1.8 billion turnover. Right now, we focus on growth in Baltics and South Africa. Uh, we are offering a subscription model charge for active listings per month with the annual client value of 4,800 euros. And that's our amazing team with the professionals. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, and thank you for a good yeah, pitch. Thank uh, you. Could you help us understand how do you acquire customers mm -hmm. and how, what's the conversion down the funnel once you acquire them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we use mostly cold calling, automated uh, emails and uh, LinkedIn automations. Uh, when we get uh, the prospect into the sales funnel, which for us means demos, then the traction from demos to trials or clients is uh, about 20%. And um, yeah, that's it. So the competitors that you mentioned are more uh, for the holistic candidate management um, and have this video recruitment as part of their software. How do you compare yourself against these uh, companies mm -hmm. like Recruit Lab uh, that are sort of covering the whole candidate uh, process? For sure, yeah. But the thing is that there are many companies already have ATSs. So for the company to change from their ATS that they have to something new just takes loads of time, onboarding and everything. So most of the companies don't want to do it. When we find a company who already have the ATS with the video system, that's just not our client. You mentioned that your differ differentiator is price. So could yep. you elaborate more on this? So it's cheaper or it's... Yeah, it's cheaper and also our pricing is a lot different than actually the, our competitors. Our competitors list, uh, for example, uh, based on the users or uh, candidates, which in our case uh, we list or like we price per listing, which makes it just easier for the companies to onboard. And as it's monthly based uh, pricing where, where they can just withdraw after uh, 30 days notice, then it's just easier for the companies to onboard. 10 seconds. Uh, what is the biggest challenge now? For sure, the machine learning algorithm. Like <laughs> we, we are tackling that uh, for sure, but we see loads of uh, like success actually this week working together with one other company. So that for sure is the biggest challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. University. And now next one on stage is Kodiji. Round of applause. Where is Scott? Did you? Oh, here you go. Good luck. Founders, designers, engineers, we all know what products we want to build, what clients need. But it takes many weeks of engineering work to actually bring the vision to market. It is expensive as hell, and there is always a risk of our competitors being faster. Many believe that hiring more people is the answer. But tech companies become slower as they grow. Why? Growing product complexity, technological depth, knowledge and ownership issues. It's humanly impossible to keep track of all this. I'm Igor, co-founder at Codigy, and our mission is to make software development faster. Codigy is a holistic platform that scans your organization and gives insights to improve it. When someone is working on a task, we can see files light up like neurons in a brain. With all the contextual data, we can see good, fast patterns and immediately detect hotspots where teams become slower or collide. Engineering leaders get full visibility. Codigy understands team structure and functional modules that make your product, like chat, reports, checkout. By mapping who owns what, we can untangle your product and make your teams autonomous. We help each team build a faster workspace, identify bottlenecks, track progress, validate with delivery flow metrics, so we can say, hey, we invested into this, now we're 25% faster. Our competitors focus on measuring productivity of engineers without showing what to fix. We believe Ability to, to show the team how to improve the workspace is the key. Demand for engineers is growing. 
company size we're aiming for represents a good market for growth. Our business model is simple. We charge a monthly fee for each engineer in the company. Right now, we're focused on large product companies, have a contract with a unicorn, and over 3,000 in monthly revenue. We have two co-founders, myself, CEO and product designer, and Anton, a field expert and a software architect. We're pretty stubborn, bootstrapped for a few years to build and validate Codigy. We're looking for 1.5 million to boost our MRR to 66,000 and hire 11 new people to improve the product. Right now, it takes hundreds of engineers to build and maintain a taxi hailing app, decades to become an expert engineer. We believe deep engineering augmentation will accelerate innovation and we'll see many more products across all industries. Thank you. What a great timing. Okay, thank you. So, great product. Uh, the question is how you sell your product. What is the sales process? So right now we're doing founder-driven dri sales because uh, we have a large network that we can connect to. But we, for the future, we're considering community-based growth. We already have Discord community and we're considering YouTube platforms and so on. Igor, thank you for a great pitch. Uh, could you explain us the motivation behind building CodeG? Uh, thank you. Uh, I've been an owner of production company for a few years. So was my colleague. We've seen so many engineering teams fail to deliver on time and just frustration of you already know what you want to achieve, but it takes months and years. So there is an obvious, obvious inefficiency in the market. Why do we need thousand people to build a simple application? This is something that has to be fixed. Very interesting idea, thank you. And uh, I want to ask you, what's your ideal customer profile and how many of those customers are around you, like Vinted or etc.? So our uh, ideal customer right now is scale-ups and unicorns because they already know their problem. Uh, they're already looking for solutions that would increase efficiency of the organization. So it's much, much easier to communi communicate with them. Uh, there are... 60% uh, of engineers work for small, uh, medium to large companies. So there are about 7,000 scale-ups in Europe. So. And do you have any competition in Europe or anywhere else? Uh, you could say so. But, uh, as I mentioned, we have competitors who are addressing this problem slightly from a different angle. They think uh, measurement is enough. We believe measurement is a validation. It's part of the solution. But the real answer is ability to show where, what is happening, where, what you have to fix. And what's your growth forecast for this year? Uh, sorry? Growth forecast, 10x, 20x. We're, we're planning to grow 20x in, in terms of MRR. Thank you. Thank you, and it's time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kodijin. That was great, but perfect timing. And then we have one more startup on stage, and we have only two left, and that's the final one on the stage being present here. And let's give a round of applause to Ubik. I think I, did I pronounce it correctly? Ubik, Ubik. correct. Great, great, have fun. At Ubik, we are the intersection of telecom and energy. We make the energy transition work. How? Electricity meters, water, gas, heaters, PV panels, EV chargers, batteries. We don't make them, but we connect them. We are a team from Taiwan, and we have a team of experts that have innovated with breakthrough IoT technology to connect all of those energy devices. We don't make them, but we connect them into a full turnkey solution. In Taiwan, we started with we half a dozen, we bootstrapped. We thought we were going to run out of money many times, and we ended up winning the largest tender of Taiwan to connect and monitor smart meters. It's the biggest IoT project of the island with 6 million meters to be connected by the end of the decade. So on one hand, we provide turnkey solutions, and on the other hand, we validate this technology and provide this globally. We went from being a boot smart small company to now being more than 80 people. We have won more than $40 million worth of contracts from Taiwan Power, which is the biggest utility provider of Taiwan. 
people told us that we are crazy to bid for those projects, but with the right technology, a good fit, then we made this work. So the way how this works is actually that we deploy smart meters into a dedicated network, kind of like being a dedicated telecom operator for energy assets. This is the basis to make the energy transition work, so that when you have good and understanding about the consumption, you can better balance supply and demand for power for the whole country. So what we have done actually is we make communication module, the hardware and the firmware, to connect those smart meters. We deploy base stations that are used to connect and monitor those devices wirelessly. And we make the software for a turnkey solution to make this particular um, type of project a reality. This is called advanced metering infrastructure. That is the basis, really, for you to make the energy transition work. All of the energy devices that we talk about, if they are not connected into a seamless network, you cannot make them work together. You won't know how many solar panels you can install in a particular place. You won't know how much EV chargers you can install before you break down the energy distribution. So here, we're actually talking about making the success that we have done in Taiwan to expand globally. With telecom operators, with utility providers, we believe that with Lithuania, for us, together, small countries, Taiwan, Lithuania, small countries, big balls, we can actually make a team together to make this a reality, the energy transition. At you. Thank you. Uh, what is your way to market action? Do you have any connections here already, you know, and some partners with whom you will start working? There's two business models. The first one is turnkey solutions for metering. The way to market here is public tenders. There is no secrets there. So it's all about technology. The second way is we actually make uh, hybrid networks that we then sell to operators and the existing energy distributors for them to leverage their existing network and add on. So this we can sell just like a Nokia or Ericsson, but it's fine-tuned for energy assets. It's very easy to sell right now from South Africa to Mongolia to Australia and Europe, Baltics, Nordics, South Europe. We're currently discussing with them. Basically, to until now, you only had a way to use a public network to connect your energy assets. With our breakthrough IoT products, that we're the only one in the world to have done. Now, you as a private company, you have a choice to also use our products to make a hybrid network and your private infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, could you explain what, you, what exactly do you do in-house? What's, what's the proprietary? My colleague Fabien, our CTO, I know him for eight years in Taiwan. He's a genius. He created a new kind of telecom network, which is called Weightless. It is now an open standard. Think of it as a Bluetooth, but for critical IoT objects. So it is a mix between 2G, but not for people, not for my phone, for those um, industrial assets. We created this from scratch. Nobody helped us. That's our competitive advantage. That's one product. The other product that's special is we take the existing cellular IoT technologies, it's called MBIoT, LTEM, and we make this available for you to purchase as a private network. So Nobody thought about that, but we made this. So hardware is off the shelf, you, you buy hardware. We made our own hardware, we made our own modules, we made our own, own firmware and our own core network. Everything from scratch. And now we're sharing this to every utilities and telecom operators. Thank you, and it was Ubik. Round of applause. That's you. And we're done with the questions and with the time. Well done. And we're going into our final pitch of the day. And it's going to be streamed online. So all eyes on the screen. And we can you hear us? Hi. And we have I Speak app streaming. Tuning in. Where are you tuning in from? Uh, I'm from Turin, from the beautiful arena in Italy. Wonderful. So the stage is yours. But even 
Thank you. Time for questions. Uh, how do you deal with the competition when monetizing your product? I think this is a sum for us to invest in your startup, but, uh, so please don't be confused. Uh, could you kind of help us understand a bit about user acquisition and kind of uh, metrics around it? Like how, how much is the cost per click and then what kind of channels you use? We have 34 seconds left for questions. Sorry if you mentioned that, but who are the B2B customers that you have at the moment? What's the profile? One more question. Competition.
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, I Speak App. It was a great and quality pitch. And thank you, jury members, for your time. And we can't wait to see the results. And while we are waiting for those results, it's time for us to dive into our final session of the day, providing post-investment value, habits of a great VC. Receiving investment from a venture capital is a big milestone for startups. But what happens after? We already had some coverage today in the topics earlier with Eric and Mike, but sometimes the perfect VC strategy is very simple. They just step back, and allow startups to grow alone, simply monitoring the progress, right? However, if the company is facing some challenges, it can be up to the VC to provide the support necessary to grow it at scale. During this panel, we will discuss how venture capital and startups work after their investments, how do they see support their portfolio companies, what are the things they do, but more importantly, what is it that they don't do and what are the most frequent areas of disagreement? Let's greet on the stage Adam Niewinski, general partner at OTB Ventures. Yep, that's me. Yes, where are you? Oh, oh, oh you're here. Welcome. I think we deserve some round of applause. Yes. Hello, hello, Adam. The next one, Ludas Kanapienis, CEO at Ondato. Lude, are you here? Yes. Let's go, let's go. And then we also have in the panel, Dietis Wagintas, co-founder and CEO of Eneba. Hey guys, hey everyone. Hello, hello. And also, Arvidas Blaja, partner at Practica Capital, who's just been in the jury, and then jumping back right now with us on the stage. I think he might be somewhere on the way, running through the second, the second floor. While we are waiting for Arvidas, I will invite our lovely moderator, Andra Bogdanaite, early stage inventor, investor, <laughs> inventor, investor, <laughs> both bits, end of the day. <laughs> and I can see that Arvidas is almost here. We will look for him. Good. And I guess we can start with some interest, no? Yeah. Cool. Thanks for the lovely yeah. intro. Hi, everyone. Yes, Very yeah. happy to see you here. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to VC investing in general and VCs providing value after, you know, investing into companies, there are so many memes out there that kind of speak about, you know, how VCs fail to provide this value, you know, how actually they, they might do more harm than good when they're trying to provide value. So why do you think this is the case? How can it be that VCs are saying, oh, you know, we will make the investment, we will help you for sure, but then this doesn't really happen and everyone is making fun of it. So Adam, maybe you want to start. Well, first of all, it, uh, first of all, hello to everyone and, and it's a great event. Um, what, you know, m my answer would be that first of all, they are different, uh, like each and every case is very different, you know, like, there are no two similar companies, there are no two similar investors. So, so I, I think saying something in general, it's always difficult, but I believe it's all about getting, you know, this chemistry of how to interact between the, the investor and the, and the founder. From my perspective, the role of investor is definitely to support but um, not really that much than that. So it's, it's really up to the founder, founder's team to drive it. So my favorite comparison is that it's, it's like a relationship going, you know, like from Vilnius to Lisbon on a, you know, in a car for a ride. So the founder is having, you know, like the steering wheel and the investor is just sitting next to him trying, you know, like to pay for the fuel, that's for sure but try, you know, like to talk, you know, like potentially warn about dangers, but not to frighten the founder, mm -hmm. you know, like um, enjoy this, this, uh, this trip together. But it's the founder who is having the steering wheel, the, the accelerator, the gears, everything. So if we're going to make it, we're going to make it together. If we're going to crash, we're going to crash together. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, do you think, do you also agree with that? Do you like when you work with funds and you have several investors already, both of you, 
do you also feel this way, that you want to be in control of the wheel while only taking advice from someone who's sitting next to you? Or you kind of expect them to jump in, take over the wheel, you know, in case things get really hard? Hi, everyone, first of all. Uh, so, Adam, Adam started with a good example, and uh, I will extend with the example just a bit of uh, other, other one from the angles of uh, founder. Yeah, so, uh, what is the relationship within, within the investor and the company, the founder itself? Yeah, so it's more than, uh, actually the investors are more than parents rather than the, just the going with the, uh, with the car because uh, the, just the parents not of the, their own child, but actually adopting a child, you know? So, and that's kind of the relationship in between those. Because uh, in general, like all the founders, they want to have the control and uh, we were all the kids, you know? So that we want to make our own decisions, you know? To, to learn everything ourselves and, and basically to, we know better than our moms or dads or whatever do. It's the same relationship within the founder and the investor. We know better, you know, we, we want to have the control and all this stuff. But uh, what we have to understand that all the investors do actually care. And they want us to be good kids and to, to, uh, to, to be, you know, to, uh, to get strong and basically to, to go to the world uh, with, with uh, you know, with the good intentions and good eyes. And that's where uh, they try then to actually, you know, lead by example, to a bit of learn, uh, to maybe to give some examples. And everybody understands that the mistakes will be made anyway. Uh, the question is that uh, those founders, those companies wouldn't hit themselves too hard. Yeah? So that this corner of the table wouldn't be that would kill you, you know, so, so that, but everybody understands that you still will hit it, you know, so. So that's how I would describe the relationship. Mm. But so, you know, if you compare the founder and VC relationship to kind of a parental relationship, so me, myself, personally, you know, I, I feel like I can call my mom anytime, you know, 24 seven, I can drop WhatsApp mess messages to her, send some pictures of good times, some pictures of bad times as well, you know, just share everything. So is it also true with VCs, like so many, people now are saying, you know, oh, I'm always on, always available. Is it true for like Practica, for example, or do you set some boundaries when it comes to this? No, it's not true for Practica <laughs> because you have to also take some time, take some headspace to rest and to read and to just digest and spend time with your family. So being always on WhatsApp, it's, it's kind of very hard, even though, even though, yeah, you get a lot of direct messages. And I think this is the, right now the normal communication channel or, or increasingly important communication channel but kind of getting pinged all the time but so many communications you get you kind of lose focus on what, of what's important because then you think okay so i have what what i have to answer and then there's so there's also this dependency developing that is easier to ask and get like a question rather than figure out yourself so founders are really mm, i mean naturally trying to just straight out ask get, get questions rather than kind of figure out for themselves in a while mm -hmm. so that's i think why you should you should spend some time like to really digress the uh, kind of just yeah, not look at, uh, at WhatsApp, at email and so on, and just be a human being. Okay, but so is it a problem then? I mean, you know, if you're writing emails, maybe you're a bit more thoughtful, where it, when, it, you know, when it comes to WhatsApp, you're just like, whatever, I'll just share this or that? In emails, it's a bit more structured, and you think it through a lot more when you write an email. It has to have some structure, beginning and end, and I think it's, it's uh, information is more structured overall. WhatsApp is more, but actually no one writes you with good messages <laughs> you know no one just sends you some nice thing except for Vitas of course <laughs> but uh, but really it's it's typically you get some I need this I need that you know this and they're like okay okay, okay. it's like so hard already like life is hard already and, and you know you have to continue so yeah I would say email uh, for some part of communication email is much better whatsapp messages are great especially with emojis you can like you know reflect back channel a bit on the board and so on when you, so it's it's nice channel but it shouldn't be the main channel yeah okay. yeah, I, yeah i can just uh, add on top uh, hello everyone who, who who haven't seen me before um so it was uh, quite funny listening for arvidas uh, while he was referring to like having time etc when we were speaking with him when he was skiing on the mountain when he was swimming in the, in the lake when he was in the train when he, like he was like literally flying and then still like chatting with me so uh, uh, i think uh, the key question about here is not the communication channel but uh, the availability 
uh, yes, as a founder, we, I think, uh, leaders will agree, have a tendency to freak out and then just like do, do some uh, calls in the middle of the night. Uh, but uh, uh, the feel that, you know, something happens and you have someone you trust, you have mutual relationships and you can have a call, you can relax then. I think that's a very important element and definitely with, with, yeah, with, with Arvodas, he already experienced my, <laughs> my persuasion and now working on this balance after working with Aneba, so yeah. yeah. yeah we yeah. call it Aneba style. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, availability is important for sure, but Adam, for example, maybe you could share, you know, what are the three main things that you would say, you know, OTB, where OTB provides most value as, as a partner for startups? besides being available? So uh, I would say that the first and foremost is about experience sharing. Mm -hmm. So we've probably seen uh, many similar cases um, and it's important to say these are similar cases. So these are not exactly the same cases. So thus it's more of an experience sharing rather than giving advice even sometimes, you know, because um, it's, it's, you know, like I, I do believe a founder should have a very strong point of view and be very quick to change it. So, you know, like the role of investor is to provide the perspective, to provide the, the experience and from the founder, you know, like to decide what to take, what not to take. Because at the end, you know, from our perspective, he or she are running the show. So we can provide them, you know, like the, 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 the experience, the the showcases and so on, but then it's not our job, you know, to take, to take the steering wheel. Yeah, it's, it's not a good idea. So, so I would say experience sharing would be the first one. Then obviously helping with the network, networking. This can be any kind of whether, you know, like helping to open some doors to some clients or some partners. Um, especially, you know, like channel partners. This is something which we believe it's really important to focus on. And, you know, like this is, this is the leverage for especially SaaS companies, enterprise sale. Uh, so, so helping to, to give in access to, to, to the channel partners. This, this is something that we believe we can help. We've seen how the companies can leverage this, how, how to build upon that. So this is, I would say, the second thing. And the third thing is, it's, it's basically trying to give a perspective. Meaning, you know, like if some, if a company thinks about, let's say, fundraising, telling the company like well in advance, you know, like be careful with this and this, think about this and this. When, when you're gonna go for raising, you know, like think about this and that. And again, you know, like this is, this is based mostly of, of how, of, of, that we understand how it looks from a different perspective. So we understand how the future investors being inside, but still how the future investors will look at the company. What's gonna be important for them? What do they care about and what, what they want? So I would say this external perspective is also important for, uh, for the founders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems like it's mostly about really just like being one step above and kind of seeing the whole landscape and understanding how does the startup fit in that particular landscape, right? Which direction to go, maybe, you know? D definitely providing different perspective. Yeah. That, 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 that I would definitely agree. And for Practica, would you say it's the same or do you actually sit down, prepare pitch decks with the teams, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think Adam summarized very well and I think I, I, were at some, I was on some panels today and all investors didn't have gray hair. So finally, you know, we at least have some gray hair. So at least we have some experience, uh, yeah. I would call it like that, right? Yeah, no, I think OTB and Adam is doing a great job and uh, look at what they invested in Lithuania and how it's going. So I think, you know, you really, really, it's um, not much to add on top of that. Mm -hmm. I would say probably if, if, you, if you look at the founder, right, uh, you have to be true that you're communicating your own knowledge that you kind of internalize. If you are throwing to your founder something that you read somewhere, you know, like please do this, please do that, and you kind of f filter, not filter out, but provide too much of information, it's going to be adding more noise 
to what founders are already doing, right? So I think in that sense, as investor, especially being on the board, you have to make sure that you internalize something yourself, you create that knowledge, and only then you provide it. Because otherwise, it's going to be, you know, Captain Obvious on the board saying some stuff, I read there, I read there, I have this idea, that idea, and then it's a lot of confusion happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, my own knowledge is like roller coaster. You know, one day I think I know something, the next day I think I don't know something, and it goes like this. So it depends uh, which yeah. which m part of that roller coaster I'm on when we talk with Vitis, and it depends you know, if I'm talking or am I silent. Yeah, but that's good. It means you're learning also uh, on the ride. And you, would you agree? Like, when for you, you know, maybe there was a very specific case where you thought, like, okay, well, this is super valuable. This was a game changer for us. Um, I would say that. We have at least a dozen of that, uh, and uh, maybe that's because of our character, like uh, going after people and then pinging again and again and again. So maybe we just take out a lot of from the investors. Yeah, Adam, uh, uh, happy for you that <laughs> you're not working with us. We're very, very persuasive and and, and uh, demanding a lot. And uh, yeah, so just naming a few. So uh, angel investors. So one of the top advisors, top guys uh, advising us came through Practica. Then the top talent uh, had a panel today about how it's possible to get the top talent from the top tech companies to work with a Lithuanian startup. And to be honest, investors is one of the key checks. So, you know, you're working at Google or, or Facebook or, or Booking, so you are hyped about the startup, but you have zero background around it. Because you're not living in Lithuania, you have, you have no idea. So what do you do? You collaborate with us and you ask him like how, how, how actually it is. And to be honest, one of the key employee we have closed last year was because uh, he was doing a deep due diligence and uh, yeah, I with us and our other investors backed us up. Uh, also, what uh, Adam mentioned about the fundraising and pretty much bringing the ideas and the insights, what happening in the market, super important, super useful. And uh, then anything related to the deals, M&As, crazy ideas to do, etc. So, yeah, I think uh, a piece of advice for everyone: uh, if you have the investor already, and uh, you should like imagine that at least two times per year they need to deliver like significant value. If that doesn't happen then start with yourself demanding like, hey man, <laughs> I have this list of problems, help me. <laughs> so that's at least that's what worked for us. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think the more specific you are when it comes to the kind of help that you need, the easier it is also for the investor to add value. Because like, you know, when you go and talk to someone and you say like, oh, can you introduce me to VCs? It's like so generic, right? So I think the more specific you go, but, the better. But Arvidas is laughing because that's how it starts. Can you introduce <laughs> me to the VCs? What kind of VCs you need? I have no idea. So go figure that out. Okay, and then next day I'm, hey Arvidas, I know what I want. <laughs> so. It's a learning curve yeah, for it is. everyone. It is, yeah. actually it is. But I think uh, the learning curves come also not, from the, not only from the VC, founder relationship, but also between the maybe portfolio companies that are within the same fund. So I was wondering if uh, you've seen this, for example, Ludas, you know, like talking to other peers from either OTB or other investors that you had and kind of learning from them or helping them out also. So not relying only on the VC for help, but like reaching out to, to the uh, peers. So, yeah, I actually did, uh, and uh, OTB has a really nice event that they're running uh, every fall, uh, and where they're gathering all the portfolio companies, and basically then we're sharing the you know, news and, and all the stuff in between. Uh, and we actually made quite a good uh, friendships with, with quite a few founders that we can, uh, you know, ask for some kind of advice, uh, whatever, if they know some kind of people or something or whatever, you know, so, so it really, the situations are different and when you're kind of hiring someone from some kind of, in some kind of country, then you're asking some, for some advice and so on and so on. Uh, and and that's, that's what, it actually works, uh, you know, it's, it's not a myth or something that, uh, uh, there's a kind of, uh, you know, synergy or, or some kind of uh, relationship in between the portfolio companies. It, it actually works. Uh, also to mention, again, uh, the same with uh, Startup Wise guys, you know, that uh, we are also the portfolio of. Uh, and that's where we also meet people, you know, we, we actually talk with 
uh, we advise each other what we can and uh, and, and yeah and uh, we even buy from each other the services and that's how we support each other so so yes for sure that's nice how did you come up with the idea adam in the first place to do these like founder meetups well I, I, I think there are two reasons for that. So first of all, yes, it's for the founders to get to know each other and um, to, you know, like everyone want to be in, a, I would say, club that they, they feel comfortable with. So, so when the founders, you know, like listen to each other and understand what are the other's idea, they feel motivated. They see, oh, this guy is having, you know, great idea. This, this, this girl is, you know, like having an, a, an amazing approach to something. And this stimulates and, and, and this, you know, like, this is very creative and, and we believe there is value into it. And again, you know, like we, we want to give the platform, but then it's really more up to the founders, you know, like to, to deal uh, with each other. I would say one of the things that we, we, we plan to more institutionalize is the talent thing, meaning, you know, like we will be actually getting as someone that, that we are calling a talent partner because we see it's a huge topic among all the founders. So basically, the, the, this is, and this is really high on the agenda. And, you know, like having um, founders, you know, like all across the region, so let's say from, from Finland to Romania, you know, this gives an interesting perspective about, you know, like how to pay, what to pay, how to motivate, uh, motivate, how to hire, how to position the company, you know, to get the talent, how not to lose the talent, and so on and so forth. So, so this is definitely something that we would like, you know, like to, to more, I would say, structure this and help our portfolio companies in a more structured way by gathering this information and then distributing it more than we are doing it right now. So everyone is talking to, uh, to, to, to everyone. So, 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 so this is, I would say, the main thing. The second thing actually is also the platform for our founders and investors to meet. Because, you know, like when, when we are talking to our investors, our LPs, you know, like we are telling, oh, this is great. And, and this founder is amazing. And this founder is, you know, like completely crazy, but, but, but genius. But, but then these are, I would say, something, you know, like for them, it, it's still artificial, yeah? And once they really meet them, once they really start talking to them, it changes the perspective. And then, you know, like our, some of our RPs are extremely, I would say, influential, and they can help, you know, some of those companies. So, so also the founders and the LPs can talk together and say, okay, you know, like, so why don't we, you know, like help you out or, or maybe even invest. We've already have a few cases of our LPs, you know, investing directly into, into our portfolio companies. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is also a very big topic in Lithuania that we see with uh, talent recruitment and kind of fostering, you know, learnings and collaborations between everyone. So. I don't know if you are doing anything as practical when it comes to like recruiting and supporting founders on that. Yeah, it's kind of broad, broad topic overall, but I would say our approach is trying to build a system uh, or trying to make uh, or work with the founders to think in a more systematic way. Because if you do this sporadic approach, touch point interactions, you know, can you do this, can you do that? It's like you cannot build a system inside that would kind of operate without anyone pushing it or interference, right? So this is at least my part, a big part of my job at Practica is not only to streamline sales process, but to also streamline recruitment is the same as sales. It's very much data driven and it's very different from HR. So kind of when you think about it, this first thing you tell to a founder is not HR. No, recruitment is not HR. Kind of you separate it and then you try to implement some, okay, get an get a internal recruiter, work with the, with the agency, try to benchmark it. What's the benchmark for your recruiter? 100 CDs per week. This is exactly how it's supposed to be, right? If he's getting something, that's why it's happening. How you measure culture and so on. So all of this stuff happens because when you realize it's important, it's typically too late. So if you don't put these processes kind of... Um, in the beginning or, or you don't think about scaling your organization in terms of what departments when you will have, you need to have uh, based on your growth and anticipation, right? It's gonna be a problem. And at least what we see in Lithuania, maybe less so in Estonia from our portfolio, typically the major pitfall is scaling organization. It's not necessarily like uh, getting new clients or figure, figuring customer support, but it's 
that's also actually important, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you run into the series A, series B -ish type of situation where, okay, we don't have a CFO, we don't have data analytics department, we cannot understand what's happening, we cannot dig in data, fundraising takes a lot of time because we have to extract all the data, work with cohorts, and during fundraising we actually understand our business because we suddenly looked at the data. So this cannot be like that. So our, our kind of uh, job is to curate everything, provide it into kind of playbook, in, in all, aggregate all the trivia, we don't want to be the ones on the board, you know, saying obvious stuff like it's a, like it's, you know, some kind of magical formula. Oh yeah, think about recruitment separate from HR. This is so important. No, it's like, this is how it's supposed to be. Think about the system, how it works independently from one. And, and kind of remove yourself and make um, a lot of headspace as a CEO, as a founder. You have to think about strategy. You don't have to, you know, be hands-on because if you're hands-on, you're looking at the ground, you don't see the big picture. Like in Lithuania, we have Neptunas commercial, right? You, you look at the bottom or you drink and you see the sky, right? So that's, that's what we do. <laughs> a nice one. So drink Neptunas, guys, you know. <laughs> Clear your yeah. head space. What's the sponsor? <laughs> Aquila. <laughs> you drink Aquila. Yeah, anyways, it, it will help. It will help still. Um, I still have so many things that I would love to talk to you about, but I think that we are... All, okay, we still have another yeah. five minutes, so that's good. I was wondering if you experienced this as well, you know, because both of you are a bit later stage, let's say, right, than the, the typical startup. So did you see the struggle uh, when you were growing that, you know, you get so overwhelmed with everything that's happening inside the company and you kind of really need someone to be by your side and say like, hey, you know, look up, basically. Like, did, did you experience this yourself or is it, you know, just out of this thinking that it's that way? <laughs> <laughs> like from, from my perspective, uh, it's, it's every day actually that you have to look up because uh, uh, it's the matter of how you involve the business and uh, every day you're starting it fresh, uh, considering that you don't know something, you know, so, so and basically then you're trying to find out. Uh, and and that's, that's always the case because on the other hand, I wouldn't agree uh, with Arvidas from that perspective because sometimes when you like dig, uh, every day when you do some kind of things and all this stuff, sometimes you literally uh, forget uh, to look up, you know, and basically to, to uh, have the wider view. And that's where uh, actually the board is helping them, you know, and, uh, and, and that's where they're giving you this a bit of then the picture so that, uh, listen, maybe you should look like this or, or, or to that direction and all this stuff. So, but uh, it, like honestly, you know, it's, uh, is the matter of running the business, you know, so it's, uh, it's uh, every day's life and then there's nothing very special about this. Uh, I believe that everyone here running whatever type of size business is facing the same, just, just maybe in the different scale. Uh, and of course that the problems or the issues that you saw in the very early stage when you were like five people and uh, what you're facing today when you're 195, it's, it's, it's a bit different, you know, but but uh, on the other hand, uh, it's all about the same, you know. It's about the looking up, uh, reviewing what you have, and, uh, and, and, and then again starting over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Well, good. Look, um, imagine you're a founder right now, you know. It seems like there's plenty of funds offering investment, plenty of choice. You don't have to go only with, if you're based from Lithuania to Lithuanian VCs, you can go abroad, you can, you know, really have this flexibility, I think, right now as a founder. When looking for the right investor, and that's the question to all of you, maybe this is how we can also wrap this up. What would you recommend to look for when it comes to added value? You know, what do you think is important? Yeah, I think it would be great to start with what Arvidas once told me, even before the investment. Um, you firstly figured out the things you think you know you need, like you do the list, super, super easy, like uh, takes a lot of time, a lot of headache. Then you talk with the v various VCs and you put aside the money element, your valuation, money, anything. And you ask them and then you do the list uh, with them. So what they're like offering, what they can help you out. Then you match that list, most likely, there is a very low chance you will get any kind of help there because it can go up, it can go down. So, but that's the best you can do and that's the way how you're supposed to choose the partner. 
And uh, I think the really important element is uh, while choosing uh, the, the VC you're working with is managing expectations and spending a lot of time where and how you will be working at. It's hard to tell everything, hard to cover everything, but the more you do, the more comfort you will have in the future. And I know as a founder, it is super scary to go after the VC who wants to put the money and ask him, hey, but what about this and that? Uh, you don't want to screw this deal. But to be honest, it will be something that the investors will value about you because you're caring about the future, you're caring about the expectations. And uh, if those expectations are not matching, like during the harsh moments, it will be super hard. And during uh, the, uh, those moments, you need your investor to back you up. So that's my piece of advice and what Arvid has told me. <laughs> so start with lists, basically. <laughs> yes. I will, I will end with the, what I've started with the example with. So basically, you, you still have to understand that uh, it is a family in one sense, yeah? so, and, uh, and that the startup is adopted uh, uh, by, by you know, the investors. So you have to have the chemistry in between people because uh, you know, if every morning you would wake up and go to the toilet through the people that will, are pissing you off, so then of course it will not work. You know? so, so that's what you have to have in mind. And, uh, and it's all about the chemistry between the people uh, and uh, everything else is, can be solved. You know? so, I don't see any other type of uh, possible issues, to be honest. Yeah, trust and chemistry is important, really. Adam, what would uh, you say? Absolutely. So I, I, I like an idea of a list. I, w uh, I, I, I never thought about it. I would just, you know, like maybe a bit twisted saying, you know, these are, these are maybe not only the things you need, but the things you are looking for. Because, for instance, you know, like good chemistry is one of the things that you might be looking for and value this more than, you know, like intros to anyone in the world, yeah? Okay. I would just quickly add, because we're out of time, I think, but yeah. it's people working with people, really, that's it. You have to take care who you put on your board because that guy or girl can really stop you from growing and make stupid decisions and so on. Get your reputation right, and this, you are doing your business 100% of the time, 120% of the time. If investor has 20 other companies he's looking at at your stage, right, it's very hard. What team does he have or she has, right? So you have to understand that you're gonna get sufficient attention and you're gonna get it right and you're gonna get this commitment and the person is a reputation, right? And right now, Mike Butcher, I think, told that there are even fund of funds that's going to invest into single GPs, right? So imagine how important is the person that is investing in you that's going to be investment responsible from the fund or, or standalone working with you on the board and supporting you, right? It's people. Don't forget that. Brand name is overvalued. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. So basically, if you're looking for the right investor, think about... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that as well. <laughs> no, but actually, yeah, try to find the people that you can trust, you can work with, and don't be afraid to ask for the things that you need, right? Yep. Thanks a lot for the discussion, Thank guys. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Wonderful. Find the people you trust because your vibe attracts your tribe, and it has to be the chemistry with your venture capital, with the board, because instead of your expected growth, there might be a step back of the wrong match and the wrong decisions. It was really great discussion, but it's actually also, we call it a day for the panels of today. However, exciting things are coming ahead because right now it's time to find out who is the, the winner of Startup Fair Connect 2022 pitch competition. Are you excited, guys? Yay! Yay! Wonderful! <laughs> Great, we're almost there. We're almost there to find the winner uh, of today's battles and pitches happening since early morning. But before that, we should thank our partners. Without them, it, we wouldn't be sitting and standing here uh, enjoying this event. So thank you to our main partners, Accenture, SME Finance, Go Vilnius, Karma Ventures, Funderbium, to our partners, Google, Lithuanian Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, BCA, Litban, Coinvest Capital, Cloudvisor, HTT Pool, Tech Barbecue, Practica Capital, 
Aquila, Startup Smoothies, and Nord Security. Once again, big round of applause that we can be here all together, celebrate our 10 years anniversary of connecting and gathering the whole ecosystem together. And right now, we're getting closer to the winner, but uh, we will begin with the winner of our special prize, provided by Trin Trinity Urex. It's 2,000 euros for legal service. So to announce the winner, I would like to invite Kiedre, who is already coming here closer, who is a partner and head of corporate at Trinity Urex. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Now we have to stand like this. <laughs> I represent a law firm uh, which is called Trinity Urex and one of our uh, main goals is to assist our partners to be one step ahead. So uh, what we do, uh, we share our knowledge, uh, we participate in different initiatives, uh, we try to um, offer uh, better legislation solutions and uh, therefore we assist our clients to push uh, the changes that are needed. Uh, this is why we uh, also created uh, one more initiative, which is uh, the first uh, Baltic legal sandbox, which is going to start its activities in August. So uh, watch for the news. And that's why we chose uh, the uh, winner of the special prize, which is also uh, one step ahead. So this is Tippet. Congratulations, Tippet. Uh, do we have oh here we go. He is coming. He is here. A quick word? Would you like to say something? Legal fees don't go down, they only go up, so we will spend this wisely. Thank you. Congratulations, Sipit. Thank you, Giedra. And right now, after a very intense battle, it's time to announce the winner. The winner of Startup Pitch Competition 2022. And the winner will be rewarded with 7,500 euro in cash by SME Finance and also special prizes, which is 5,000 euro advertising budget by HT Pool, 5,000 euro worth Fender Beam services, 4,000 euro for legal services by Trinity Urex, mentorship with the founders of Lithuanian unicorn startups, Vinted and Tassanet. Nevertheless, tickets, startup booth in the startup village and fast track to a North Star pitch competition by Tag Barbecue. To announce the winner, please welcome Mendugas Mikola Yunas, CEO of SME Finance, and Roberto Rudakiene, head of startup Lithuania. It's really a great honor. All the startup uh, that pitched looked really very, very promising. Uh, we wish you good luck. And the winner is. It's on there. I want to say something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. So, so from startup to startup, uh, don't lose the motivation, growing your dream, guys. And the winner is. And the winner. Help! Help! <laughs> 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 Congratulations, Phil. very humbled 
they're very flattered. Thank you so much. The biggest support goes, of course, to my wife for her patience. Thank you so much. She said, don't come without money. <laughs> and I have to say thank you for Startup Lithuania, from Roberta to Aquile to Paulius to Sigira, for helping all of us to grow. And very, very humble to the coaches, to the judges. Thank you and for your patience and support all the way. And I, half of that money will go to learning Lithuanian, I promise that, and half of it will be used for growing and expanding in Lithuania and to the EU. Thank you so much for your trust and confidence in us. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, well, congratulations, so Tippett. Congratulations to every single of you. And I guess it's a wrap. Would you like to stay here for the closing? I guess we're going to have the team picture after all. And we had the winner. So thank you everyone who has been here with us today in person, online. I can see the green uh, camera there. So waving just for you guys. Thank you for being here with us today at Startup Fair Connect 2022. Let's connect. Let's create that strong bond. Let's unite and collaborate. And let's stand together. And before we say the final goodbye, I would like to invite you all to the after party powered by the Thunder Beam at 8 o'clock today at the Club Materialista. You heard it, 8 o'clock today, Club Materialista. Well, we're going to continue our event and mingling. And right now, see you there, and goodbye, and until 2023, start up there. Thank you. And I would like to invite on the stage the event team and the winners of the startup pitch competition for the group photo. 